it's too late now. I remember you and me, and how careless we be. Yeah. All day and all night, we'd stay up. It felt so right. We were so young, we were so dumb. We would get drunk and then hook up. We were okay, we were alright, staying awake till the sunrise. We were in love, couldn't stop us like a good drug. Yeah. Never run. We hook up in my car, driving so far, playing your guitar. You show me your wrong, let down our guards, think with our hearts, stare at the stars. We were never apart, drinking too young, way too much fun. Out in the sun, no pain when it's gone. Took you to prom, dance to our song, dance all night long till the lights come on. I remember everything And how careless we could be And how careless we could be It felt right, we were alive We would go out, we were so loud We were so proud, we had no doubts Weekends and weekdays We'd spend our own way We were careless, we were fearless We were reckless, time was precious We love to waste time, whiskey and wine Drinking all night, asleep by your side Finally alive we would just drive, never arrive Our journey was live Staying out late, testing our fate Running away, we live for today Young and so bold, never get old Screw what we're told, we can't be controlled I remember everything And how careless we could be And how careless we could be
morning everybody and welcome 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 happy saturday morning welcome to the cyber security channel my host my name my host wow wow i got the hype is already so far in me that i like i like totally forgot what i was gonna say my name is neil bridges and welcome to this morning's global cyber games i've got a couple of things to go through from a rules perspective really quick just to keep everybody in in line on chat um First and foremost, uh, thank you everybody for joining this morning. Uh, we got a huge lineup of guests, huge lineup of, uh, of events that are happening today. This is gonna be massive. You're tuned in for the pregame show. Uh, we'll cover the schedule down here in a little bit as soon as I bring my co-host in. Couple rules, right? So um, if, you're, if you're new to the stream, Welcome, um, welcome to, uh, to, to to the Cyber and Security Channel. Uh, we have a very, very strict uh, no toxicity rule when it comes to chat. Um, we are streaming live across uh, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, as well as, as YouTube. Um, and so if you are participating in chat on one of those three platforms, we have a no toxicity rule. We do have moderators that are actively moderating chat. They are here to keep chat free of sexist, racist, misogynistic, and otherwise toxic uh, uh, behavior. Um, they, they will give you a timeout or ban if they, um, uh, if they, if they deem your, your comments or conversations toxic. Now with that in mind, this is obviously a competition. We obviously want to foster some awesome competitive spirits amongst everybody. So feel free to have a little safe non-toxic banter between all the countries that are represented here because this is a global stream, because we do expect to have a ton of people here from across the globe. We do ask that you keep chat to English only. We appreciate everybody being here globally, but just to make it fun and keep everybody in inclusive in this, we do ask that you keep chat English only and profane free. Uh, this is a great time that you can hit exclamation point discord into chat. Hitting exclamation point discord drops you into the cyber and security discord, where if you do have a problem with the moderators, you can reach out to one of the moderators inside of discord and discuss it with them. Awesome. With that in mind, we want you live tweeting this event. Use the hashtag PlaySyber in Twitter, and you could find your comment blasted up here on the screen this morning. Um, uh, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and bring in my, uh, my, uh, my co-host for this morning, the one and only, the greatest, Mr. Eric Bellardo. How are you doing this morning, sir? How are you doing? I am so hyped for these games. This is going to be an amazing morning, and we've got people from all over the world. We're going to introduce them here very soon, but I am so hyped for these games. This is going to be amazing. Thanks this for is, having me. Is, is, is this, your, this is my first time doing one of these. Is this your first time doing one of these? This is my first time doing a live cyber games, and I am just so excited about this. This sport and being live here with all over the world that we're going to be having so many of these games this year with u.s cyber games and the teams all over the world it's going to be just amazing for this sport absolutely absolutely i think um i and here's what i'll tell you like like we've seen we've seen um on twitch and, and on youtube in the past people try to do hack the boxes and try hack me's and and these various types of, of capture the flags live on stream i don't think anybody you know uh, until uh, uh the u.s cyber games until uh, the play cyber team has come through and tried to do this type of format we've never seen anybody do a format like this with the icc and everything else to, to me i think that represents kind of that next evolution of how we see, you know, kind of uh, this this capture the flag esports type of uh, merger that we have with uh, with the U.S. Cyber Games. Yeah, this is this is brand new and play cyber U.S. Cyber Game has been on the forefront of doing these cyber games, and it's amazing because 
cyber as a career and as a field is so exciting for so many people, but gamifying this and making it into an esport is going to take it to the next level here. And I'm just so proud of being involved with this. So proud of being in this group. And this is going to be amazing for all the people that are watching this and for the people that are playing this. And if you want to get into this field and you want to play these games, it's a wide open field. So come join us. Absolutely. With that in mind, um, I want to remind everybody that you can head over. Uh, if you're listening to me on LinkedIn, you probably do want to be in YouTube or at least in Discord, but I would encourage everybody, head over to YouTube. Uh, inside the community tab on YouTube, we did put a poll up for uh, for voting on who you're going to support during this uh, during this event from a team perspective. Um, you can you can drop a comment in there. Real quick, let's let's talk about the teams really quick, Eric, because we've got We've got we got eight teams. We had nine. I just heard this morning. I just heard this morning that the North African team uh, is is currently dropped out of the competition. They unfortunately, so the North African team consisted of uh, Burkina Faso, Benin, and Senegal, and unfortunately, they have to miss today's event. How disappointing is that? That is very disappointing, but yeah. you know they'll be back. They'll be stronger than ever in the next competition. Um, those countries are wide open for new blood in this sport. So I hope to see you guys in the next present next games. Absolutely. Now, now with that being said, we will have. Uh, um uh, Dr. Dane Brown a little bit later on to talk about how hard it is to put these teams together and some of the trials and tribulations. We'll definitely bring it up with him later in the broadcast about about you know the impact this may have to morale for the teams and, and, and how hard it is to get the teams together. But with that being said, um, obviously we go through the rest of the team roster. We've obviously got Team USA representing in the house. Um, you know we'll talk we'll talk about some of their um, uh, strategies and whatnot a little bit later on. We've got Team Canada obviously representing the North American side. I know we've got some uh, some Canucks hanging around representing the Team Team Canada side. <laughs> We've got uh, Europe X. Europe X countries are going to be Austria, Belgium, United Kingdom, Greece, Ireland, Netherlands, and Norway. So kind of that that upper Baltics region that we've got there for you Europe. You forget Iceland. You forget Iceland. Iceland. So. Iceland. Yeah. Wow. Oh, I did forget yeah. Iceland. You're right. I did. I thought I said Iceland. Uh, we also have Europe O, which is going to be the United Kingdom, Estonia, Greece, Netherlands, Norway, Romania, Slovakia, and Switzerland. So, uh, so that's going to represent those. I'm going to pass it over to my good friend, um, good friend Eric. You want to cover down on the Latin American regions for us? Yeah. So Latin America, and you see, I've got my proud Hispanic oh, yeah. and security shirt going. So for Latin America, we got Chile, Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, and Peru. Awesome. Uh, we've got South Africa representing in the house. Yes, and the countries represented in Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Lesotho, and Malawi. And then and then we've got the, the lone Oceanana team representing in the house. <laughs> I knew I was gonna mess that one up. <laughs> Oceania. Oceania team in the house. <laughs> <laughs> with our with our good friends from Australia and then and then Eric, you wanna talk about the Asia teams as well? Yeah, in the Asia, we've got Japan, India, Malaysia, South Korea, and Vietnam represented in the house here. So this is going to be very exciting with all these countries participating. This is truly a worldwide event, and I'm, we're so happy that so many people are represented here. And, and let's, like I said, let's get some, let's get some throws of support inside of chat, both inside of YouTube, inside of LinkedIn. <laughs> Uh, if you're going to do it, if you're going to live tweet your support for a country, use the hashtag Play Cyber so that we can grab those right out of Twitter and broadcast them right up here on screen as we get them. We want to definitely see those live broadcasts. Now, uh, Eric, this is uh, very much a castle versus castle type of format. We're going to have Pete on here in a little bit to kind of talk about uh, the platform that they're going to be operating on and, and a little bit more in depth on that castle versus castle. But I think everybody is generally familiar with our concepts of red teaming and blue teaming. But I want to I want to pass it over to you. But when you talk about blue teaming or blue cell, can you kind of talk about what that is a little bit? Well, you know, that's 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 what I do. So, you know, in the blue cell, you're just 
just defending. You are the defender. You are the next generation of defense. And you're maintaining that security posture. You are supporting your teammates by putting that defense in there and uh, protecting from all the simulated attacks, from the attacks if you're in real world. It's it's the defenders. Yeah. So we talk about typically like like network and or cyber sock, sock analysts, incident responders, you know, things like that, right? And then obviously we can't have a blue team defending something unless we've got an adversary. And this is where the red cell comes in mind. Oftentimes we're sure to as a red teaming. This is obviously um, the folks who are going to be launching attacks. Now we're going to, I mentioned we're going to have Pete here in a little bit later to kind of talk through a little bit of this, but yes, very much so. These teams have a castle and they have, they have a, a, a set of folks who are going to be doing the blue team as, as Eric mentioned and a set of folks that are going to be doing the red team where they're going to be attacking each other and defending their castles at the same time and we are hoping to be able to catch some of that action now um this all sounds this all sounds fantastic this is all well and good but we've got to have referees right and i think this is where this is where that white cell comes into play right so we've got a set of uh um judges basically uh folks who are kind of acting as a, as a go-between uh, between the red team and the blue team, enforcing the rules of the exercise, um, scoring the teams, and we'll be able to show you the scoreboard here in a little bit. Um, but uh, you know, uh, Eric, who's going to be, or not, sorry, excuse me, not Eric, Pete, who's going to be joining us a little bit later. He is part of that white cell, and he's going to be uh, hanging out with us here in a little bit. So, um, with with that being mind, now that we've gone through the teams, we've gone through the format a little bit there, Eric. Who are you rooting for? Who are you rooting for? Well, you know. Being here in the USA, being here in Philadelphia for me, you know, I've got to root for the home team, the USA. But my heart is with the Hispanics, of course, me being from Puerto Rico. Sorry that Puerto Rico is not represented, <laughs> but, um, but you know, that team Latin America, you know, I want to see them up there competing. Um, just, just Latin America and USA, those are the two that I'm looking at right now. And, and I think I think that's what's awesome about this event, right? Is we really truly are going to be able to see such a, a diverse and 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 I, I, Pete's gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about strategy, but I'll tell you from my perspective, right? Um, yeah. ha having participated in games like this in the past, um, you know, you you've got to look at your team, right? You've got to look at your team. You've got to decide who's good on the red side. Who's good on the, the defensive side? Do you have some folks that kind of bridge that gap and work in between uh, those two areas? Or, um, or, you know, or you got some folks who just kind of, kind of run, run point or, or kind of run interference on a couple of different things. If you had a team, if you had a team, you know, even number of ten, team, team, 10 folks on your team, how would you split up your team? Well, for me, the strategy that I would use is the red, blue, and purple team. So you've got to have some communications, you know, like I always say in all, every time that, that I'm on camera, security is a team sport. And one of the things is you've got to have communication between your defenders. What are they seeing? What kind of attacks are, are going at you? And what are the things that they can do to go ahead and turn that back and be offense and you've got to have a communication so you've got to have a purple team in the middle communicating both ways oh that's a, that's, that's an interesting that's an interesting concept how how would you use that purple team to communicate both ways well you know you've got to have your rock stars being able to communicate to say to understanding what the adversary is doing so you have a team in the middle that's looking at where your castle is. So you've got your defenders over here, you've got your castle in here, being able to, to see what vulnerabilities can we fix in our own castle, okay? So that we can be a, mount a better defense. But on the other side is seeing what kind of stuff is coming out and what can we go ahead and attack with. So that's kind of where I would be if I was gonna do the, you know, be a team captain or something like that. I, I think what's what's interesting about that strategy, and this is this is what I thought about as well, is is the good part about having the attackers and the defenders on the team, and especially if teams have that really good communication, is when another team launches another, you know, an attack at another team. If it's seen and you haven't thought about that attack, that communication is going to be paramount in helping to adjust your attack strategy. And so it really creates this incredible dynamic that has to exist in the teams. To your point, um, it, it is about communication. We see the adversaries 
you know, out there in the, in the cyber world, um, you know, communicating, they, they almost run like businesses in some cases. And so I think it's incredibly important that, that, that our teams, you know, you know, communicate to that level as well. All right. Like we used to say in the army, shoot, move and communicate, <laughs> shoot, move and communicate um, real quick before I bring Pete in to talk a little bit about the, the space, the, you know, the, 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 the environment that the teams are going to be operating in the, the rules and things like that. Um, I want to thank, uh, um, I want to thank the, continue to take the play cyber team and cat's eye for, for putting on this event. They've done a fantastic job. We are going to hear from Jess a little bit later, as you can tell here on the, uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, we do have a power-packed schedule for today. Uh, we also going to be uh, we also going to be looking over people's shoulders pretty uh, frequently once the games start. We do anticipate the games starting at about 9 a.m. So here in about 30 minutes, we hopefully be doing a uh, a live kickoff for some of the stuff that is going to be happening. But with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and bring in um, as soon as I can find my right button. I'm gonna go ahead and bring in uh, Pete Pete Hay. From SimSpace, Pete, welcome to the show, sir. Gentlemen, it's good to see you. Whoa, whoa, easy with that, gentlemen. That's a little. That's a. That, I find that term offensive. Let's not do that here. <laughs> <laughs> I use it very loosely, but not in this case. So, um, so real quick, SimSpace is the platform that we're going to be using for this Castle versus Castle. Can you give us a quick overview on, um, you know, the SimSpace environment, what SimSpace is, and and, and what the the teams could potentially encounter there? Sure, absolutely. One of the um, when we talk about the SimSpace Cyber Range platform, um, the the central the central tenant of what we provide is the opportunity to practice like you play. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges you can face in cyber, um, especially with you guys being involved so heavily in helping train up the next generation people who want to improve their skills, is how do you do that in a realistic environment that isn't a contrived environment. And that's what the SimSpace Cyber Range platform provides. Um, we get, we, we produce uh, an extremely large environment. We could reproduce it quickly. Um, we have the ability to perform user emulation. That's one of the things the competitors are gonna see today. So user emulation means that the teams aren't the only people, people mm. in the range as they're participating in the event. There will be real live emulated user behavior in platform while they're doing, which means there's a lot more volume of traffic to sift through. And so the challenge doesn't just become identifying adversary activity, it becomes eliminating known activity, identifying anomalous activity, and then making a determination about which of that activity is malicious and which of that activity is just something we didn't anticipate. So when we talk about the the size of the the environment that teams are going to be operating in today, can you give us an idea? Now, obviously, we've got a network map. We can pull this up a little bit later. But can you talk through kind of the scope of the size of the environment that teams are going to be dealing with today? Sure. We uh, we call this a uh, business mini. So it's a sixty three virtual machine range, um, an environment that is designed to feel like um, a small or mid sized business. Um, either a, a small business or a mid-sized business with one of their branches or locations. Um, it's designed to be real to spec. Again, back to that key of, of practice like we play. Um, in addition to uh, one of the other things that they're gonna be seeing in this range today is um, a full DCO stack. So we have uh, already well, configured- Wait, we've talked about them. DCO. Can you, can you break down the acronym for folks just in case they're, they're not- Absolutely. Familiar. Defensive cyber operations stack. And what we really mean is the blue team defensive toolkit that's uh, available to them. We're using a very generic one for you today, but we do have access to uh, Sysmon logs, which as everyone knows, if you haven't got Sysmon, are you even, are you even really bothering? <laughs> um, and uh, we're doing packet capture, uh, Zeek monitoring. Um, we have uh, two seams in platform. So if you're a, a Elastic or Splunk person, you don't have to fight. You have both available uh, because, as you mentioned earlier, we're all about congeniality here, right? No point in engaging uh, in in that you know, a terrible, terrible political discourse between uh, Splunk and Elastic, right? <laughs> don't need any hardliners here. That's right. So um, we have so we have a bunch of those tools already set up for them. There are other tools, host-based tools, uh, analysis tools available in uh, in the toolkit we have available. Um, so yeah, that's what they have available to uh, to deploy in range right now. How how difficult was it, or or how difficult do you anticipate the teams um, when it comes to having a make, to make a decision as to which tool to use when they're on the range? 
I think um, I, I think the beauty of it is that they know their approach. And like you guys were talking about earlier with the strategy, that's going to depend entirely upon how they approach this. Are they uh, are they purple teaming and they're going to immediately have a portion of the red team turn around and target their own environment? That could be a big advantage for them in terms of uh, their understanding of what sorts of things they might see in an adversary castle. Um, at the same time, it gives their blue team information that they can use to create craft better detections and harden the infrastructure that they're defending. Um, conversely, so that would be they'd be looking at one set of tools at that point. And the other hand, maybe they're looking to you know they're all in on offensive initially. Um, we have a we have PF Sense firewalls that they can write rules on. You'll notice uh, when we talk about rules a little more carefully that we constrain them to keep them from writing a bunch of uh, Hack Twenty Four rules that block off mm. large portions and subnets. Um, so we are going to require that those firewall rules be really targeted to specific um, hosts. So mm. a Hack Thirty Two rule is what we call that, and uh, for that purpose that. They need to know why they're doing it. They're not just saying, well, we're scared of traffic from this network or from the subnet and we're going to block it entirely. No, no, no. That's not how we're going to play. We are so doing a block, this. Just a, just a generic block will get you a red card, a green, a yellow card. I'm glad yellow. you brought that up. So that lets us look a little bit into the rules, which yeah. is uh, uh, one of the important things for us to discuss today. So. Um, that would get them a yellow card. And a yellow card, in general, is deduction of points for one flag for the duration of the yellow card. So you've done something that violates the ROE in one way or shape or form or, of another, or another. And so for while that behavior continues, you're going to lose points. Now, here's the tricky thing about Well, hold on, hold on, hold on, real quick, real quick, before you carry on. Did you say that while that behavior continues, you will continue to lose points? That is exactly correct. Wow. So that actually ties in with the other thing that's happening in our range. We have a component in there called Liberator. That's what we call it on the back end. And what it does is it analyzes user behavior and reports that to, in this case, a CTFD scoring engine. Hmm. So uh, you do something good, uh, detect a behavior, mitigate a vulnerability, you get points. Capture a flag. Um, you do something bad, like create a firewall rule other than a hack 32, and you start losing points. Create that, multiple firewall rules, and you lose multiple flags worth of points. So, 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 so the, this, this brings home the point that this is extremely important as to why the teams need to understand the rules, adhere to the rules, and really make sure that they're diligent in how they set up their defenses when they're setting up their, their defensive strategy. You're exactly right. And, you know, again, back to that idea of uh, practice like we play, we're not doing this for our own amusement or to make the game better. You can't deploy widespread uh, rules on prod that may impact services. So one of the things that's required is externally exposed services have to stay up if they come down you lose points. Now, here's the flip side. We're not allowing other teams to attack those services because this is not an IT infrastructure challenge. This is a red team and blue team challenge. So, um, And so that would be what we would call a red card. If a, an adversary intentionally brought down the, um, intentionally brought down uh, one of the exposed services, say web or uh, mail services or Active Directory, something like that, that would be the sort of thing where we would turn around and give a red card. And red card penalties are very significant. They are the, you penalized all of the points that would be generated by one flag if it had been held for the entirety of the competition. Wow. So each team has 11 flags to defend in their castle. And if they were to get a red card, just like in... Uh, a number of different sports out there. Red card earns you an ejection, and you have to play with one fewer player on the field. We decided it wouldn't be fair to the to the teams to actually remove a player from their <laughs> teams. Instead, we'll take the points away from them, as though they had one fewer player. So, so um, out. yeah, exactly. <laughs> we we should have got that. We should have got that one on a button, right? Get out of here. <laughs> um, what we other? Felt like having are, a sin bin was a little aggressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what are some other? Are there any other rules where players, you know, could get docked? Maybe on the red side um, or on the blue side that that can get docked equally as uh, as as painfully? Because that sounds that sounds awesomely painful. 
So I have a theory that all rules derive from the central concept of don't be a jerk. And so mm. we'll talk about some specific ways in which not to be a jerk in this competition. So the first one is what we call uh, misconduct or uh, unprofessional behavior. It's exactly what you were talking about at the beginning of the stream, how we conduct ourselves. So there's not going to be, we're not gonna be hurling invective at one another, even if they use Splunk. Uh, we're not going to be, um, you know, using any kind of derogatory language or anything like that. Uh, it also encompasses things like cheating. So if we were to find out that someone were um, using the, the, the participants here are there are 15 participants. And if there were to be another 10 participants on a Zoom call with them, that would be what we would consider major unprofessional, um, major unprofessional behavior. So those are the sorts of things that would fall in that criteria. Um, there are other competitions where that's totally allowed. Um, you're allowed to have as many people at home as you want. And the people who are here are allowed to get help. That's not how we're doing this one. Um, we already talked about the firewall real, rules. Uh, interference with the scoring system would be another thing. Uh, turns out that's, again, just rude if you're trying to impede a team's ability to score points. The way we're supposed to stop them from scoring points is by capturing flags, and that's where we mm. want our focus to stay in the game. And then the, um, the last thing is attacking the infrastructure. So if you were to attack that PF Sense firewall and bring it down, the blue team analyst box, the red team workstations, those are all part of the game infrastructure. And uh, while in a production environment, maybe that would be fair game, uh, we want to make sure that we keep that competition even here. Wow. Okay. So, so, so a lot for, so, so I take it, you know, the team captains are keeping this in mind diligently as they're, you know, as the teams are executing things. Um, I, I imagine from a, from a practice perspective, as you watch the team's practice over the last few weeks, um, you know, that has been taken into consideration when they either run an offensive operation or run a defensive operation is how do they deconflict as to whether that um, uh, violates a rule or something like that. That's right. And we have a, a communication channel on Discord for any of the competitors who want to reach out to the White Cell. Um, we're always happy to field questions like that. When in doubt, feel free to ask. Um, and we, we certainly, again, back to that central tenant, we're trying to help and make sure this is a good time for everybody in a congenial yeah. environment. Makes sense. Makes sense. Now, now speaking of practice, um, you know, we, we've obviously the teams have been competing since last year. If anybody remembers, uh, there was the, the draft that happened last year and then the teams competed in December um, on, a, on another uh, event. And now we've got the teams competing here today on their road to Greece. What have you seen as you've watched um, the players during their practice sessions that you think the audience uh, should be looking for today as these teams compete? Well, I think you already alluded to it. What is that initial strategy? I think that'll be one of the really interesting things to observe. Um, and we'll, we'll largely see it through the scoreboard. Uh, what happens? Are teams immediately tipping over boxes in other networks and scoring points that way? Are they starting to, or are they spending more time uh, inwardly focused and hardening their own infrastructure? Um, in terms of what we've seen teams doing, um, one of the very first things we see them do is start visual, building visualizations and dashboards for the blue team and, um, and start working on building more effective PF sense firewall rules to, uh, to limit the ability of attackers to move laterally once, if they were to compromise something, say in the DMZ. If you had to, if you had to make a bet, if you had to make a bet, how long once the game starts, do you think it's going to be before we see first blood? Oh, it's such a good question. Well, um, I would say first blood, um, a little hard to say. I would say within the first 30 minutes, no doubt. Yeah. Who's it depends a, on the strategy. It depends on the strategy. If you're going to go for the jugular and go take to part of your team and say, you know, just in, just like in real life, people are building their infrastructure. They're, they're building that plane while it's flying. You know, some teams might decide to go go attack first and, and probe first. So that might be that might be within the fifteen sec fifteen minutes. <laughs> who are who are you? I, yeah, I, I think you're like, exactly right. Who who are you rooting for on this one, Pete? Uh, well, as a as a judge, I have to stay neutral. So good. I think if I had picked good anyone man. to root for, uh, somebody would have found me. Good, good man. We were just good testing man. you. Just testing you, making sure. See, so again, assure all the teams that you are, in fact, neutral and here for the love of the sport. Pete, anything else I missed that you want to cover down on before I send you along your way? 
No, thanks for the time. And uh, man, I can't wait to join back in with you and talk about some of the interesting things that are going on today. Yeah, so we're going to see you back here after game start. Um, after, And then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that are happening after game start and a little bit of strategy. So we're going to send you on your way here a little bit, let you finish getting prepped up because you got a sure busy day today. Wow. Wow. That, I mean, just the, the magnitude of building an environment like this on the back end, I, I can't even fathom the, the amount of work that the SimSpace team has put in for this. This is amazing. And having this infrastructure for them to work in, and the one thing that I wanted to ask, and I'll ask them later, is what is the difference between the real traffic that they're throwing in there versus the you know, the team traffic, because that's what we do in real life. It's we don't always have one person attacking or one team attacking. It's the world against us in real life. So that's going to be very interesting to see. It, it, it is. It is. And, and I think that so, so traffic generation as a general rule is just very, very challenging anyway, right? Because you have to make it look like normal traffic. You have to really make it look like, um, we had a range like this in the military where um, you know, you've got uh, automated scripts that are like opening up Outlook, clicking on new message, taking like a predefined word dictionary and something like Moby Dick and just copying and pasting passages out of Moby Dick and then hitting send and then they're going back and forth and then they're browsing the web. And so, um, you know, it's it, that is different than most other capture the flags that you're going to see yeah. out there where it's, you know, there is no traffic that you need to pay attention there is to. There's no so, traffic. It's yes. the task. And, and so you're, you sit primarily on the blue side. How hard is it to discern good traffic from bad traffic? That is the crux of the matter for us. You know, it's all about trying to find out what is that known good versus that known bad and everything in between. So these teams will have a challenge of looking at what is coming at them and what is known good traffic versus known bad traffic. And it's a very hard task for all those folks out there that are doing this job. So, yeah, it's going to be a very good challenge. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, I think um, I'm gonna I'm gonna send you off. We're gonna bring in Jess really quick, um, who is the uh, commissioner for US Cyber Games. I'll see you after the game start as well, Eric. Um, Jess, thank you so very much for joining us. Listen, um, um, you know, for anybody who doesn't know, Jessica Gulick has been an amazing uh, uh, individual to work with on on behalf of the 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 play cyber and the cat side team. She's also the U.S. Cyber Games Commissioner. Jessica, on behalf of myself, on behalf of the entire community, on behalf of the entire teams that are here participating, I want to thank you so very much for organizing this, for putting this on, for 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 commissioning this thing. Um, your events are always uh, you know kick tail and 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 you do a great job. I want to turn the floor over to you and let you address the audience and the teams as well. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, Neil, you you and Eric, I've been listening to you all morning. This is fabulous. Hearing from the Game Master from Pete um, really gets this going and hyped up. Um, to all out there, thank you for joining us, uh, to the audience and to the teams. Uh, we are live all over the world, and we've got players that are just ready, uh, getting ready and uh, to go here. They have been excited. I tell you, for the last week, they've been working on strategy and techniques. And we're going to see some of that today play out. Um, I want to uh, do a shout out to ANISA, the European Union uh, Cybersecurity um, Association, and the uh, ICC, the International Cybersecurity uh, Competition itself. Um, they've brought us together about almost a year ago, uh, brought all these teams from across the world together uh, so that we can do some kind of Olympic Cup. Uh, and it's uh, been fabulous. Um, this is just a scrimmage today. The finals are in June, June 14th, and we're looking forward to seeing all the teams again. Uh, one of the interesting things um, we're probably not going to talk too much about today is the capture the flag teams as well. So these 15 team players, they're not only have to be good at um, attack and defend, they have to be good at capture the flag. Uh, and that's a whole different skill set. Uh, but today um, we'll be able to see how they're doing on into attack and defend. Can you look? Neil, can you I was going to say, can you talk a little bit about the road to Greece as well? Because I think that that's a, you know, when you talk about that, that event that's happening, that, that, that road to Greece is huge. 
Excellent. Um, so it's different all over the world. So each team has put together their own programs to recruit the best in their nation or in their region and um, then our training. Uh, so it's fascinating to hear uh, each month uh, what they're doing and, and how that differs and what best practices can be uh, shared across the uh, different teams. For the United States, what we did is in May, we opened up uh, with an open for everybody um, and uh, they got a chance to practice capture the flag. We then invited those that met the requirements for the team and that were interested to the U.S. Combine, which we pulled from American football, right? Um, there's a combine in football where you practice the skills. And so over about four to six weeks, the coaches got to see the sportsmanship, the leadership, the techniques, the ability to learn and listen um, in a virtual environment using Discord, playing various different games uh, with the athletes. And then from then, um, they got to draft their team, right? Draft 15 players, five alternates, and five wild cards. And I think that's really important. Um, what we're seeing here today with North Africa, for example, um, not being able to play. For many colleges around the world, this is midterms. Um, and so school kind of comes as a priority. Um, so some of the teams weren't able to get as many players together for this morning, uh, but we do hope to see them um, in Greece. So from here, after this scrimmage to, uh, today, the teams will continue to practice. Um, they're making their travel plans. They're going to be headed to Greece again in June 14th. We'll meet in person. Um, and uh, thanks to Anissa and the ICC uh, for hosting the games in person. Um, we're going to be starting with, I believe, attack and defend, and then ending with capture the flag. So two days of gaming, uh, probably around eight hours each, uh, which is a lot of game time, as you yeah. know. Um, and particularly since people are going to be uh, not used to the time zones, right, traveling. Um, it should be fun. You know, the world's in a, in a weird place right now, so there's a lot of risk and a lot of um, question about what's going on, but we're still very positive about going to Greece and uh, meeting some of these teams in person. Now, now I've got a, I've got a couple questions that have come through from chat. I'm going to send those over here in a little bit. But first, when, when I first met you, um, you, you shared with me kind of your vision for cyber games being an eSport. And, and it really it resonated with me and it really it really struck me in my core, my heart and very much you know I, I agree with you on that concept. Can you kind of share that with folks who may not have heard that vision directly from your mouth? Absolutely. Um, very passionate as cyber as a sport. It's one of the only fields where there is an us versus them, but it doesn't have to be a negative uh, perspective, right? We can have sportsmanship. Um, equating cyber games to sports allows us really to practice um, both our attack capability and our defend capability in a safe place, right? We get to really see what does it look like? How, does, how do we work as teams? How do we work across countries? Um, how do we look at strategy as a high performing team versus just as an individual professional? And uh, I think that's key and that's something that's gonna level up, not just the USA, but all countries is looking at cybersecurity operations as a team sport. Um, and that takes communication, it takes trust, it takes planning and strategy, uh, but it allows us also to work together with each other's strengths and weaknesses to really, um, I take advantage of the diversity on the team, right? And uh, talking about diversity, equating cybersecurity to sports allows us to open up to so many more communities. It doesn't need to be a military thing. Um, it is an operational thing. It's part of almost every company in the world, and it should be if you are working online. And so looking at it more as a sport really, I think, hel helps to open up that conversation uh, to more uh, communities of interest to try to bring more people in uh, to get excited about a career in cybersecurity. That's that's all. And again, I, I, your your vision has always resonated with me. And so thank you very much for sharing that. Um, we did have a question from chat from one of our uh, viewers, Fasochi. You mentioned a little bit on on how the teams were formed via the combine. Um, his question is generally, how are the teams formed? Is that combine mechanism? Is that how is is that kind of the explanation for that, or do you just kind of generally want to talk through team formation as a whole? So I'll leave it to the experts later on in your show to talk about how do you choose the right players for the team, right? Um, interestingly enough, it's not about having a player that is great at all things. It's about putting together a team, right? And there's special teams, there are special skill sets, there are roles that have to happen on teams. Uh, so it, it's fascinating to watch the, watch the coaches decide who they wanna select. 
Do you want somebody who's really strong in attack? Or how many people do you need strong in defense? And do they need forensics and cryptography and some of these other areas? There's a lot of trade-offs that have to be made. And those trade-offs have to be made across, again, in real environments and companies because you can't hire everybody. Um, but our combine and the U.S. is really a U.S. thing. Each one of the countries uh, get to decide how they select their teams. Um, some of it, some of them just did an open CTF and took the best players. In, in from what you've seen, what are you? What are your kind of expectations for today, based on your, you know, watching the teams through the combine and the other events that you've had in the the last six months? What are kind of some of your expectations for today? Um, I hope we see a great game. Right. Um, obviously, uh, a little bias for the U.S. team here, but I'm really looking forward to a really good game. I, you know, this is like watching football, right? We want to see offense and we want to see defense and we want to talk about it. Um, I, I hope to see a lot of great sportsmanship. We've already seen it uh, this morning with people saying hello to each other um, and it being really friendly and then also working on the, the social channels, trying to see what's going on. So. It's it's a fascinating day and and a a really really big win I believe for the whole community. Um, I I just got to say it again. Thank you to our sponsors. Uh, Thank you to SimSpace for providing the platform. Um, Thank you to uh, SideCognito for the prizes for today. And Neil, especially to you and all the speakers and shoutcasters. You guys are coming here on a Saturday. Um, You've worked all week particularly with your new job, right? Um, and uh, it's just fantastic to see the energy that you guys are bringing on the Saturday morning. Well, well um, Commissioner, so thank, you. Thank, thank you very much for doing this. I'm going to send you on because you got a, you got a busy day ahead of you as well, and I'm going to bring bring Eric back in uh, on this as well. I, I, lo- I love listening to her. I love listening to her. She's so awesome. Yeah, she, she brings the passion for this. And, th- you know, I've known Jess for many, many years, and this is central to why we need these types of games and to support our youth and support all the people that are coming in here because we've got to train the next generation of cyber defenders and cyber offense. You know, this is going to be an amazing day for a lot of folks. So I'm looking forward to a lot of defense, a lot of offense, you know, and and all the special teams that are going to be here. So these teams, uh, we've got to give them so much credit for being here, def- defending their, their castles and doing the best they can. So, so, so we're about we're about four minutes off from from hopefully uh, starting to see some scores populate on the scoreboard. Um, kind of ahead of that, um, I want to I want to want to kind of harp on something that Jessica said and, and and something that you said as well, right? In terms of how important it is to train. Um, you know, for over the years, people have asked me like, what is some of the best ways that they can get experience in in either offensive hacking or or defensive cyber operations, right? DCO, and I remind people all the time capture the flags are key and you even heard it from jess is that we've had some teams who simply run an open ctf and find some of the best players that they can in that open ctf to participate in some of these teams nationally and so i want to use that as a, as a sticking point for folks who are listening to me right now trying to figure out how they get involved in the icc trying to figure out how they get involved in um in, in u.s cyber games or how they just get some of that experience in general when it comes to offensive or defensive cyber the participation in capture the flags, I think is paramount. And I see, I think we're seeing really the culmination of what that's like with the U.S. Cyber Games. I don't know if you want to comment on that or not. Oh yeah, definitely. It being doing it for in in a simulated space, doing capture the flags, doing different you know activities in our field. Not only does it hone your skills, but it supports your learning because every single capture of the flag is different. Every and it's just the same as being out there in the industry. Every day is different, and that's what we love about this field. That there are no two days that are alike. Mm-hmm. There's always something going on, and learning and. This is a field where it doesn't matter if you, you know, you and I have been around for many, many decades. We learn every day, every single day. You've got to be learning. So these CTFs are essential to both your entry to the field, but also your growth in the field. If you were starting out today, knowing what you know about the industry, where would you start from ground zero? 
Well, a lot of education, a lot of learning, get with the people, mentor, network, get that training, use all these platforms, SimSpace and those other ones that train you and doing those capture the flags, get with people in the field. There are so many organizations now that are coming up that are supporting this growth. So a lot of education, a lot of mentoring, a lot of asking questions, and a lot of participating in these types of events. So, so it's, it's funny you say that because we did get a question that came through from, from uh, Mithel Tio. Um, how, would you, how would one go about joining a competition like this? Um, I think we're going to have a commercial later from the ICC that actually talks about um, you know, how to join the ICC specifically. But um, I, I think you know, there's, there's you know, organizations or there's, there's uh, you know, uh, you know, websites out there like ctftime.org that has a list of like all the CTFs that are happening um, across the globe. Um, if you pay attention to um, a lot of the, the, the InfoSec, um, you know, you know, folks on Twitter, you know, oftentimes we, we tweet about like this event or other events or things like that as well. Um, I don't know. What, what would be your advice in terms of how to get involved in, in competitions like this? Well, there's those and don't just look at offensive. Um, um, That's a great point. That is a great point. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of defensive capture the flags. And actually one of this uh, one very interesting capture the flag is the social engineering capture the flag that is being held this summer um, here by Temple. You're talking about you're talking about the trace labs. The, there's Trace Labs, and then there's the Temple University's ah. uh, SE Capture the Flag, um, which has teams from all different universities, but it also has teams that are formed by just general people. Um, so there's an open uh, security engineering Capture the Flag. So there's a lot of information out there on Twitter. Follow myself, follow Neil, follow all the different people that are out there in InfoSec. And we actually tweet when we see these things. There's different websites that are there. So there's a lot of information. So if you want to join these types of events, do ask the question, do network, do support more, uh, support more of those, the people that are actually, actually out there streaming like Neil and myself and many others that are putting the message out there. So yeah, absolutely. That's how it would be. All right. So, uh, we're at the top of the hour. Um, uh, I think I'm going to go ahead. Uh, we, we should be starting to see some, some action coming in. So I'm going to go ahead and bring Pete back into this mix here in a little bit. Pete, I, I see your eyes chasing monitor to monitor. It looks like you're you're already in the throes of it uh, going on. Um, uh, have we? Do we have the teams kicked off yet? Are the teams uh, uh, starting to hit the platform? You're on mute. You're on mute, Pete. Uh oh, there we go. Okay, let's throw him the first <laughs> yellow card. For being I was on gonna mute. say. I was gonna say. There we go. We've got the the first the first foul of the play with Pete and the and the mute button. No, you still all right, we we got, still got Pete Pete dealing with some mute issues here in a little bit. Um, well, we see we see this in football when they're trying to tell us what the penalty is and they don't have their power packs on. You know, we see that this. Is, yeah. That is, that is one hundred percent. Yet, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and um, while uh, while Pete's trying to troubleshoot his uh, uh, his uh, uh, connectivity issue, I did want to kind of uh, uh, bring us back around to whoops, that's. That's not that one. I meant to do this one. Ha ah. um, When we talk about the size and the scope of the network that's involved as Pete tries to work through his, his, uh, his, his uh, microphone issue here a little bit, um, I did want to uh, kind of show everybody kind of just generally speaking, when we talk about how big this network is that these teams are working up against, um, this is an example of one of the ranges that the teams are going to be using. And you can see that the, th that the, uh, the teams have got uh, various types of, uh, of network segments set aside for the red team. Uh, uh, we've got a, a, gray a gray area that's up here as well that I'm sure Pete will talk through. And then we've got typical blue team type services that you have here broken down by different subnets as well as a DMZ. Um, multiple different network segments. Very, very much simulating this real-time network. And so when you're when you're looking at this, when you're looking at this, Eric, what are you thinking about as you're looking at this network diagram? What are some of the, the strategies that you're thinking about as you're looking at this that you need to shore up first? Well, first, while I'm looking at this network, 
the first thing that I that pops into my head is it's a very realistic uh, network for a small, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, for a small company um, that they have DMC security, their servers, their developers, their branches, and their users. And one thing that also pops up is that this is a very well net, uh, segmented network, and in real life. A lot of these companies use flat networks. So for the first thing that I see is, you know, let's look at the segmentation rules between areas. Mm -hmm. Let's avoid, as a blue teamer, let's avoid people being able to come out from the outside and the rules internally to protect my security, which is, you know, where most of the information is going to you know, where more of my operations are going to be. But also what is happening within the site servers, the different divisions, because, mm -hmm. you know, we've got a lot of situations where now in real life is the users used to be, is the, your weakest link. Mm -hmm. So being mm -hmm. able to protect those things and also it's, you know, protecting those different routing tables and routing networks and protocols that are in there so that I can't get into different areas. So that's kind of what first from the blue side, it looks like to me. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing down here this this accounting section down here, and, and I immediately my eyes get drawn to that and I immediately think critical assets, right? OK, so there's probably something super, super sensitive inside of that accounting. Um, and so if I'm a blue team or I'm obviously going to be doing kind of that that internal risk assessment and wondering, OK, it, there's probably some flags worthwhile to take a look at inside of there that I probably want to make sure that I've got some short up defenses on. Conversely, we always Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, we always say, what are my golden nuggets? And, yeah. and everything in cybersecurity and every, every, it doesn't matter what field, we always try to protect the golden nuggets. You know, it's the data that's the mine, that's the important thing. So protecting that accounting, protecting their developers and their code, protecting the branch and what are they doing? That's the, the golden nuggets. Absolutely, those those crit, those crown jewels are those critical assets. Now, what I was going to say is, conversely, you see this this site developers over here. Developers are notoriously bad for having terrible security. I hate to say it, but but they're terribly bad for having terrible security. And so I'm I'm obviously if I'm a red teamer, I'm I'm. I'm looking for some of these machines right over here where I can be like, okay, what kind of security is kind of in play at some of these uh, uh, some of these developer machines? Yeah, those 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 are usually non-production. And if they are in the network, then I can compromise and pivot from there. So yeah. that's that's a great strategy right there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Look, very, very huge infrastructure. Really looking forward to seeing how the teams uh, kind of pick apart and attack this. Did we get your mic back, Pete? Are you still dealing with some mic issues? No, nope, no, nope, you're still muted. You're still muted. All right, we still got still got Pete dealing with some mic issues over there. Um, Pete's obviously trying to juggle multiple things at once, so we'll um, uh, we'll we'll kind of uh, uh, you know send him off uh, to talk a little bit about strategy. So as we're looking at this, let's see if we can hop on over to the scoreboard. Wow. Okay. So, so we did already get some, um, we already got some teams. Wow. So, so this get, this speaks to kind of what a lot of, uh, what Pete and the team were talking about in terms of, um, pre-staging a lot of the stuff that, uh, that was happening. So you can kind of see here, it's actually, um, it, it's pretty interesting to, to see how, um, uh, you know, the, they've got the teams that kind of go for a little while, they're getting points and then they've got these huge step ups and they've got these huge step ups as they go across the, so it almost looks like if I were to read this graph and, and we'll wait for Pete to come back and see when, see, see if Pete can, uh, you know, offer some insights onto this, but looking at this scoreboard, um, it looks like a lot of teams had some, uh, predefined red team and some predefined blue team strategies that look like they executed on right on jump street. And I won. I said it. It's between 15 minutes. There were going to be points right there. So please, you know, let's type in the chat. Eric, Eric got it right. <laughs> Hashtag it. Eric got it right. Hashtag Eric got it right. <laughs> Eric versus Neil. Come on. Uh, All right. So looks like a lot of, like I said, they went for the jugular very quickly trying to trying to prod and and look at what they had there. And you see that once they do that, 
they went to their defensive strategies and okay now that i see that this is vulnerable let's go ahead and defend it and i see that those steps up as they're doing that and testing different things so now now what i will say is um we you know these are these are obviously coded um so that so that the teams aren't uh seeing that they're attacking uh directly each other but it does look like um can i can i see what we've got up here it does look like uh uh if i'm reading this correctly uh gamma and delta are uh kind of the top leading scores that uh that are up there so um we'll get pete in here hopefully here in a little bit to kind of troubleshoot oh it looks like beta and kappa took over so so the teams are still actively um actively working on stuff let's see if we can head over here um we are able to in the sim space platform look over the shoulders of a lot of the players and so this is this is uh we're actually uh watching uh the the red team one position uh for one of the teams uh right now if i could uh, one of the, if one of the mods wants to tell me which team we happen to be watching right now but um looks like we're watching um uh, uh, one of the red team one positions for, uh, for, for one of the teams. So we can see that they are on the red team box. Uh, they suited into it, uh, right here. So, um, let's see what, uh, see what, what they've got going on now, obviously, you know, so they're going to run an end map. Do you want to talk a little bit about what end map is? Yeah. So end map will give you a, you know, a view of the network. So it, goes and tries to uh you know defend depends on what they're doing but map the network and and understand what they can see and i'm doing this in a very basic way but <laughs> you know be able to to see where what exposed services what they can discover it's a great you know tool for looking to see what they what you can see um, like we see here, you know, they discovered different open ports from the outside. They got 22, 80, 25, and they're doing it with a stealthy scan. So they're going low and slow, like we call. Mm -hmm. And from here, they can identify things that they have access to. And then from there, tailor their attacks to those specific ports or, or, you know, technologies that they're using. So. so, 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 so they're, they're obviously looking for 22, 25 and 80. What are those three ports and what can you imagine that they're looking for from a vulnerability perspective in those three ports? Well, they're 22 is SSH, 25 is SMTP, which is email. And then 80 is your non, um, non-encrypted web protocol. So being able to use, you know, attacks against, SSH, which is one of the most common ones with, you know, the different vulnerabilities that are out there to be able to use encryption technologies to get through or do a man in the middle attack um, for those with the email being able to compromise an email server, maybe pivot from it or use it to send false information as well. And then with the 80 being able to do OWASP or web uh, web attacks that that you know, I would use as I saw that. Oh, and now and, and, and that's actually that actually looks like probably what what Red One is tr attempting to do here is to go to Alpha One and kind of see what the what the web application looks like here. I would anticipate that this is uh, in anticipation of a potential web attack on this this website. That's what it looks like to me. And you know, from here, being able to capture that information, get get uh, look at the different risky uh, HTTP that they're doing here, trace those things and maybe inject something into their web server. That's what it looks like that their strategy is looking. So, so, so a question came in from chat from California 909 says, are we going to see the actual attacks? That is definitely what the goal here is. That's why we were able, the SimSpace platform allows us to be able to look over the shoulders of the players. And so we are looking at one of the red teams um, uh, uh, for Kappa right now. Um, and so we are, um, uh, uh, we're hopefully we're, you know, they're running an NMF scan right now. So we're hoping to be able to catch them doing one of their attacks. It looks like they're, they're in the recon phase. Um, you know, typically we see this type of NMAP type of work, um, kind of go through to do, to do this type of, uh, uh, network mapping slash vulnerability identification, um, here. Um, as you can expect, obviously he ran a, a pretty intense uh, uh, NMAP scan right here. He, he ran the um, uh, 
Oh, so, so look, oh, actually, he's, he switched over. It looks like he's running Nikto. Oh, no, he's re- oh, it looks like no, he, he's he still used, running. In there. He used the Nikto script to run with it. That's what it is. So, yeah, so you actually, you can see right there, uh, he had it pre staged. So, he's uh, he's switching back and forth between windows here. He or she is switching back and forth between their um, uh, their windows. So in their Nikto scan, looks like they identified a config.php. And so um, one of the typical things that you'd see done in a web application attack like this is um, whenever you, you get a result for config.php, you see if it's publicly readable to the internet so that you can hopefully identify maybe some usernames or some passwords uh, that are associated with it. Yeah, and looks like a lot of the attacks that they're trying to do, they identified that is that it is a PHP script and that there is Apache here. So I anticipate that their next move is going to be against those Apache um, um, services. Yeah. So, so, so not so we just, just PHP. We we did just hear from uh, we did just hear from the 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 moderators. This is Eric, your Latin American team, right here. Uh, we are over the shoulder of Red Team One on Latin America, watching uh, he or she do some uh, recon against uh, against these web servers. So here we're back to looking at the Nikto scan. You can see that that's what is run here. Um, Nikto is a common web uh, application vulnerability scanner that they're running against this uh, uh, this website. Um, attempting to see if there are any uh, open vulnerabilities with this website here. Yeah, and this, this is going to be very interesting to see what they're going to go. Once they identify some vulnerabilities on the website, which one are the, are the, the, the different attacks that they're going to try to use? But right now, this recon phase is going to give them a lot against their web applications. Um, so I think this is going to be very interesting to watch on where they're going to go, if they're going to go server side or they're going to go website um, on their attacks here. So I also think, um, I also think one, one, one important thing to note as well, too, right, is, um, you know, if, if this this is it's not uncommon for. Oh, actually, I maybe uh, we, have, we got some assets here. So so this is OK. So it th- looks like they may have brute forced the directory. Um, with something like a Durbuster or something like that. And so they've got a list of directory listings here. So it looks like this is also very common, right? So this is more part of that uh, that recon phase, that information gathering. So as they did that Durbuster, as they found some uh, open web fo- uh, web folders on the, the box, now they're going through and I would presume they're going through and looking for other configuration files or other files that may give them some information on where they can pivot their attacks to next. And what I also interested right now is they're attacking this this team is attacking this web server i'm also interested in what's happening at the defender side are they seeing this because nikto and nmap can be a little noisy if you've set up your your alerts on the other side so on the blue side is how are they detecting this these guys are all already doing very good recon in here so what is it that they're seeing on the other side? Are they identifying? Are they trying to do something to kind of kick them out of the network here? That, so that's, that's going to be that's very a, that's interesting. A, that's a super good point. How when when you think about these capture the flags, I don't think I don't imagine a lot of teams pay attention to the uh, the the defensive implications of the attacks that run. You mentioned a, a very key word there, right? How loud this uh, this attack may end up being. Um, you know, you know, on the defender side, I don't imagine that that's first and foremost to a lot of these attacker minds. No. Nope. Um, so one of the things that is interesting about this, this castle defense that is very realistic is we sh- when we do CTFs, we don't care how loud we are. We send all our tools, we go out there, we go on, a, on an attack. But when you're doing this in real life or when an attacker is doing this in real life, their purpose is to get in without being detected. Yeah. So being able to look at this and seeing what they're seeing on the defensive side, they might not even know that these guys have already gotten this much information. So, so, so here we're seeing I, these flunk. I was going to say, can you? It looks like we're on we're on one of the defender boxes for Europe. I'm not sure if this is Europe Zero or Europe X. Um, but it looks like they were just inside of their Splunk window here. Hopefully, this is uh, this is Win Hunt One from um, from the European team. So hopefully, they're in there now. We're going to be able to see them actively hunting for um, some of these particular type of threats 
uh, uh, right now. And also their configuration. I see that there's security onion there. So their IDS configurations, you know, a lot of people don't understand that. Yeah, you can have these log <laughs> aggregators everywhere. But if you don't have the data collected by those people, by those 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 uh, devices and properly sent, then you can have the best tool in the world. But if they're not being filled with any information, you can't see anything. So, so I don't know if you noticed it or not, but we did. Uh, we 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 we've got the European team uh, watching us right now. We did just get a hello stream from the European team as they uh, uh, they they caught us uh, spying in on uh, on their stream. So, um, he hello Europe, keep keep uh, keep doing awesome stuff. We are watching you. Uh, uh, check your defenses, seeing what kind of uh, of work you're doing here on the hunt side. If you're hunting, what are some of the things that you should be looking for almost right off the bat? In, in a hunt like this, what would you be looking for? Well, again, I'm looking at my firewalls. I'm looking at, you know, the first configuring all those collections because I want to know, I, I don't want to be blinded to what's coming in through the net, through the network. What are the things that I'm seeing in, you know, in our, in our, in our detectors? Okay, and then bringing them in. So once I bring them in, I want to see where things are going. What are the IPs that are be, that are attacking me? What is the the type of call it um, information that's coming at me? And from there, understanding and researching these types of patterns that are coming in. Okay, being able to see, you see, that they're trying to get to the onion manager and be able to put together in Kibana a, a dashboard that I'm going to see what is hitting me. So on the simple way to doing this hunt, I'm going to be looking at what, what are things that are hitting me? What are, what is the, what is the type of traffic that's coming? If I see an end map scan, then I'm going to be like, Oh, wait, hold on. Somebody's trying to look at what I have. Okay. Where is that? Can I block them on the firewall? Can I block them on there? Because they're doing an end map scan. End map scan. So I'm going to try to put up on my defenses real quick so they can't see what I have. That's, I, I think that's, I'm, I'm hoping that we get to see them, um, uh, you know, start searching, doing some searches in here um, and, and start to see uh, what they've got going on. Let's head back over to our scoreboard while we wait on that. Um, looking here inside of our scoreboard, uh, looks like we we do got uh, Omega coming in. It looks like it, was, we, it actually looks like we got one, two, three, four, five way tie currently between um, uh, Omega, Delta, Gamma, Kappa, and Beta. Um, and I'll uh, I'll move us back over here and tell you who those are um, really fast. Let's do that. Um, Let's see here. So uh, first place uh, is a is a five way tie between. Uh, let's see here who we got here. Uh, Oceana, uh, looks like Oceana, uh, running in at the Delta or excuse me, running in at, uh, at Omega Delta is, uh, North at, or, nope, is Africa, uh, Gamma, Gamma looks like Asia, uh, Kappa and Beta, uh, Beta is going to be. Yep, Kappa's Latin America. So looks like the Africa team, um, Asia, and Oceania are coming in hot on first place right now. Um, let's see if uh, uh, let's see. Looks like we've got uh, we've got. Let's see if we can get see if uh, uh, Eric's or excuse me, see if Pete's mic's fixed. We'll bring Pete in really quick. Pete, you with us now? Well, I hope so. Yes. We got yes. you now, <laughs> gentlemen. It's been it's been terrible without you. Can I uh, can I just express that? <laughs> we have missed you. We have missed you too. I'm glad to have you with us uh, here, really quick. So, um, what have you seen so far, just in the first thirty minutes? You know, right now we're seeing a lot of enumeration. We haven't seen uh, many boxes get tipped over quite yet, which is uh, which is a sign that we're doing a good job making sure the challenges are difficult enough for everybody involved. Um, and then uh, we're seeing a lot, uh, you know, some of the things that you can't see from the front end. Um, I have been absolutely 
inundated with change requests. So one of the things in the rules is I mentioned that Hack32 firewall rules, so single host firewall rules are allowed. But we also allow for patching of affected systems mm. or um, updating systems if vulnerabilities are detected. So before they can do that, they have to let me know um, that's a quick and dirty way of me checking. You remember the ingenuity score? This is a quick way of me making sure that I am tracking the ingenuity that the teams are attempting to deploy. So uh, we actually have a team who is uh, who is already in, in, in the front runner for ingenuity because they have come up with a large number of best practices for hardening Windows systems. They put in a request to make a whole series of changes. Some of them were even authorized. And, uh, and they're going about hardening those Windows systems right now. So uh, it's really great to see. Um, I think one of the things that I'm most excited about is the blue team engagement and focus in this. A lot of times with the Castle New Castle, um, and, and one of the things we didn't talk about before are some of the ways in which points can be scored. Um, so I'd like to talk about that real briefly, if I may, and then mention how that impacts the play the game. Um, one of the things that's happening here is we've got the ability to track if a flag is being held. Being held. So that's the first thing we're doing. Hey, hey, Pete. Hey, Pete. I think we're getting some some audio issues back in on on your side a little bit. Um, I, you know, I'll try try it again real quick. See if uh, see if it. You got a little choppy there for somebody. You got you got you got nine hundred windows open right now. All pulling down your bandwidth. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I um, most certainly do. That that's okay. Um, you know, I think I think you were talking a little bit about scoring there for a little bit. Um, real quick though, um, I, I know you were really concerned about one of the teams from a um, uh, from a rules violation perspective. Did did that team did in fact have a a, a rule issue that needed to be addressed? Uh, so they actually were putting in change requests based on the different, different possible. You can see my uh, my senior manager uh, of <laughs> control is here with me this morning. Um, the there's a change request coming in that they came up with a number of methods for hardening Windows systems. Requested a change, and we went ahead and authorized that. So they're a leading contender for. Um, for our ingenuity award. Awesome. Right awesome. Awesome. Um, we're gonna we're gonna send you back over. You got a busy day ahead of you. Really quick, we're gonna we're gonna send you back over um, to to uh, continue to to work through it. Appreciate you uh, there as well, um, Eric. That was uh, that was not a, a something that was wrong. We were trying to make the cyber games more like he was talking <laughs> like a Cylon from Battlestar Galactica. So, if you're watching us right now, that was on purpose. <laughs> that was you know, intended. Was, that was an intended uh, audio <laughs> issue right there. <laughs> um, here, here a little bit here. Say one what, thing that I know I wanted to bring in is the issue that we saw them looking, that team looking at things that, you know, like for instance, in the simulation, how the different global teams have different challenges. You saw a search for how, what are the the slashes in U.S. keyboards. Yeah. Oh, so that's a good point. Post, um, different things in different uh, locations. You know, not everybody has Cyrillic keyboards yeah. or U.S. keyboards or U.K. keyboards. So that was that was something that I noticed there. That's a good. That's a good point. Real quick, just for folks who are watching, we're watching Red Two on USA right now. Looks like they're using uh, Port Swigger, using Port Swigger's, um, uh, or I, I, sorry, they're using a uh, uh, Swagger uh, right here to um, uh, <laughs> high stream. Look at that. we've got some people. Uh, got some people OSINT sniping the stream. Hey USA yeah. Team USA uh, Red Two, glad to see you on here. Show us something awesome. Uh, looks like they're using the um, they're in set right now, which is um, the social engineering toolkit. Um, not not um, sure what their uh, what their strategy is here for this one, but it does look like they're inside of set trying to. Um, uh, come up with a strategy for that. Here in about two minutes, we got Chris Butera from CISA coming on, Eric, and I'm going to send you for your first break here uh, here in about two minutes so you can get up and stretch your legs. Um, before that, um, 
Uh, one of the things that that I I'm, I want to harp on that change management piece that um, uh, that, uh, that 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 Pete brought up. Um, that was awesome. So 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 for those who who weren't aware in our pregame stream. Uh, Pete was concerned that we may have had a, a red flag violation on one of the teams almost immediately um, because they had um, uh, they had had not adhered to one of the rules, and so to uh, to hear that they had gone back, um, reevaluated their strategy, submitted the appropriate change request, um, so that they did in fact maintain uh, the the rules integrity. I, again, I think that that was that was the point he was trying to convey on the ingenuity part. Of what it was that he was uh, he was stressing about how 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 critical is change management in your minds and and for all the people that are looking and watching all this stuff is this is the realistic piece of these games is you would not make a change in a company without it going through change management because change manager management is there to make sure that we don't break things while making changes. You know, even in the security team, we don't break things in the in the infrastructure. So having this realistic piece in the game shows us how much these, you know, these games are real for them. So change management or being able to understand the patches, understand the changes and do the different things is incredibly realistic and incredibly what we do every single day. I think that that's and again I, I want to harp I want I want to just just double down on that right to to see in a in a in a castle versus castle the blue team wanted to make changes and they had to submit a change request for it yeah. now I mean we could get cynical here we could talk about some of the change requests we probably submitted in some bigger enterprises taking weeks or months uh, obviously we're we're trying not to get to that level of realism with with change requests but I've seen some change requests take uh t- take quite a hot minute to uh to to, to execute on. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's very true. But the one thing that's very interesting in here is the like I said, the realism of making these changes, making sure that we are tracking our patches, making sure that we're tracking our configuration changes. And that's very important for for the games and how we approach these. Do we approach them in a single change management or do we put them in like a group? change management uh which can slow down the process so that's very very good that they're yeah. doing that yeah absolutely so uh so so eric real quick um um uh, i think we've got we've got chris butera uh hanging out in the green room so i'm gonna bring him in here uh uh in a uh, actually uh i've seen a blank screen here for chris um have one of my uh have one of my mods double check on that, but I'm seeing a blank screen here for, for Chris in my green room. Um, well, I'm very excited to be hearing from Chris and all the all the knowledge that he's going to impart here because he is an awesome guy. So ab- absolutely. Um, real quick, while we're while we're waiting for for him to double check his uh, uh, his green room status, a um, couple qu- couple questions and comments um, that uh, as we're continuing to watch Red Two here. Um, it looks like Red Two is trying to actually. It looks like Red Two is trying to actually actively exploit the. Uh, uh, they're they're on the uh, they're on the web page too uh, as well. So they're they're also trying to go after that web app. Um, looks like uh, uh, Fasochi's got a question. This one might be a good one for you. Uh, Eric says, "How would a SOC leader manage this and their team if this was going on on their network in real life?" Well, so number one is identify where where the location. So first, eight, let's go back a little bit. Did the SOC leader find out that they're doing this or did the SOC level one find out that this is happening? So our, like I mentioned before, is are our detection strategies in place to detect that there is an nmap scan that somebody's trying to do a an injection vulnerability what are the things that are for the blue how do they know are they looking at their firewalls are they looking at their web servers those types of detections need to come in once they are detected then that sock that that SOC level one analyst needs to report that immediately. And that's when the the incident response or the event analysis starts happening. And once that happens is where is it coming? You know, it's the who, what, when, where, 
you know, of that of that sock leader that he has to identify and immediately start looking, is this known good traffic? Is this bad traffic? Yeah, is this a potential attack? Are my SIM tools giving me those different alerts? And then once that alert is com- is confirmed, it's that when that incident response piece starts. Mm. So being able to follow your run books, follow your processes, follow all the things that you got you have to do as a SOC manager is you know the identification and the events, the you know qualification of those events, and then the actions that we have to take. So how do we avoid this? Do we adjust our firewall? Do we adjust our our web server? Can we put some defenses in place? Can I don't know if we can do that, but can we put a WAF in some of these things? So there's many strategies, but having your strategies in play and before the preparation is very important for this because the preparation did these teams have run books what are they going to do if they see this type of attack that's one of the things that we do in the SOC is prepare run books for things that we know are coming and then what are we going to do with those things I that that's a fantastic rundown I think uh, I think that's those are all very very key points um, in, in terms of good security operations um, I, I could tell you from from running incidents and being involved in incidents that's some of the most crazy crazy activity that you could be part of in any type of security team here um looks like uh looks like red 2 is still plugging away at that um uh at that uh, that web application um, we saw them uh kind of searching uh metasploit earlier for any uh apache vulnerabilities um uh you know to to try to to run against that looks like they tried to get access again to uh uh, to that CGI bin directory to, uh, to to see if there was something that they could exploit there. So it looks like they're they're also on the same trail as um, uh, as the LATAM team uh, trying to focus in on that web application as well. I'm gonna go ahead and see if um see if we have uh, uh, got uh, Chris Butera back. Um, see if we can bring him in as well. And if that works, then. Uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna chat with Chris here in a little bit. So um, I'll see you here in a little bit, Eric. See if we can bring Chris in. Chris, can you hear me? Okay. All right. So we, we're still having some still having some connectivity. Oh, there's Chris. All right. I think we got it. Awesome. Fantastic. We're winning. Fantastic. Chris, thank you so very much on a Saturday morning for tuning in and participating with the U.S. Cyber Games. Thank you so very much for being here. Good morning to you, sir. I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for having me. So um, so, so you're with CISA. For our international folks who, who don't know what CISA is or understand what CISA's job is, is here in the U.S., can you talk just really briefly about what CISA is and, and what its role is in the U.S.? Yeah, of course. So CISA is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. So we're focused on defending both physical security, emergency communications, and of course, most importantly to this audience, cybersecurity. Uh, So really, we have a lot of different mission focuses to both help defend today, which is really focusing on the emerging cyber threats and helping manage and respond to cyber incidents as well as securing tomorrow. So how can we better protect the U.S. critical infrastructure as well as kind of the global internet from future cyber threats? So so um, w- without getting um, uh, uh, too much into uh, into the weeds, how, how intense is your job right now? <laughs> it, it's it's pretty busy. So we, we've uh, I, I don't know that there, there isn't busy days. So we always have emerging cyber threats that we're that we're dealing with. But of course, the ongoing uh, conflict in the Ukraine is 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 something that's we're, we have very heightened awareness and are trying to make sure that we're responding and looking at every single incident that gets reported to us and making sure it's not part of a larger uh, you know potential threat to the U.S. Um, when when we you, when you look at that just just the sheer tantamount scope of how big that that challenge could be and then you look at these cyber games is there a correlation or is there an importance that these cyber games have? In, in potentially, you know, you know, creating future folks who can protect, you know, the, you know, work for work for CISA, work to defend the the national interests of the U.S. or any other country out there in the world. Yeah, one hundred percent. So we know that there's a global shortage of cybersecurity professionals, as well as a, a huge shortage in the U.S. 
Uh, so much of our critical infrastructure is underpinned by, uh, you know, IT systems and operational technologies that are connected to the internet and need securing. Uh, these, these types of competitions are an excellent chance to get hands-on experience with forensics, with uh, attack techniques, and, and really just understanding how important cyber is at protecting our critical infrastructure. Is, when, when, you look at, when you look at the different types of CTFs out there, um, obviously this one is castle versus castle. You've got the, the flag, uh, the capture the flag type of scenarios that are out there. Um, you've got you know, other types of APT emulation. Is there, a, in your mind, when you're looking at training the next generation of cyber folks, is there a, a, a good, bad, or indifferent uh, way in which you know, folks should be focusing in on, on preparing for the real world uh, cyber attacks that are happening out there? So I think any anytime you can gamify, you know, some of the techniques that you'll actually learn for on the job um, is amazing. And I think the more that you can do a, a diversity of these types of competitions, um, the, the better. So uh, my my background is in instant response, so I'm a little partial to forensics challenges and things along those lines. Uh, I can geek out really hard on those, but I love to, tr to practice the offensive challenges because it's not my background, and I learn more about the def defensive side every time. Uh, I pop a box about you know what what I should be trying to protect and secure as well as what forensic artifacts could be created uh, w you know when when you're actually uh, compromising a machine. I, I think that that's an incredible point because it's it's a very it's one that's that's I think is taken for granted on the blue team side is it is equally important to understand how to do red teaming as you're doing the blue teaming type of role. Does it, does it disappoint you that we don't have or we don't focus on as many of the blue team style CTFs as we do on the red team style CTFs? I mean, for me, yes, as a defender, uh, just a little bit. But again, you know, I, I encourage all of our blue team folks to try to, you know, crack, crack open Cali and Metasploit and, and try to do some of those, you know, war boxes or other things to learn the offensive skills. Because again, I, I think you have to understand how the offense is going to operate to be a good defender. Um, I, I would like to see easier ways to do some of these defensive type challenges that might involve, you know, terabyte images and Ooh. or you know, huge gigabyte memory samples. We have some challenges, I think, to get around there, and hopefully, we can make use of you know, cloud technologies and other things to do to better in that arena. That, that's a fantastic point. I, d I do find that a lot of the forensic style challenges um, end up being, you know, on small images. They end up being pretty easy to solve because they're, they're, they're not, you know, indicative of the so large size disk spaces that we have currently at our disposal right now. Yeah, or, or too many Stego images that I saw. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, the, the, uh, the early 2000s called and they want their attack TTPs back. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about what about the emergence of purple teaming? Kind of, what's your take on the emergence of purple teaming and its importance in the industry today? I, I think it's super important. It's something that we're trying to focus on on CISA is is trying to do more of that. Trying to make sure that our um, both our red team and blue team operators as well take time out during their busy operation schedules to to do um, threat emulation exercises and um, other important things. I think that's one of the most important things you can do is make sure you have not just adequate staff to do their jobs, but you have enough staff so the, that your staff can take, you know, 20 to 30% of their time or so to hone in on their skills, to hone in on improving their tools. Um, and I think, you know, practicing these CTFs and learning new techniques, both uh, on the offensive and defensive side is a huge part of that. When, when we talk about one of the things that, that I talk about on my show, and I've had um, I've had numerous uh, folks from breach and attack simulation company uh, Attack IQ come on our stream um, pretty extensively, and I try to harp on you know I, I spend a lot of my time offensive cyber with NSA um, building red teams for a lot of Fortune 100 companies over my career, and I try to encourage folks not to look at breach and attack simulation as um, you know you know you know easy pen testing or you know kicking you out of your job because it's automated it's it's raising that skill level up so that you can you can allow a machine to do the easy stuff like scanning networks looking for known uh, TTPs exploiting the easy stuff MS08067 or things like that um, what would you say to a pen tester who shies away from breach and attack simulation or thinks that those are trying to take their job or belittle the art if you will around red teaming uh oh uh, I think I think we lost Chris. I think Chris Chris is like, nope. That 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 question was a was a was a edge too far on that one. Um, all right, I think I I I will bring I'll bring Eric back in on uh, on that one. Um, that's okay. That's okay. That was a, that was that last plug I was trying to get in with Chris really quick to to get him to talk about that one. But how cool was that? 
How cool was well, that? Well, did you see me in the back? I did. Kind of I was watching you in the green room. <laughs> More blue team CTFs. Yes. Come yes. On. Yes. Well, and it's because it, it is true. It's totally true. We, um, but I mean, we've talked about, I, I know I've talked about this. I know you've talked about this on your show as well, quite a lot, right? Everybody thinks that the red teaming side is so sexy and it's, it's the thing that everybody wants to do, but there you go. You've got the, 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 the CISA, you know, telling people that we need more blue teamers. We need more defenders. We've got to focus in on defending, um, uh, defending organizations. And so, um, we need more blue team CTFs. Absolutely. Yeah, we need more blue teams and the purple on the on the other side is how do we interact? Security is a team sport. So interacting between those defenders and those people that are doing the offense, being able to look at vulnerability management in the middle there, because I always look at vulnerability management in the middle because they're doing the same techniques, you know, doing the scanning, doing the vulnerabilities, identifying the vulnerabilities, trying to close those holes. And that's kind of in the middle because you got to know what the vulnerabilities are on the outsides, the malware, the threats and the vulnerabilities that are there and being able to tell people hey listen you know these are the, to the defenders this is the things that you need to be working to close those windows and those doors so that they can't get in your house and so being able to do those ctfs for blue teams is going to be very very productive for our industry Absolutely, absolutely, and and just for 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 more clarification, like what Chris was talking about, um, most most forensic CTFs are not focused on kind of the 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 disk types, disk spaces, the the challenges that are currently faced with today's forensics folks. So that was interesting from his perspective. Uh, real quick plug that I'm going to give you heard us talk about purple teaming, APT emulation, breach and attack simulation. I'm going to give a huge plug for a cyber and security sponsor for Attack IQ. Um, they are you know in my mind one of the best um, or the best uh, breach and attack simulation company that's out there. They also have free purple teaming training. And that's why we partner with them on the stream is because it's free training. You can hit that exclamation point attack IQ in chat and you can go take free MITRE training, free purple team training, all sorts of free training that exists out there. Um, we'll have a commercial later for their purple hats conference coming up um, uh, as well. But they do, they do a ton they do a ton for the community by providing that free training. I also just got word from my mods that we are in the midst of a giveaway. Um, so I think our first giveaway for the night is definitively going on. It looks like they're giving away um, uh, we, uh, a lot of root. So for those who um, uh, for those who who are not aware, uh, root is a very very is it it's it's. It's neotropic, yeah. Nootro nootropic, nootropic is the word, right? So it's it's healthy, right? But it's an energy drink, right? So it doesn't taste healthy. It tastes like kind of a an, an orange type of, of energy drink. But obviously, I've been up up in here. Uh, you know, we've we've been up in here since about seven o'clock prepping for this stream. I've obviously been able to keep my height together, thanks to these guys right here. The root root has been kind enough to give us uh, fifteen cases, fifteen cases of root to give away. You can see that I'm, I'm, I'm keeping the root so beside me so we can keep rolling through this entire stream. But um, we got 15 cases. It's already of root gone through half a case. Uh, no, just two. Just two. So that's, that's a, that's a one-fourth of the case. I got a quarter of the case down to, 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 to go on. So um, very, very uh, grateful for Root for providing that. Um, also, for today only, today only, um, if you use the code in chat, Cyber 50, you can get 50% off of a case of root. That's uh, it, the, normally the discount that's for the cyber and security team is 20%. It's literally half off today to get your root going. And this stuff is awesome. I, I, owe, you, I owe you a case, Eric, but um, you know, it's it's still pretty awesome. Um, looks like I've got a question uh, from Lee Chen on LinkedIn chat says what is purple teaming Eric do you want to kind of give a uh, overall definition of purple teaming well purple teaming is uh, a new concept it's been in the last couple years that we've been using and it's like we've been talking it's the midpoint between red teaming and blue teaming and it's the interface between the two teams um, a lot of the teams that I see on the purple side are teams that are connecting the dots between them. I mentioned vulnerability and threat management. Um, 
traditionally that's been in the blue side because it helps the defensers, the defenders, but it's in the middle of identifying the threats, identifying the malware, identifying the, the things that the blue team and passing it on to the red team or the opposite. The red team identifies vulnerability, the vulnerability team or the purple team identifies those and, and validates those and then gives it back to the blue team to, to secure and close the holes. So somewhere, think of it as the middle ground between red and blue. Awesome. And um, that go ahead. definition changes depends on your, your, your organization too, so. I want to. I want what. I, the only thing that I would add to that, right, is is mo some some teams have been doing purple teaming for a minute, right? They've been, um, you know, you've got a red team that'll come in and sit with the blue team, say, "Hey, look, let me show you how I'm doing these attacks. Let me show you, you know, what it looks like to run an exploit or things like that." And the blue teams can watch their defensive you know, systems as the red team is attacking. We didn't have a name for it in the past. We just did it because we wanted to try to make those blue teams, you know, better and faster. And I think that that's really the the overarching goal of what purple teaming is. Um, for, for those who are, who are asking in chat, what is purple teaming? Is that ability to participate with the red team so that you can understand how attacks are done and how they look from a defender perspective? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Real quick, I want to remind everybody, you can use the hashtag PlaySyber on Twitter to live tweet us as we are, uh, as we are going through um, uh, uh, these, uh, um, uh, going through these events uh, today. Let's do a quick check in over on the scoreboard and then, um, uh, and, and then we will, uh, we will bring in our next caster for today. Um, looks like we still have, looks like a big, huge jump in score. Huge jump in score here. Omega um, uh, has uh, has taken an, an edge of the lead with 2,300, followed by Beta and Kappa. And I'll have the uh, I'll have those uh, actual team names for you here in a little bit, since the scoreboard doesn't tell me. But um, you can see it's still been a, a pretty linear growth uh, on the scores uh, as they've gone up. So uh, the teams are running pretty uh, pretty neck and neck here. Um, it's it's going to be a race to the finish. It looks like as they uh, as they go. When I, when I look at the scores, and again, just when I look at these scores uh, right here, um, what I what I what I feel like is they're doing a really good job of that collaboration, right? Where they're seeing attacks, they're defending attacks, and they're work. It it feels like when I see this type of close collaboration, they're probably working on both of their um their their communication strategies at the same time. If we head over here to the teams, it looks like we are tuned into Win Hunt One again who is, um, looks like they're on PowerShell, uh, right now. Looks like they're, they're hunting for something over on PowerShell, uh, uh, as well on this side too. So, um, not sure what WinHunt1 is looking for. Oh, actually, uh, I see a download there in the back for CBE 2017, uh, 12617.py. So I'm not sure if they are attempting to, uh, patch this firewall rule or something. Uh, you know, they've got, they've got PF sense up. I don't know if you can make any sense of this one, Eric. Yeah, I'm looking here. Um, so one of the things that I'm looking is they're trying to get into one of their devices, uh, to be able to perhaps patch it or look at the vulnerability. Um, that they found during their their look at PF Sense. So by looking at what they're doing in the background there, um, looks like they're either looking for that vulnerability so that they can patch it, or they're you know hunting for something that they saw that happened within their network. Yeah, we'll we'll continue to to monitor Win Hunt One and see what they've got going in. For now, I want to bring in our next caster, somebody you and I know and love so much. So glad that that she is here to join us. My good friend, our me. partner in crime, the one and only Jack Scott. How are you doing this morning, ma'am? Uh, you're on mute. We got mute fails this morning. Second one. Oh, actually, third one. Oh, we've got mute fails this morning. Ah, oh, so much mute failing this morning. Quick, quick, 
quick, say something about her so she can't respond to it. You can't. Ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> let's talk about let's talk about her background there no <laughs> uh, don't, uh, let's not talk about her background that is a that that's a sore subject for miss jacks right there for sure um <laughs> it's uh it, it, here's here's what i here's what i will say I'll, I'll i'll take this i'll take this time to uh uh to 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 just gloat over uh, over Jax here a little bit because i do i do love Jax. i think she's awesome i'm so glad that she is going to be hopefully joining us here in a little bit um as we talk through um uh uh some cyber threat intelligence stuff that's going on she's going to leave and come back in it looks like so we'll head back over to uh to to wind hunt one which uh i do think is uh us dco team so this is us defensive team here um uh that's that's running through so yeah it looks like they might be uh might be trying to patch that firewall here a little bit yeah looking at all the rules here and making sure i hope they did their uh change management for this but they're <laughs> looking at all the rules here and looks like they're this is the edge router on the outside um at the site so you know, this is where you would look at. Oh, okay. Whoops. Yeah. So it looks like they're looks like they're going through the edge router rules. Yeah. If I'm if I if I'm looking at this correctly, that's what I'm looking at. Yeah. So for so for those who are, who aren't aware, they're using Viata. You can see up at the top the username Viata at site edge router uh, up at the top of the screen. Viata is a very very common uh, virtualized firewall platform. Um, very awesome. I remember them back in 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 uh, some of the, uh, the the earlier days. They were. Um, uh, really awesome in terms of doing um, uh, virtualized routers. So obviously that's what they're using for some of their core infrastructure is the the Viata, um, uh, you know, uh, type of virtualized infrastructure. Um, now in terms of in terms of firewall rules, when they talk about the uh, um, the the rules, you know, from a gaming perspective in terms of the firewall rules, how important is it to get very very specific on which firewall rule you're going to put in place? Well, number one, why not just block of, all of a certain country or all of a certain subnet? Well, well, that that then goes back to what we were talking in the intro, where it's, you know, what are the rules of the company? We cannot afford to block uh, from, you know, the, the services that we need for the company to continue to do business. So doing a, you know, block everything across the board will then block your company from doing work from doing work so that business interaction what one of the things that people need to realize is that cybersecurity and our defenders and and all our teams are there to support the business and if the business can't continue to operate then we're doing our jobs wrong so it's all about continuing the business, continuing the flow of the business. And we can't just put a complete wall around us to, to protect ourselves. So it's looking at what known good traffic is, knowing and be specific about those rules so you don't block the business. Oh, now he's muted. Ah, that, this game. My mute was easy to fix. <laughs> I didn't want to. I didn't want to make you jealous as I popped open another route. So I, I put myself <laughs> on mute as I popped open another route. Um, we need a countdown. We need a count on the top of the screen for how many, how many? Uh, mute fails we have. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, I, over a stream this big, we're gonna have a lot of mute fails for sure. Um, but um, you know, we oftentimes hear like, and I think that this is one of those misconceptions about cyber, right? Is um, hey, why don't you just block all of a country? Why don't you just block all of a subnet? Why don't you just block all of this? Why don't you just block? Why don't you just block all RDP, right? You know, things like that. And I think what what you see here when we talk about the realism of this challenge, right, is that you know you can't just block an entire subnet. You can't just block an entire team from attacking your organization you have business requirements you have you have critical business needs you have critical business applications those critical business applications must have access to the internet and i think that that oftentimes gets lost on people when they're thinking about these cts when you add in that truly realistic challenge you have to be very very surgical you have to be very very precise on how you do this and for people that might not know the details of this, you see their rule three, port 53. You know, 
that's your DNS. That's the, you know, where are you getting the information? So that needs to be open uh, to the world. And unfortunately, you know, you can do some attacks against that. But, you know, these, a lot of these ports need to be open to specifics. And that doesn't even speak to what the applications that you're using or the things that you need to reach in and out of your organization. So sometimes you can't block it or sometimes you can't block a specific country, but you need it open. The important part on the blue side is how are we monitoring the traffic that's coming through those windows and doors? If if you had to if you had to name your top three ports that are most commonly overlooked but are required to be open to the internet, what would they be? <laughs> I know, I know, it's right? Just, yeah. <laughs> I can give you ten. Um, so SQL, yeah, yeah, you know, SQL gets overlooked all the time. Um, DNS, SSH. You know, and then the other ones like VNC or any of the remote access or RDP type type ports that get completely overlooked and not overlooked in the firewall sense, but overlooked in the in the monitoring sense mm. as well. So, you know, people don't put rules of what is known good traffic or point to point traffic, you know, their actions and their and destinations that they're looking at. I always tell my, my people that when you're doing remote access type ports is make sure that you have specific rules for those access and destin the destination. OK, so if I have a developer in in let's just say in the uk or for my latin countries you know in uh in peru you know so being able to do a point to point rule so that we know that it's coming from that person that's not foolproof but it's something that's going to knock out you know 70 percent of the of the threat nice nice let's uh let's check back in on miss jacks see if we got miss jacks back now are you with us no. Wait. No. No, we still don't have jacks. Oh no. Yes. Oh no. Oh, poor jacks. Are we we got you. We got you. We're not leaving without you. We're not leaving without you, jacks. <laughs> I drug you to this. I drug you to this fest. There we go. There no. we go. Hallelujah. We got you. <laughs> what a day i well you know what i love sitting in the green room listening to you guys talk in the background so it was good it's good to catch up and see all the actions going on out here so happy happy, happy here. saturday to you yeah yeah i've been up since like 6 6 30 a.m i needed to get school work done and i just woke up and i was ready to go and first thing i thought about when i woke up was cyber games <laughs> like yes, yeah. yes. Cyber games. let's do yeah. some cyber games baby yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah i didn't even like i had to pick my wardrobe for this i wasn't even sure what to wear i was like what i wish i had That's a cyber sad. game shirt oh, like have we... you seen the jerseys Oh yeah. Oh, I I can't wait for the I can't wait for mine to come in. I can't wait for my my, my jersey. We're gonna have to talk to Jess about that. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Um. So um. So we're gonna we're gonna roll back over to uh, uh to a player view while we which uh I thought they were oh I thought we're so we're gonna roll over here. We're gonna we're gonna see what they these guys got going on while we chat now. Now Jax, um I uh, we're coming up on a critical intel drop for the teams. The teams are about to get a a pretty critical intelligence drop. As you're looking at the cyber games, as you're thinking about these teams going castle v castle and and attacking and defending at the same time, um and you're you're about to get an intel drop or you're about to receive an intel drop um about some piece of critical cyber attack or cyber threat that's happening in your organization, what are some of the things that should be going through your mind from like a cyber threat intelligence perspective? Mm. Okay, so we're at the start of the games with with this intel, right? That's so everything's correct. well. We're, we're about stages. we're about an hour we're about an hour into it. We're about an hour into okay. it. Okay. Well, at this point in time, I mean, I would be gathering artifacts on everything that I would be doing right now. So I'd have my knowledge management is key when you're doing cyber threat intel. So if I'm about to get a dump, I would start. I would RFI like, where's the dump coming from? Um, what are it, 
what are they are they going to be in hashes is this going to be a a, a file what is that going to look like and then i would start from the start of this everybody that's listening you should have knowledge management already in place and note taking especially for cyber threat intel because you're going to be developing your picture as you're going through this so that's what i would be focused on and then when the information came in i would focus on how i'm how am i going to tourniquet that data and go through it and filter it and identify what can i use to help me pivot throughout this capture the flag event what um what are some of the key indicators that could be coming that you would be hoping to come through on some cyber threat intel that may sway either an offensive or a defensive decision that you've got come that you're hoping to look out for? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. I, I mean, that's a tough question to answer because I don't <laughs> like I don't know. I'm not in the the CTF right now, so I don't know how everything how everything is flowing and that's okay what that's okay just talk about a high level from like what you would expect from a cyber operation or even for just from an intelligence you know perspective hmm. i mean i could tell you like like from my perspective when 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 wanna cry happened or when um uh you know when 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 you know the colonial pipeline thing happened if i was in if i was in colonial pipeline when that happened or any of these other major cyber events that we see going on right i want to know i want to know as much about you know that i can get a hold of right is it ip addresses is it hashes is it ttps mm -hmm. is it um you know source country source uh, uh uh nations you know what are if we have companies that have been you know attacked by a piece of intelligence like what does that look like so i know from my perspective i want i i fundamentally want as much data as possible whether i'm on the uh the, the the offensive side or the defensive side now maybe i'm a glutton for punishment and i think about you know like i i don't mind doing the the cognitive overload that comes with uh with, with having all that intelligence but personally i want as much of it as humanly possible yeah having as much data as you can get is good it can be information overload i was gonna say i hear a button um, in there from her <laughs> yeah it can be information overload so i'm trying what i'm trying to do as you're talking is put myself in the shoes of all these all these competitors right now and thinking about uh you know investigations not pecha as something that's on my mind when you brought up a a specific type of malware because i just did a research paper on not pecha that attacked uh ukraine and they attacked the software uh the the software that they use for third-party vendors that then eventually affected uh mercs as we know it completely mm -hmm. took down mercs a few years ago so during that attack there's certain things that i would be paying attention to in this capture the flag event like you mentioned would be can we identify the location of the adversary is it coming out of ukraine are they coming out of russia where are they where can we find that information and we also have to keep in mind that a lot of this is going to be proxy so if we do see it coming out of russia they may not be located in russia they could be located in another area and then it's grab gathering all of those as you said ttps tactic techniques and procedures that we're seeing. And that will start helping us to be able to have better identification of what is actually happening and taking place on the network. So for me, everything is like, there's a step in a procedural process. And right now we're in the collection phase of the intelligence cycle. And then we're going back in that intelligence cycle picture and just keep reassessing and refining our picture. Attribution, Attribution is a hard thing, but that is always an ultimate goal within cyber threat intel is being able to identify where are these attacks coming from? Can we identify who the possible threat actors are or their level of expertise, which you can see by going through and reviewing uh, your artifacts and then I being able to ultimately reach TTPs and attribution, which is always extremely challenging to do, and it takes a long time. I don't think we'll have attribution at the end of this capture the flag, but <laughs> I mean, maybe. I don't know how the capture flag laid out. Maybe it will be. <laughs> but I mean, I would, I would still. I mean, you, you. I think you and I have spoken on this before. I still think attribution okay. in a cyber world is is pretty much, you know, a, a wasted cause. I don't think that most yeah. most security teams are are equipped or in a position to uh, uh, really handle attribution from a cyber threat intelligence perspective. Anyway, it takes too long. It's. Um, even okay so the recent let's talk about the most recent attacks that we're seeing in ukraine with the russia ukraine activities that are going on out there you will notice that even researchers saying that they believe that the attacks are coming from russia because we don't have enough research and even the data that we have even if it is like one of the malwares 
were a destruction malware. They could possibly tie it to NotPetya. NotPetya was created as a global malware, but it was really designed to focus in on Ukraine. So, and we know that NotPetya is tied to GRU. Um, that means that it would likely be attribution of Russia, but still saying Russia's attacking Ukraine on cyber warfare, it's still an iffy thing because we don't have enough of the artifacts to be able to actually say yes, 100%. And we know that it takes years, and even after three to five years of investigations, you still can't claim or uh, prosecute a cyber actor or a cyber group or a nation state because attribution is so it's it's volatile it's very hard to do and so so for those listening like like jax has got an obviously an amazing background and 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 history when it comes to to cyber cyber threat intelligence cyber defense and things like that um you know and and what you're describing is and you've got a ton of experience with dod and government and military as well with all the work that you've done over the years you're talking about even how hard it's been from from that perspective let alone if you were a fortune 100 or a fortune 500 or a fortune 1000 to even attempt to do any level of of attribution at all uh, you know in that regard too right Attribution for if you're talking about, you know, corporate organizations, that is going to take a substantial amount of money and bandwidth people to be able to find attribution. That's why a lot of times we see in these attacks, uh, these organizations come out, they announce that they've been breached. If they do announce it, we're getting we're seeing more of those, obviously, now. And then it really stops after they've got their data back. Or, you know, the investigation really stops at that point in time. And some people ask why. And that's really because it takes a lot of time and a lot of money. And the organization's already put out a ton of money in incident response and getting their data back or paying their ransomware upwards of millions of dollars. The last thing they worry about now is going after the threat actor that that did this or the nation state that did this. And it really stops. And, and the threat actors know that. They know that if they can win, likely you continuing and pursuing them is is not going to happen. Who does that? That's our that's our bureaus. As we've seen, like the FBI is getting more involved. The NSA, we're seeing it from the State Department. They're taking on that role in that position to really go after some of these these nation states and these threat actors, just like Colonial Pipelines. And we saw uh, that money, that ransom being taken out of their Bitcoin accounts. Mm-hmm. So, so and we are now seeing a lot of with these new rules and laws that people will have to report these types of the, of of attacks so within yes. 24 yes. 48 hours so yep. that's that's new as of the last couple of weeks so so real, real quick scoreboard check in. It looks like we've got uh, Zeta and Beta fighting over that number one spot. Zeta, for those who are wondering, is Canada. So give it up for the Canadians fighting for that number one spot. And number two, sitting in the number two spot is Beta fighting for that number two spot. So we'll continue to do a check in on the uh, on the scoreboard as well. We're going to head over here to uh, this is Red Two. Uh, so this is uh, the 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 red team for uh, uh, for one of the teams. I'll I'll get that here in a little bit. Oh, this is Oceana. I'm being told this is Oceana. 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 Um, so this is our folks from Australia who are representing that side, um, that that team as well. So this is the red team on Oceana. It looks like they're um, on Omega.edu, do, using the inspector on the web page, continuing to look for those web vulnerabilities on that website. Now now, Jax, your fandom is already coming to light in chat. I'm looking over here um, in in chat. Um, One of uh, Armando Flores wants to know where they can read your paper on uh, on malware, the research paper you just did. So I don't know if it's something that's specifically for school that's not available out there, but if you have it, um, can you pass that link to one of my mods and one of my mods can drop it into uh, uh, into chat. Um, Christopher Weber, had a very, very simple question, but also very, very relevant. I think that this is this is why we do this, is it's oftentimes overlooked as we have these conversations. But they asked, what is an artifact? So when you talk about artifacts, mm. what is an artifact? Oh, God, that's such a great question. Um, so artifacts could be a hash. It could be a sample of a malware. It could be an IP address that was associated with the attack that, like the beaconing, what we believe to be the C2 beaconing. Um, So an artifact, how I look at an artifact, is anything that is associated with your investigation that gets you closer to identifying what happened on your network um, and who possibly 
conducted the malicious activities on your network. It's like uh, thinking of uh, taking it out of cyber and making it into uh, a, a criminal investigation with a body. An artifact, if you had a murder scene, would be where did the bullet go when it, you know, when it hit the victim and hit the wall, and you know, collecting the artifacts of what did they have in their fingernails? If was there any skin in the fingernails? Like looking at the entire crime scene and collecting everything that you can. Uh, that is what an art. That's what artifacts are for a cyber threat intel investigation. And also, one more thing to add to that: artifacts are what you use to co corroborate your investigation to bring it all together to tell the story. So another artifact could be from another news report or a, another researcher that you saw online that was researching the same investigation where you guys corroborate your evidence. So you get additional sources to identify and state that what you have found is accurate in your assessment. And that could be additional artifacts to support your investigation. Awesome. So, um, so real quick, I want to I want to head back over to the scoreboard before we go to our first commercial break. And I had to verify something with the moderators because I didn't believe my eyes when I when I saw this. Right. So we're looking at the live scoreboard, and uh, uh, you may have noticed uh, as as we go down here and we see the teams, we have this team Delta here, and um, uh, I, I they're tied. I, they they are they're tied. And I asked the moderator team. I said, "Who is Delta?" And they said, "Delta." Is North Africa. As a, you remember that I mentioned this morning, North Africa was unable to attend this event because they didn't have enough people show up. So what you're looking at is Delta, the North Africa team, scoring points based on predefined defensive measures that they set up prior to the start of the, the event that have been in place defending their castle since the start of the event. So there is a there is a team here, Delta, who has no active participants on the battlefield right now wow. doing offensive operations that is just doing defense based on a predefined set of rules that they put into place that is in third and place. I, that's impressive. And I got a gloat. And I got a gloat because here's another example of why blue team is so important. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, incredible. That's so right. impressive. Wow. It is. It is. We're going to listen. Here's here's what we're going to do. We are going to go to our first commercial break of the day. Um, give Eric and I a chance to, to step up, stretch our legs. Uh, uh, you know, you know, everybody take a, a chance to, uh, you know, refresh their beverages. Yeah. We're going to come back before you do. What's up? There was a first blood. I think there was I'm a first seeing. blood. What? Check it. Uh oh. Uh oh. Did we get a first blood? All right, we'll, we'll, we'll check on that first blood. We'll grab that first blood when we come back from a break. Um, everybody, uh, uh, stick around. We'll come back with Jax, Eric, and myself. We'll uh, take a look at the scores. We'll take a look at what that first blood was, and we'll see you here in a little bit. Never before has the world been as connected as today. And while cyberspace grows more complex by the minute, attacks are on the rise. In order to ensure a secure online world, experts in cybersecurity are needed more than ever. This is why the world's best talents in IT security meet, network and compete in the first ever International Cybersecurity Challenge. Participants from all over the world join forces and form teams for their global region. The European Union Agency for Cybersecurity, ANISA, trains the European team in dedicated events for Europe's top cyber talents to face the rest of the best. All teams will travel to Athens, Greece, to compete against each other in the first International Cybersecurity Challenge. Want to network and grow with the future leading experts in IT security? Then join us. You will be able to measure yourself in innovative capture the flag and other challenges, tackling different aspects of the cybersecurity domain. Starting this journey is simple. All you need to do is participate in a local event and then prove yourself by reaching the top. In Europe, ANISA supports the development of national competitions culminating in the European Cybersecurity Challenge. 
It's never too late to start mastering the cyber skills the world of tomorrow needs. Join us towards a trusted and secure cyberspace. And welcome back, everybody. There we go. 
All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, hopefully, everybody got the thanks for thanks for participating in the commercial break. Hopefully, everybody got up, stretched their legs, um, gave us an opportunity to uh, uh, take a look at the the status of everything. Things are looking awesome. So. Um, uh, we mentioned uh, earlier, we were talking about threat intelligence with Jax and Eric. Um, I want to kind of jump back into some of the action because it looks like as we look through some of the logs. And so um, what we're looking at here, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, um, you know, we've talked about the change management process and, and things like that. But we also noticed that one of the ways that uh, that defenders are required to um uh to keep track of their actions is by keeping a defender log this is very much if for those who have been in the military or are familiar with the concept of like a master station log or something like that um uh you know this is the that type of master station log where they're tracking all of their activity and you can see that we're currently looking at the uh the u.s blue team um uh inside of inside of their uh, uh inside of their defender log and you see up there at the top that they've got uh, apt 40 activity detected uh, inside of their defender log, so they did get that intel brief. Uh, they did discern that that intelligence that came from that from that intel brief. It looks like, and they were able to write a defender log entry uh, detecting that APT forty activity. So that was a pretty quick turnaround on hmm. uh, uh, from that intel drop. Go ahead. And Neil, let's for those people in the stream, what does APT stand for? So that's, I think that's, that's a good one. Go for it. That. Go for it, Jax. Um, advanced persistent threat. And so, and, the, and what that means is, and how it's identified is usually advanced. So that requires funding, money. Um, usually it's a nation state that's an APT. And then it's an adversary that is known to reside on your network for a certain period of time too. Persistent. So they're on there, they have a dwell time of a few months. So yeah, APTs are usually very robust in their capabilities. They have very refined TTP. Some of them even have their own created tooling and malware as well. So ABT 40, that's a huge win. That's a China um, ne Nexus APT. So I was actually, so Josh actually sent me one of the downloads um, on C Signal. And so during my break, what I did is I looked it up and then I started opening up some of my OSINT tools to start going through some of these IP addresses. And they have everything in here. They have URLs, um, IP addresses to be able to pivot from, some hashes I'm seeing. I'm seeing file names, likely malware I wouldn't know. Um, so this is, this is a lot of great data. One of the things I would do with this, because this is a lot, and if they're coming in at the, with this much information, it's gonna be hard to go through these individually. So some things that you all can consider, any of the players that are listening to this, is creating a script to be able to run some of these IOC, IOCs through different platforms. For example, this isn't the best, but it's a really good one, Alien Vault, because it does a great, um, it has a great platform for running a script and then filtering through some of those IOCs to see if anything's been hitting on any of those, which will, it's a good start. And then it'll help you really hyper focus into some of those IOCs that you can start digging into a little bit easier. And these are those artifacts that you were referencing before we went to the break, correct? Yeah, these would all be artifacts, everything that are that's located in this Intel dump that I'm seeing. There's nothing in here I wouldn't consider an artifact. It, there's a lot of information, though. I'm like, wow. Well, yeah. and, yep. and, and, and just just real quick, before, hold that thought for a second, Eric. But but I just want to kind of show everybody just how quickly that changed the scope of the game for the oh, wow. U.S. team. You can literally see that they've practically doubled their score on the scoreboard with that level of detection, um, with how quickly they were able to get that intel, uh, discern what they needed to do on that intel, and put rapid countermeasures in place. And they've literally, the U.S. has now taken over that number one simply by executing uh, rapidly on that threat intelligence brief. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, and understanding not just what you get from that... Um um, Intel brief, but researching that Intel brief and seeing what are the things that they do that this APT does, you know, what are the, uh, the, the exploits that they, they look at, looking at the CVEs that they, that they attack normally and putting defenses in place for those types of CVEs. That's going to pay off dividends. It's doing your research and CTI is all about researching your adversary. How when you when you talk about that though, because I mean it's it's easy for us to to talk about that in a small little microcosm like this this CTF. When you're looking at the volumes of threat intelligence that comes out there, the amount of indicators that you can get from a threat intelligence feed, whether it's Alien Vault or somewhere else like that, 
how how surma- how insurmountable does that task seem when you think about the the vast amount of artifacts or indicators that that you can get either one of you yeah I, I'll, I'll step in on this one that's why i mentioned the script creating a script and being able having your techniques for you personally on how you're going to filter that information because and i'm talking from this perspective as an individual because we have tools for that you know you've got threat intel platforms that do that filtering for you Otherwise, it's going to be information overload. So you've got to figure out, I've got this information. How do I filter it? And I would recommend getting a script and then putting it into a database and having it filter out for you that way. What do you think? Passing it off. Well, to me, to me, it's all about knowing what you have, because if you don't know what you have, you can't defend. So some of these CVEs or attacks or threat intelligence that comes in, there's terabytes of information that comes every day on IOCs. But if you can filter it down, like Jax was saying, so I've got a Linux box, I've got a Windows box and you know Windows 10. So focus on what you know you have. So asset identification internally is very important. So you can filter out, you know, I don't have an Oracle database. Why do I need to know about Oracle vulnerabilities? So that right there is a defender's dream to say, I've got a good asset inventory. Now I can filter out my IOCs. Now I can put defenses against those IOCs. And so when we put that in perspective, right? So so you're you're sitting at the you're sitting at these team captains page, you know, seats. You're getting that APT forty uh, uh, threat intel brief that came in at, at about thirty minutes ago. And and to Jax's point, you're looking at all these artifacts in these IOCs. Do you just blatantly put all of that into into your defensive mechanisms when you get those uh, th- those IOCs, or you know what are, what are some of the kind of the what is that thought process that goes? God, there's a lot here. How do I break that down? So what I would do is no, I would not put them all into my defensive presence because then I got you're a little bit of an echo there, Jax. Oh, is it okay now? Still echoing? No, there you go. You're good now. Okay, I'll move away from my mic. It might have been I had a freeze in my network too. Um, so to answer your the question about putting it all into your defensive measures, I would not because that's going to create noise and false positives depending on what you're utilizing for your alerting and your evaluation of it. I would go back to again filtering since we know it's APT forty. I would probably do some research around APT, understanding what TTPs do they typically utilize. What are their what um, what tooling do they use? That's going to help me as I filter through this because there's a lot of DLLs in here. So I would look through some of this after I research them and understand a little bit more about what they leverage for their tooling and their activities, and that'll help me kind of hyper focus into this because. This is a lot of information. I'm telling you, a lot of it's going to be noise. It absolutely will be. Yeah. So I, I did just get notice. We did get first blood from the Canada team. Um, I'm waiting to. Uh, I'm waiting for the teams to to give me something to share. Uh, they they had a password up on the this the screen in, initially, and so I didn't want to didn't want to uh, show that for the for the sake of of OSINT reasons. Um, but you can see here we're now on the. Uh, I think we're on the Canada machine here. Um, looks like the Canada machine did exploit that, of uh, that voting server that was on, um, wow. uh, we can look at that. Uh, we head over here to, uh, to, to this, we can see that, um, uh, on this, on, on the network map, we do have, uh, the voting server is located here inside of the network. Uh, so we do have, uh, we do have compromise from them on that, uh, on that voting server. And so they were able to actively exploit that uh, as well. So uh, we did get first blood on Canada. Good job on them for that one. Um, glad to see that one happen. Let's see if that did anything for their score. Uh, head back over here. Uh, we still see the U.S. leading on the score, but uh, Canada is coming in second place. So looks like Canada's got some ground to make up as well as the rest of the teams. That 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 defensive uh the defensive score really pushed the U.S. above uh, uh, on that one. So, so that's a that's a, that's a huge leap forward for uh, for everybody there. So we'll head back over to uh, to Canada, who's exploiting actively on the box right now, um, and see if we can't catch them. When we t- when we talk uh, when we talk about being on the box, um, when you're on the offensive side, 
uh, what are some of the things that you're thinking about as you're on this box? Like when you land on that box, what are some, what's your, where's your head at? What are you trying to figure out? Who wants to take this? Me? Yeah, go for it. Well, the first thing that I'm going to look at is what level of authorization and authentication that box has. This is so that I can pivot, use, maybe compromise some of the accounts that are there. If there's any APIs, if there's anything in that box that goes back mm -hmm. to another server that I can pivot into a deeper area of the organization. So looking at your, you know, this looks like it's a Linux box of some sort. So I'm going to look at my users. I'm going to look at my um, uh, my connections in there and see if I can use those accounts to pivot to other machines. Mm -hmm. Just one strategy. So it looks like, yeah, it looks like they're, that's what they're trying to do right now. It looks like they're trying to find some information and see what they can get off of that box. Just, uh, I, I did get a, I did get a piece of inject from the, uh, from the, the white cell team just to kind of talk about another visualization as to how that attack took place. Um, you know, the, the attackers are attacking from the internet part up there and they were able to directly exploit through the firewall uh, that voting machine that you see right there that we saw inside of the network. So you can visually see how that attack was, uh, was executed uh, uh, you know, in there. And so that was one of the ways that they could get points was actively on there. They're actually, actually we did just see them uh, here. They were able to uh, uh, run an echo command and output that to rootflag.txt. And they were, it looks like they may have been able to get the flag oh, that, there. That's awesome. So good job to to them on that one let's see um yeah. whoops that was not mouse 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 issues there we go let's pull that one back over let's see what we got here see if that affects the score at all for uh team canada right here so um good deal uh on that one so um that's awesome to see uh, that's what we were hoping to see is we we're hoping to see some some active exploitation um, you know, uh, looks like they're, uh, they're still on that box. They're still actively exploiting on that box and still trying to gather intelligence on that box. When you compromise into a network, um, obviously there's obviously going to be other intelligence that you can use to then pivot and move around from, uh, from that network into other parts of the network. Um, you know, what would be some, what would be some of your strategies? What are some of the things that you're looking for post compromise that would kind of help you understand where you need to go from here? Mm, this is such an IR question right now, incidents response question, I feel like, uh, <laughs> post-breach. Uh, uh, you're going to want to know if there was, like, and we're talking, when you're saying post-breach, we're talking, the, we've evaluated the box, and we've identified that the adversary was on this network. And now, now at that point in time, we would want to see what areas did they impact? Were they moving laterally? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Um, I don't really do post investigation, so it's a little out of my wheelhouse on the thought of that. That's okay. I, I'm what I'll jump in with is is from the adversary side, from the red team side. Um, I'm obviously you know one of the things that that's heavily harped on in, in offensive cyber operations for the military, right? Is the ability to do situational awareness. Um, you're on this box. You know you have no idea in a, in a nation state capacity. If there's another adversary on this box, if there is another nation state that's operating on this box. And so, um, you know, while the teams did immediately go for the flag, which obviously was the mission of them to, to get points to go for this flag, at that point in time, like I, I'd be looking on here and saying, okay, am I the only one operating on this network? What are some of the other boxes that this box is connected to? What are some of the other user accounts and SSH keys that may be used to, uh, to, to compromise adjacent systems? Um, obviously, there needs to be some vulnerability analysis that needs to happen on this box as well to see if this box is vulnerable to anything else. Now, in this case, you can see, um, for those who, who may not understand what you're looking at here, you're looking looking at um, uh, a compromised Linux box that um, doesn't have a typical bash or, um, or, or Z shell type of shell. So it's a very, very raw input format. So you're really, really limited. And this, this speaks to kind of the technical, um, technical capabilities of the teams that are here. You're very, very limited on the shell commands that you can run here. Um, you don't have all of the extra features and, and creature comforts that you typically think of when you think of a bash shell, when you think of a Z shell, um, anything like that. And so this really, really, really uh, uh, puts, the, uh, uh, puts the onus on the operator to understand how they're going to be able to move about this environment with very, very limited interaction with the user interface.
All right. So that's that's looks like they're still gonna they're still gonna move through that one uh, just a little bit. Um, check in. Question. Go for it. Um, the the competitors that we have competing right now were they did any of them receive or were they given any uh, documents with toolings that they could use utilize for OSINT toolings to help them or did everybody come with their own organic assets to this fight and they're just they're going at it with what they've had in their knowledge base. I think it's a. I think it's probably a combination of both. Um, there's a lot of. There's an entire range that's set up with their tools that they're going to be able to utilize um, to, uh, uh, to 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 be successful. Um, they, you know, I don't think that they're limited to uh, to OSINT capabilities. Why? What were you thinking? What were you going to suggest? I was just curious, and I was curious of like the Delta team. I wonder what they're what they're utilizing as their platform to automate their attack. Um, I'm curious, just overall, some of the the competitors that we have in there right now. Wow, Alpha, it just it was Alpha the one that just captured the flag. No, Alpha, that was the U.S. team who who caught the APT-40 and put in the the, the defensives on okay. that one. So I, I think it's great. safe to say that that the U.S. team has been the only one who's been able to capitalize on that that threat intelligence uh, for the uh, for the APT-40 as of right now. Yeah, I'm really curious what types of tooling the competitors are using to help them as they move through this. It looks like uh, looks like we're over here on Win Hunt too as they're uh, trying to look for IOCs. Uh, as well, so I think that they're uh, they're actively trying to uh, trying to do that hunt based on that intelligence as well. So uh, maybe we can catch them uh, in the in the midst of their hunt here. Um, when we talk about the threat hunting process, what's kind of the role of, um, of of threat intelligence in feeding how you execute those those hypotheses or those scenarios when it comes to uh, to doing threat hunting? Threat hunting is going to be driven by what the mission of the organization is. And then for, through that, that's so that's your initial understanding is um, like fintech. Well, I like to use examples because it just helps me explain. So I worked for a fintech organization. And for us, threat hunting was offensive, off defensive. We'll say defensive because we weren't really able to do offensive operations, which is going to change how you're going to do threat hunting. Um, but what we were able to do is like through this example, we could go into the network, we, we would review certain dashboards and identify anomalies, those anomalies. So like a beaconing, for example, we would see something that had, you know, a million beaconings within one week period. Well, that would show, okay, something is going on here through that, that we would take that, uh, that identifier, that IOC, which what we found out later would usually be a Chrome extension. <laughs> and through that research, the threat hunt would take us to the, the individual's machine. We would identify where the beaconing was going. It would be a C2 out of a particular location tied to a URL. And then through that process, we were able to identify that other users on the network, because then we would take those IOCs, we would scrape the overall FinTech network. We would identify, you know, sometimes upwards of two dozen machines that had the same exact uh, Chrome extension on their machine, and then we are able to remove that. So threat hunting, best way of looking at it is it's extremely fluid, and you'll hear the word pivot a lot, and we're going to see this through the capture the flag as well, is you're going to find a, a IOC, you're going to get an artifact, you're going to start going down what we call rabbit holes, and then there's going to be a point where you're going to have to decide when to pivot and how to pivot. You have to pivot and you have to pull yourself up sometimes from those rabbit holes within the threat hunt game. But it's all gonna be dependent when you're in the real world, really dependent on the level of risk the organization wants to take. And are you in a defensive or, or an offensive posture within the CTI realm, which so, will also dictate how you go about it. So, so real quick, I just I want to I want everybody to see the, the the expert move that the blue team or just did here on Winhunt 2. They made a critical move by changing their color to green. Everybody knows that you can't perform an active cyber investigation or offensive cyber operation unless your terminal is in green color. Oh and then clearly they are in the midst of hacking the Gibson right now by executing the tree <laughs> command. So clearly we have got the the best of the bestest threat hunter right here just totally owning this entire system I so it. i can't say i can't even begin to say how incredibly impressed i am <laughs> with uh with with this team right here in their uh, capability clearly two expert moves there uh eric you want to comment on on this expert level of, uh, of threat hunting they've got going on 
<laughs> yeah, I noticed immediately that they were going for the Matrix right here. So <laughs> we awesome. have to be plugged in and green colors for everything. So yeah. I think this was a fine move there. Pro move, the pro move right here. Let's see. Let's hop back over. Let's see if that affected their score at all. Uh, unfortunately, not. Uh, unfortunately, not. We still see uh, USA well, we've still got data that has been. Um, improving very much there uh, from the last time we checked it. So we that, is we, that is Canada. That is Canada right there. Yep, yep. So that's Canada. And Alpha is U.S. and Omega is Oceania. Oceania, yes, coming in, coming in third. So um, where's Delta? Where are we at with Delta? Delta. Okay, I see Delta. Delta, North that's Africa. Impressive. Delta, Delta, yeah, Delta still fourth. Yeah, still coming in fourth. So the, the team with no active offensive operations or even active defensive operations mm -hmm. is indeed still capitalizing on the environment. Um, and again, so, blue team for the win. I, I it, it really it really does continue to it really does continue to speak to just how important that flag ended up being. And, and, and again, this we, we've talked about this right when we talked about this earlier with uh um, with, with Chris at SZA, right? Is that everybody's so focused on red teaming? Everybody thinks red teaming literally is the, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the 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 sexiest thing that comes into cybersecurity. But again, I think from the realism perspective, we could see the value of being able to identify and actively respond quickly to a blue team type of threat. Mm-hmm. And like he was saying, you know, team. not doing Don't forget it about here. purple team. Oh yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Real quick, real quick, before you do that, Eric, I just want to say we just switched over to uh, Canada. Uh, Zeta, um, they are admin now on the vote server as well. So they did, uh, they did, uh, they were also able to uh, compromise that vote server. They're now in on that and uh, actively exploiting the vote server. So we'll lit here, sit here and see if we can't see them uh, continue to perpetuate their attack. Go ahead, Eric. I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, the, the gray hair we is kicking in. We were talking about red team, red team, blue team. That's what we were Top talking about. Top of the importance of blue team again. Yeah. yeah, so importance, and like you said, the purple team as well. So let's not forget the the critical cycle of getting information from cyber threat, putting it into, uh, analyzing it, and putting it into blue team and supporting that. And another, that and I remember now, and another thing that Chris said is not forgetting that as we go along in this, you know, it's not included in this CTF, but the OT side of the house, the operational, the IOT information that's going to be in there, that's going to be easier to compromise some of these things. So being able to put good blue team identification strategies for those things are going to be very important for the future. When, when we... I think, go ahead, go ahead, Jax, go ahead, Jax. Yeah, I was going to say, Eric, can you take a couple minutes and just di differentiate for everybody that's listening the, the difference between red team, the offensive side, yeah. then you've got blue team, the, the defensive side, and then you've got purple. What does that all mean? Like, it can be a little confusing, I feel like, at some times, especially now we've got purple. Well, and I added green team because I love my GRC <laughs> folks as well. So I call you them and, the green you and team. You and, you, and Gerald, uh, you and Gerald love to bring in that, that GRC aspect of it, don't you? <laughs> well, it's important. I mean, that's Critical. where we track all these things. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah. So, Jack, so as we mentioned earlier in the blue team, your defenders. Those are the people that put all the walls, that close all the doors, close all the windows, and make sure that things are running and be able to monitor the stuff that's happening. The red team are the ones that are testing all these all these things. So people think that they're, you know, the hackers. Well, guess what? They're a test team. They test the, the, the strength of all the controls that we put in in the blue or the sick SecOps team and the purple team in the middle is the communication stream of validating continuous supporting of the communication between what the red team is doing, what the blue team is doing, and and what are controls and uh, and support that we need to do. So it's very important that we follow that process so that we're all in the know. 
And, and, he, and, and again, we've, we talked a little bit about this earlier with Chris in, in terms of the, the, the value of purple teaming. Um, it's, it's actually, um, we, we had, a, we had a, uh, the chief commercial officer from Attack IQ on the stream a couple months ago, and they talked about this idea of a threat and form defense. And I've actually really started to use this term more and more. Um, and it's really, and, and Jax, you're, you're familiar with this because we did this in the military, right, where we took a, a threat-centric approach to how we look at our, our defensive capabilities, right? And it doesn't cost you anything. That's not a tool that you can you have to buy. It's not a, a, a special person that has a special set of skills out there. It's really just a mindset in terms of how you look at your organization. And, and I think that that's, I think when we talk about the value of blue teamers understanding red team concepts or red teamers understanding blue team concepts, we're really starting to see that blend of skill sets between red teamers and blue teamers. Um, we hear purple teaming more and more. I don't think that that's, I don't think that that's a buzzword anymore, I think we really are truly starting to see a predominance of a need to have both skills. Um, I know I had an incident responder who worked on my team for one of the Fortune 100 companies that I worked at, who um, he spent just as much time sharpening his red team skills as he did threat hunting and doing incident response work, you know, for that very reason of the information that he was able to gather from that. And so I think that I would almost argue that, that you know, in this day and age, if you're not taking a threat centric approach to your offense mm -hmm. or your defense, and you're not actively participating in both red team and blue teaming activities simultaneously, you're probably failing in your career. I don't know if anybody mm. wants to chime in on that one. I, I know it's a bold statement, but I know I, I, I think that yes, I agree with you. I want to add to it. And I want to say that something that we're having to step away from in the cybersecurity community, and we're being forced to because our the the cybersecurity that we're utilizing to protect our networks, are, it's just not working. We can see it by the rise of ransomware and the other attacks that we're seeing. And a lot of that is because of siloed approaches or doing one yeah. or two things and keeping things separate instead of taking a holistic view. And when you're using the red, the blue and the purple, you're taking a more holistic view. And to pivot from that on some things that you said and go into the GRC space, one of the things that's really getting pushed right now is cyber resilience or e, um, enterprise risk management, ERM. That is starting to take instead of just a technology view of either with cyber resilience, either just completely blocking the adversary and just hoping it's never going to happen. Cyber resilience takes the approach that it's likely going to happen. So let's recreate redundancies in our system that will allow us to withstand it, move through it and, and go forward. And then with ERM, enterprise risk management, we're also seeing we're moving away from just looking at the technical IT uh, functions and controls and looking at the entire enterprise, because we've got to do more than defense in depth. We've got to do more than just having everything siloed. Otherwise, we're just going to keep going down the path that we're in right now, which is cyber warfare is going to keep rising and we're going to start seeing more and more organizations being impacted by it. I, I think that's a very about Go ahead, go ahead, Eric. <laughs> No, I He's like, I can't. I'm I'm <laughs> yes. Hey, hey, Jax, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift you off screen really quick, and I'm gonna try to bring in Pete because I think we've got an injection here from the white cell that uh, that we want to bring in. Yeah, Pete, can you hear us? Oh nope, you're on mute. Ah, oh, oh, there we go. Added another one. Another one bites the dust on the mute. <laughs> I'm counting. Um, you're counting. Keeping yeah, you're, you're keeping it counted. While, while we wait for while we wait for Eric to come back, I think uh, I, there was a, there was an injection that he had from the the white cell. Does that does that mean you're back now, Pete? I'm hoping so. Yes, we have oh, audio. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> um, so you know, one of the things that I think is really interesting is uh, you know we've been watching Team Zeta compromise that voting registration server, and uh, one of the things that's really interesting is we know they have a technique that's going to get them admin level access on that box but we haven't seen them pivot from that machine into other networks and knock over more flags in more castles and you know eric you were talking earlier on uh, about the difficulty coordinating your team so that even if here we have an example where a team has the knowledge and the skill capable of knocking over a box and then it's a matter of bringing everything together and making sure that um that they can plant those flags in other castles. And then we get into a really interesting part, which is there's nothing stopping the um, the defensive team from just uh, changing that flag back if they compromise it, right? So now we get into what I call the whack-a-mole part of the game, which is the capture 
and hold. And um, there are a lot of different approaches. Um, I think you could imagine some of them. Do you do you deploy a script on the system that that uh, you know periodically changes it back? Do you um, you know there are a number of different things you could do. Do you try and find a script that you look who has the handles to that? Um, and then that's where we get into what Jax was talking about with some of the more the IR response. Um, are the actions of identifying what is on your system doing what and manipulating your environment and in what ways is it being manipulated and so that's the continuous vulnerability management on their systems is being able to verify and validate that they don't have and what i said earlier too is if you don't have a good detection algorithm in there you're not going to find maybe they don't know that they've been compromised so so, well, I so, suspect they do now. <laughs> well, well, if it, if it depends on depends on how the team's OSINT's going, right? <laughs> um, so, so I want to I want to double back on something you said. So the teams are able to change the flags to try to throw off the attackers as their as part of their defensive strategy. Sure, why not? Okay, can 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 you explain? You know. In terms of doing that, why, when you talked about, um, you know, you know, the, the rules decisions, what was kind of your thought process when you were deciding that that was an okay rule to put in there? So there were um, there are three basic things that we were looking at. One is probably the most important. We want this to feel real. Um, so that's why we don't have the challenges. There've been I've seen some questions in chat. You know, why don't I know what it is I've done in terms of detections to score me points? And the reality is because. What you're supposed to do is you don't know that there's a scoreboard in real life. You don't really know um, if you've completely eradicated an intrusion. Your job is to look um, and and like like Eric just alluded to that continuous process of vulnerability management and defensive cyber operations. So um, they're right. There is no hint, no scoreboard. The only hints we get are in terms of those tips and threat intelligence that we then operationalize, deploy detections. When we identify something using one of those detections, we deploy mitigations. We, we go into that DFIR, um, and cycle. And then, you know, it's like that continuous virtuous cycle of, um, you know, almost like a CI CD pipeline, right? It's that virtuous cycle of detect, eliminate, refine, update, et cetera. And, um, and so that's, that's what we're trying to give them the reality for. So in terms of why can they change their flags? Why not? Um, you know, if I, if I kick in the front door on a castle and plant a flag and say, this is my flag, I don't expect them to just be like, oh, well, <laughs> all right, fine, then well played. No, you know, you should be allowed to take that back. And uh, so for that reason, we, we kind of intentionally didn't give people simple console access to the um, uh, simple console access to some of those machines that are potentially vulnerable. Um, and at the same time, they can, uh, if they want to deploy patches, they might have to use firewall, uh, excuse me, a PowerShell to deploy a hotfix out rather than uh, being able to just console directly into the box and make a change, something like that. Uh, again, well, trying to give them the fire away. So going back to the change management thing. So if you're in the heat of battle, in most organizations, we have an emergency change request where we can say we're doing something ver and then do the paperwork a little bit later. How are we attacking that here where they see that they've planted a flag? We need to make a change. We need to put some other defensive mechanism because they're in the heat of battle. So we're, it's a great question, and we're handling it in a manner that I think is similar to what a lot of organizations do. For instance, um, we push, um, we'll push, we'll allow them push firewall rules. Um, so what we're doing is we're we're using Liberator to automatically evaluate the firewall rules, and if certain criteria are met, they're getting points immediately. Some of those other rules may be more sophisticated, and that's where some of the white cell comes in. Um, and then. Um, when it comes to significant host-based changes, that's where we want a push to say, hey, I want to make this change. Are you okay with that? Um, and they've been really, the team's been really great about communicating with us on that. So, um, so the answer to your question is kind of a multi-tiered approach like a lot of organizations do. You want to push a firewall rule because I see something janky right now and gee, I'm sorry, Phil, but your workstation's about to have a bad day <laughs> because we need to take care of that. It's better to impact Phil for a short period of time 
And in the in the case of the game, it's better to potentially take one flag's points worth of being docked for uptime or service for a short period of time, draw that yellow card, if you will, but not give up uh, not give up the greater score. So that's that's the approach. We're trying to keep it as realistic as possible. I understand that the it's a little bit different. The gamification is not as heavy handed as maybe people have seen in other environments. Um, we're trying to keep this more like a real red team, um, purple team, blue team engagement um, real, for for the for the benefit of reality. Real, real quick, real quick, because I want to I want to I want to pivot to something really quick. So we saw the U.S. team take a huge jump on that intel detection. Um, I want to be able to show the 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 um, uh, the network impact map um, uh, from from Sim Space. Is now a good time to do that, Pete? Can we go ahead and show that? Can we talk about? Um, uh, the, the U.S. jump it up in those points, or do you want to wait a little while longer on that one? Let's let's give you, the other teams have only had an hour right now. Okay. Um, I know we're coming right up on a break, so why don't we give them a little more time? We'll loop back on that impact map. We can talk about some of the miter techniques which are present okay. um, and, and how those detections might go. All right, that sounds good. Um, with that being said, then, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you back over to, to, to do your thing. Um, Eric, um, what a, what a morning, what a morning already. I, um, I, I can't even begin to, to, to talk about how exciting it was this morning. We've had an amazing participation in chat. We've given away some stuff already real quick. If you're listening to me, I want to remind, I want to tell everybody that we are going to do another giveaway for some blue team, uh, blue team lab stuff that's happening here during this commercial break. And so if you're listening to me over on LinkedIn, you will need to be in um, uh, in the YouTube chat and in the Discord to participate from that. But we are going to be giving away some blue team vouchers. So I want to thank Security Blue Team for that. I know we gave away some cases of Root already this morning. We've got obviously some more giveaways to happen uh, from our sponsors um, as well. Um, Eric, you're done for the morning. Uh, for the most part, we're going to bring in Chris Roberts, uh, this, you know, here for this afternoon section, um, uh, here after this commercial break, what are kind of some of your takeaways from this morning? Oh, uh, this has been incredible so far. Our teams are really hammering those boxes and the defenders have been doing a wonderful job. As a matter of fact, they're the stars of the show right now with the U S team hitting that doubling their stuff, their, their points at, you know, because of defense, because of the, what they're doing. So it's been an amazing stream. I am so proud of all these competitors from all over the world. I want to thank you, Neil, Play Cyber, Jess, and all the sponsors and participants. They have been amazing and you guys keep on rocking. I'm going to be here if need be and just keep on rocking it. You guys as, are doing it. As we send you off, as we send you off, we'll take one final look at the scoreboard before um, uh, before we head to the second commercial break here. Make sure that you are in Discord. Make sure you are in YouTube chat if you would like to participate in these Blue Team Labs online giveaway. We still have USA in first place by a huge Where's amount. Kappa? Where's Kappa? Uh, where's Kappa at? Uh, let's see where Kappa's where's at. Kappa? Kappa, Kappa is seventh place. <laughs> seventh place. So that's my Latin Latin American team. So all right. So you guys rock it. Continue. Keep, Remember, keep rocking. Proud, proud Hispanic and cybersecurity. <laughs> Eric, um, I'll see you on the other side. We're going to go to commercial break, um, and we will see everybody back here in a few minutes. Hello and welcome to this Cyber Snacks episode. My name is Andrew Costis or AC and I work at Attack IQ out of the UK as a senior cyber threat consultant. It was actually pretty tricky to narrow down the choice of free attacks of this year as there's just been so many to choose from. So I'll also caveat by saying that the free I've chosen is subjective and just my opinion, but if after watching this episode, you have a different take on your own free, then I'd love to hear them in the comment section. So I've chosen the Kaseya VSA attack that happened back in July. Kaseya's VSA is a remote monitoring and management solution used by thousands of companies globally. 
Kaseya announced on July 2nd that they were experiencing the cyber attack, but things quickly escalated to the point where both their on-prem and SaaS customers were shut down as a precautionary measure, while the instant responders worked tirelessly to get a handle on the situation. The attack involved a zero-day exploit that targeted the VSA software, which essentially allowed the attackers to gain initial entry. And because antivirus exclusions were configured within the software, it allowed an update package to be sent down contained in the malicious software, which turned out to then drop the Revil ransomware payload, which was later linked to the Russian cyber criminals. During the investigation, Kaseya did a great job communicating their findings to their customer base and the public, and they're also able to release a compromise detection tool to analyze a system run in the VSA and to help determine if any indicators of compromise were present. The Revil ransomware group claimed to have infected more than a million computers and demanded $70 million in Bitcoin to decrypt all of their infected machines. So next up, I've chosen the Islands Health Service Executive or HSE attack, who were hit with Russian-linked Conti ransomware mid-May of this year. They were asked to pay a ransom of $20 million. Now, Islands Health Service took precautionary measures as well by shutting down all of their IT systems in order to fully assess the situation with the help of their security partners. The attackers claimed to have infiltrated the network for more than two weeks before the discovery was made. And not only did they encrypt files, but also downloaded more than 700 gigabytes of data, which included patient records, employee records, financial records, and so on. In another rather interesting twist, a disgruntled threat actor or possibly an affiliate linked with the Conti ransomware operators leaked the Conti playbook a few months later during the summertime. This was essentially a playbook or archive containing the various TTPs and CVEs used by the Conti threat actor, making it an interesting and also an essential read for red and blue teamers. And last but not least, I've chosen the Colonial Pipeline ransomware carried out by the Darkside ransomware group earlier this year. The severity and disruption caused by this attack was so severe, the CEO authorized a four and a half million dollar ransom payment as a way to restart the pipeline's production as quickly as possible. A few months later, during a hearing committee, it was stated that the attack was made possible due to a legacy VPN system. The operators of the dark side ransomware as a service announced that they would cease operations entirely and would issue decryptors to all of their affiliates. Their blog, ransom website and crypto wallets have allegedly since been seized. My name is Mary Galloway, CEO and a founding board member of the Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu. Hi, I'm Ari Hernandez. I'm a senior security engineer for Google. I am also a CTF player for the Plaid Parliament of Pawning. Namaste, my name is Riddhi. I am a cyber security analyst consultant. I have spent my time with the free time with online communities. Ke saath kaam karke spend karti. Hi everyone, my name is Shamin Tan and I'm the Chief Growth Officer at Securo. Hi, my name is Mansi Thakrache and I'm a cyber games enthusiast. I'm Jessica Gulick, founder and CEO of Cat's Eye Play Cyber. Naniniwala ako na nakakatulong sa matagumpay na career ng mga babae ang paglalaro ng cybersecurity games. Bakit? Dahil uh, natututo kang mag outside of the box, tsaka marami ka rin natututunan sa sarili mo uh, at sa mga topics na challenges kahit hindi mo makuha yung sagot. Games provide a fun and collaborative way to learn new skills, own competencies, and meet new people. Up, not only do you get technical things, but you also get a lot of creative space. Cyber games are a great opportunity and a great way for folks that are new or interested in learning about cybersecurity to get involved and have a little fun. For cyber gamification, this is the direction. 我觉得这会帮助更多人，包括女性，对网络安全这个课题感兴趣。
આ સાયબર ગેમ્સ રમીને તમારું પર્સનલ તમે શીખી શકો છો ટીમ કલાબરેશન સેલ્ફ એસ્ટીમ સેલ્ફ કોન્ફિડન્સ અને પ્રોફેશનલ આપણા સાયબર સિક્યોરિટી યા ઇન્ફોર્મેશન સિક્યોરિટીના ઇન્ડસ્ટ્રીમાં કેવી રીતે આગળ વધે We've got a 24-hour format, some in English, some in native languages, of speakers and games to allow women across the globe during their daylight time to come together to celebrate Women's Month and help women discover a career in cybersecurity. Super excited ako maglaro kasama ng mga kapong babae na interesado sa cybersecurity at galing sa bawat sulok ng mundo. Sana magkita-kita tayo doon and gusto ko kayo makilala. Dunia kay alag-alag puno sa mahilaya aga agad kuch technical or creative karne ki kusus kar rahi hai. Vinja community ki taraf se hum CTF organize kar rahe hai wicket 6 event ke liye. Jima beginners all the little advanced games hase. Tame chokkas attend kar jo tamne boj bajao se. Sana hanka ખાતા Welcome back everybody. Hopefully everybody got a good break in. We're coming into uh, uh you know uh the the second half of uh, of the stream, second half of the US Cyber Games. I'm going to introduce my uh my co-host and and uh and partner in crime for the second half uh here in a little bit. I want to remind everybody that we we're we're kind of halfway through uh through this morning's events. This is the US Cyber Games uh, uh put together by Play Cyber powered by Cat's Eye. Um I want to thank them for uh for for putting this together, doing an awesome event. Um uh make sure you utilize those bot commands uh that are that are showing up uh in inside of uh inside of uh, of uh, YouTube chat and and checking them out as well as uh um all the sponsors and all the folks who uh have come together to make this an awesome awesome fantastic event i want to remind everybody of the rules we are halfway through just in case we picked up some team or picked up some people uh through the stream um remember we do have a, a ton of uh interaction that is happening both on chat we are streaming live to linkedin uh, uh youtube as well as uh twitter uh do make sure that you uh if you do see uh if you are on twitter um you do uh see something you do want to comment or something shown up on screen make sure you use the hashtag #playcyber um and we will grab it and throw it up on screen if you do have questions make sure you do drop them into chat and we will do our best to try to address them. Uh we are attempting to uh to do a new style of um of a broadcasting with this um where we are looking over the player's shoulders. We do have access via um uh the 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 uh the the platform sponsor SimSpace in this where we can look over um uh the red team and the blue team's uh type of uh of screen and continue to provide them uh provide you with that action as well as commentary. So with that being said, we got th- we had the morning uh, uh side of of experts uh that were here uh uh commentating with me. I am excited more than excited to have my afternoon co-host and side-by-side fellow bald guy, the one and only <laughs> infamous hacker, <laughs> Mr. Chris Roberts. How the hell are you doing this this afternoon, sir? Good. How's everything going? Good. Good. I don't know if you've been able to uh to to catch up, <laughs> but um it has been an intense and intense morning. so far we've had uh we've had a good mix of offense we've had a good mix of defense we had chris butera on from sisa as we talked about uh sisa's mission um blue teaming red teaming and things like that and obviously we've been looking over a lot of attacker shoulders good it's nice i'm actually just catching up i've got the other screen is running the uh the live stream up on youtube nice so uh i figured i'd uh, stick my head into that at the same time as watching up on this one Yeah, yeah. Let's um uh, wh- while we're yeah. while we're here, let's jump back into um let's jump back into the uh the scoreboard. See where uh, everything is. Oh, see where everything is. Movement. Yeah, yeah. So um so Alpha is uh is US, Zeta is uh is Canada. Um I've got my little cheat card uh up over here. <laughs> um yeah. Uh uh let's see here. Omega it, yeah, US and Canada are 1 and 2. Oceana Oceana um which is currently being represented by Australia is third delta and this is what we talked about before we went on break chris was delta is north africa 
Now, North Africa Ooh, was nice. a no was a no show this morning. Remember? Yeah, they uh, they couldn't get enough players to participate, but the teams oh, were allowed wow. to pre-stage some of their defensive actions during the practice last week. And so the fact that Delta is a team with no current defenders and no current uh, offensive threat actors is actually in fourth place, tied for fourth place, based on the defensive activities that they were to put in weeks ago. Side of the world, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's, I think that's it's actually kind of cool. It's it's nice because it shows. I mean, I was listening in on a conversation earlier on when you guys were talking that uh, the USA folks have gone well because of defense. It's I love the fact that defense is coming into this in a much more prominent way. I mean, everybody kind of wants to go into red teaming and wear a cape and red spandex and jump over to all freaking <laughs> buildings. But I love the damn fact that the blue team's there beating the living snut out of them. So it's a nice thing to put it from the hacker. Blue team beat the crap out of them. I mean, it's nice. <laughs> But I mean, I think that I, you know, you echo a lot of my sentiments, right? We, you know, we spent yeah. tons of time doing offensive cyber in our careers. Um, it, we we love doing it. It's what we grew up doing. We both acknowledge blue team is where it's at. Blue team is what's winning is what's winning wars these days. It should be, and that's how. And on, that's really to me, that's how it should be. It's uh, I, I, there's too many people coming into this industry that want to go break stuff, and I'm like, congratulations. There's like 35 billion things out there you can break. Do me a favor, fix the darn stuff for us, please, <laughs> everybody. I think. But I, what 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 are some of the things that you've seen over your career that um, that that should have been fixed years ago that that <sighs> continues to infuriate you today that isn't fixed? Oh, I don't know. Let's see. If you go out to nice, if you go out to Showdown, and the fact that we've got RDP Remote Desktop Protocol is still sitting out on the internet going hello hello look at me look at me so i mean that would be one let's start with the easy stuff so that would be one second one is obviously i'm relatively infamous for anything with wings wheels tracks tires fins <laughs> and, and anything that moves let's face it it's fair game well you go out to like the vsat systems so these are the systems that look after all the ships and without getting into any political stuff there's a couple of ships that have been how do we say impounded maybe over the last few weeks <laughs> And so we've been using the VSAT systems to capture them, figure out how to get into them, and, and either slow them down, stop them, or at least tell the authorities where the darn things are. So, I mean, VSAT 9000's got more and more and more easy, simple ways into the darn thing. As somebody said, SQL, the fact that the OWASP top 10, you can literally recite it from heart because it hasn't changed a huge amount over the last, what, 10, 15 years? God. I mean, how many years ago? Do you, I mean... You're as old as I am. Well, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in the I, second I, half I'm of the not, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not ready to acknowledge it. Like, let, I think that that may be the difference. <laughs> <laughs> Do you? I mean, I remember. I think it was like DefCon, DefCon ten, DefCon eleven. Yeah. When we were doing, but when we when because we had SQL injection for yep. I mean maybe a year or two, and then we came up with this blind SQL yeah. injection which was amazing. And I mean, I remember sitting in on the talk for blind SQL injection. That's 18, 19 years ago. Yeah. And we can still break your PHP, my admin. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you're over here you talking you about, you're over here talking about SQL injection and, and, and 19 and 20, 20 year old vulnerabilities. And yet we still have, we still have PHP, my admin all over the place, you know, you know, take things. And so we're, we're looking at Canada red team right now. Um, you know, they're, they're continuing to actively exploit that, that web server, but you know, you're, you're right. I mean, it's it, one of the things I think of, I've always been frustrated with is, is, um, you know, you see these. You'll see these folks comment like, "Why am I learning about Windows XP? Why am I learning how to run MS 0867 Why am I running? You know, why am I learning SQL injection? I want to learn zero day exploits. I want to do ROP chain exploits. I want to do use after free exploits. Teach me all this stuff." And it's like, do you realize that like seventy to eighty to ninety percent of the world still runs on stuff that's twenty years old? Ninety, ninety. I mean. You've only got to go. I mean, yeah, again, Showdown is, you know, shout out to the folks that. that real quick, real quick. So of Speaking of SQL injection, yeah. that's what we are seeing right now on the screen that that's just what popped we're seeing through. now, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So as, as you're watching chat. Connect from yeah. so, 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 Come on, you can do this. You can do this. It's right. terrible. I, I, I've done a number of these over the years. And I'm somewhere there's a, there's a black badge or two floating around up there somewhere. <laughs> um,. And I'm so fortunate that, that I think years ago when we were doing this stuff, yeah, that's... <laughs> oh, no. don't don't laugh too hard, Adam. They are o us. 
<laughs> yeah, bless him. I, hey, I, I'm I'm happy about that one. How about yeah. it? It's it, I'm fair game. Let's face it. These yeah. day and age. Yeah. I um, um. I did you? So I hang on. So I'm looking over. I'm talking about. I mean, you got a bunch of the Aussies floating around over here. Did, is there a separate team from New Zealand, or are they all no. under uh, Pacific? There, the, Oceania. The only flag that we got represent Oceania uh, is uh, is currently. The Aussies. The Australia. Well, then where the hell are the Kiwis for crying out loud? <laughs> I guess you better call somebody up and figure out like where the where the no Kiwis shit. are. Then. Hang on, little <laughs> <laughs> buddies, get your ass out of bed. Actually, what are we on? Like twelve? No, it is probably to get your ass out of bedtime, isn't it? <laughs> oh, no, no. This is uh, uh, the only the only folks we've got representing uh, are the uh, are the folks from Australia. But but oh, um, well, that's we can deal with that. I mean, you, okay. So actually, that's a really good point because I mean. Uh, you got the Five Eyes stuff, so you yep. get all the typical stuff on that one. But I love explain what, explain what Five Eyes is for for chat who may not necessarily be aware of that. Good point. Yeah, so there's a there's a collaboration. Best way of putting it is there's a spy collaboration, and and it comes about because intelligence sharing. So we all know intelligence is useful across you know across the world for good or for bad reasons. We're seeing huge amounts of it now between the conflicts that are going on. And over the years, there's been collaborative handshake efforts between like the United Kingdom, the United States, New Zealand, and various other countries. So you've got this whole five, eight, five, we call it five eyes collaboration between like the core five countries. Then you have an extension of that where we get the, the crazy folks from over in Israel over and we get some other folks in there and we start, it's just sharing of intelligence, information and collaboration and efforts. And part of the reason is, is that where you don't step on everybody's toes. So if you're doing surveillance efforts, if you're looking at the darker side of the net, or if you're investigating criminal activities, one person isn't stepping on another person's investigation. So it's the whole concept on it is collaborate. Is, touch wood, should be collaboration. Should be collaboration, absolutely. I wish we were better at it, not even just inside the agency stuff, but I wish as, I wish, I wish we would retain almost that innocence that we have as, as we start out our careers Yeah. Um, to collaborate. This is what I love about doing the cyber games. I mean, this, this is fantastic because the friendships that are forged here between people and between countries last forever. I mean, I, I'm still good friends with a bunch of folks that I know from early days, like early days in this industry. There are still folks I'll go to bat for from those days. And I think this kind of stuff is crazy important for that next generation of, um, of persons coming in to defend and run offense on all sorts of organizations. Well, and I think when you talk about the five eyes, what we're seeing here where, um, you know, you've, you, we may be, you know, you know, attacking each other in a castle versus castle type fashion, but ultimately it's a, it's a joint endeavor from, from nine different teams from all across the globe who some are in that five eyes, but some would love to be in that five eyes and some would love to collaborate with us and, and do a collective, uh, you know, you know, cyber engagement, um, you know, with everybody over, over the years. And so I think it continues to just build those strong ties between countries and nations who are interested yeah. in, in doing that. And so just to, just real quick, as we look at what Canada is doing uh, here on screen, it looks like they're still trying to uh, get that, or they, at one point in time, they were trying to get that SQL injection to work <laughs> so they could, uh, they could get that back door onto that box. Hang on a sec. Team Kiwi is currently being staffed by our cousins in the West Islands. Uh, yeah, that West Island is. I love that one. Well done, Brian. That, that, that's freaking <laughs> awesome. It's that, uh, is, that, is, that, is, that, is that Brian? Is that Brian Godfrey in chat talking about yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love that question. Um, Don't read chat. Let me let me let me put it up on let me put it up on screen. Don't read chat, Chris. I got to focus. 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 Oh no! I, are you kidding me? This is. I'm like. I'm one cup of tea in. It's still too early in the morning. In theory, I'm gonna. You have got major squirrel going on over here. I'm having fun. This is like. This is all kind of. You're talking about the yeah. question from Fasochi Actual. Fasochi Actual just talked to. Just uh, dropped a question yeah. in chat. Chris, if you had to do it over again, what would you do differently? <sighs> I wouldn't make quite so many mistakes. Um, I, and I think from, and as terrible as it sounds, there's a few inside the industry, I, I wouldn't have made the same mistakes. But I think even outside of this industry, I would have questioned more. You know, it's I, it's something I learned a couple, unfortunately, or fortunately, a couple of times, um, <laughs> like even working for companies at the moment, I'm going through this whole job hunting thing. And I'm, I'm being an ass, not in a nasty way, but I'm asking more and more and more questions than probably I've ever done before. Because, you know, when you first get into the industry, you're like, oh, I, I'm, I've got a job and I'm happy. And you suddenly go, whoa, what, what the hell just happened? Whereas when you get a little bit more 
you know, a few bumps and a few bruises, all of a sudden you're like, nah, I probably need to ask a few more questions. Um, you know, one of the proudest things is unfortunately also one of the things that ended badly, which was One World Labs. You know, I we started OWL in 2009, and unfortunately we took money, and we took money from people that didn't have the same level of, how should we say, adventurousness as, mm. as those of us in the industry. And so when all the when all the stuff blew up with the aviation stuff, that should have been a hey, this should have been a warning sign. Um, unfortunately, it turned the wrong way, which which was an absolute mess. But um, I think the and, other thing is funny. We talk about Kiwis. Yeah. So I'm in the U.S. because I was actually meant to be deployed out to out to New Zealand, but because of some stuff that we did against the U.S. military and some of the naval toys that they had floating around the place, they end up sending me over here. So that was '98. So yeah, all good fun. So so oh, real quick, good. as people who are watching, what, still watching uh, the the Canadians here, um, I'm getting word from the White Cell that it, it appears that the Canadians are realizing that they can use uh, one particular exploit that they've gotten that they've used to get on this one box. It looks like they're trying to use that same exploit across other castles um, a, across the environment right now, and so they are they're perpetuating nice. their they you know they've stopped trying to pivot in one target chris and now it looks like they're trying I'm to just, get a yeah they're trying to get a little bit wider breath and trying to capture out on those points go for it well i mean think about it i mean that's what we do in the industry you know if i capture your credit i mean this is i've got the spreadsheet i'll, I'll put the spreadsheet up on chat um <laughs> well, confuse everybody we, we, if i take your credentials <laughs> let's say let's say you lose your credentials on a media a social media site and they, they end up being part of a breach. I'll take your user ID and your email address and your credentials. And we, I've, got a, I've got a program and it just runs it across about 150 mm -hmm. other websites. You know, and that's banking, financial, investment stuff, all of, the, all of the social media sites and a whole bunch of other stuff, just shopping sites and everything. And it's crazy how much password reuse, how many credential reuse and all this kind of stuff that we have on this one just in the real world. So yeah, if I, I mean, you take one set of creds and you try them everywhere and you'd be amazed at how often they get used. Well, not just, reuse. not just that, that, and, and just for fo folks who are listening, right. We, we oftentimes refer to that as a password spray attack or, or some variation of that, where we can take those passwords, we could use them across multiple, multiple accounts, multiple, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, pieces of infrastructure and things like that. But I also think that that same tactic, that same methodology, you can also apply that to exploits too. If you've got one exploit oh. that works on one box, and you can use yes. that exploit across multiple boxes that that you know are vulnerable. We see that we saw that with WannaCry. We see the all the ransomware gangs use that in their um, uh, you know their their day one uh, type of vulnerabilities and things like that. But people have used you know that, that people haven't patched in day one. Oh, well, it's not even. I mean, I hate to say it again. Back to your earlier point. I don't. I'm. So I still build exploits. I still will sit down and get down and dirty into the weeds, and I'll still build exploits. And I'll still do nasty things on, on a computer system that, that make it curl up in a corner. But I'm not going to waste an exploit on a system because I don't want it out in the wild sometimes. I'm going to go after easy stuff. Uh, because the, the, it's, it's, you know, why, why should I burn something when you maybe haven't patched? Or, you know, you haven't put separation and segmentation in place. I mean, so many organizations, you can't patch everything immediately. It just It's not only is it impractical, it's likely to break things. So this is why we talk about network separation and segmentation. And when you don't get that, and it's a flat ass network, and I can see the Windows 7 machine and the Windows 8 machine in the corner, that's where I'm going to focus, because I don't have to burn a brand new exploit. I can use the 25 other ones that are public knowledge and get in that way. I, I, think, that that's, I, I think that that's also key, because I, I, I've mentioned this on my stream before too, right? At, when I was at the agency, they were sitting on 12 zero days at the time that, that they, that they mm -hmm. had at their disposal. And they would be adamant that you needed like the, the level of the level of the level of the level of approval just to use said exploit on any type of operation. Like it had to be, you know, Osama bin Laden at the time, you know, type of thing to use that type of zero yeah. day um, because there was, you know, why would you use that when you've got so much other low hanging fruit that you can do out there in the wild? Why? That and it's the other challenge as well. Like you talk about interagency stuff. I mean, it's, I remember sitting down. Uh, in the U.S., we had that incident where uh, the FBI got hold of a cell phone, and you know we were we've been sitting on we're still sitting on some stuff with Apple and various other things, and then like 
I, I don't need it getting, I don't need that exploit to be publicly available. If I hand it to, unfortunately, the federal authorities that are responsible for prosecuting people, that's now out in the wild. Yeah. I can't reuse that for the safety of others. I've, I have to wave that one goodbye. And sometimes that stuff's freaking expensive. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's it's so yeah, totally with you. So so how are you? How how do you feel about the argument? Then I'm um, just so folks who are watching. Um, what 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 Canada? I think we're still on Canada here. Red three is doing is attempting to netcat using netcat as a connection type of protocol, similar to like Telnet. Um, you know, some other type of, uh, of, of point to point connection protocol to basically tell net into port 25, which is the SMTP server on this particular SMTP server. SMTP so, stuff, yeah. Yeah. Um, where do you stand on this whole conversation on, um, you know, we should restrict people's ability to uh, publish open source attack tools and, and give those attack tools out to, uh, to the wild? I. I <laughs> I don't, I, I, it's a tough one because it I'm is. weaponizing, you're handing weapons to people. So, I mean, perfect example, again, we look at the current, we look at the current situation, unfortunately, it's going all over, you know, in Eastern Europe. On one hand, there's a bunch of us which are tunneling all over the place. But on the other hand, you've got some Muppets out there that do nothing more than just run Loic, which completely <laughs> messes us up. Low, low, orbit, I, low orbit ion cannon for those who are, who are not familiar with Basically, it. it is a denial of service. I mean, it beautifully made, love it, all this other kind of stuff. Um, it's just, yeah, so it's it's frustrating. How, why did that message get deleted? I was looking forward to that message. I squirreled. Where did you go? <laughs> don't, see, this is why I tell you don't squirrel. We got question. moderators in chat. Oh, <laughs> uh, you have? I'm. Oh yeah. gosh, I'm self moderating the moderator. Yeah, yeah, you're self moderating. Um, we got moderators in chat. Don't don't pay attention to okay, that stuff. Bless it. All right. Well, I'm I'm moderating between the two. Uh, I. So here's my thing. If you, mm, it's a tough one. So an exploit. I've always. Uh, you've got the responsible disclosure mentality. Yes. So that only goes so far. So another perfect example. I I come knocking on your door and go, Hey, you got a problem? And if you don't have a bug bounty program or you don't have a an internal program or an external one one by one of the good folks, <laughs> Chris Fraser, I got you. Sorry, squirrels, I'm having fun, I'm listening. You see, see, now um, now that then, chat knows that you're paying attention, they're gonna try to distract you now. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it on, this is gonna be fun. How far can the how far can I squirrel in what two hours? Yeah. But the, the, so it's uh, you know the responsible disclosure. I go knocking on your door, and typically one of three things happens. Either in the best case, you're like, holy smoke, thank you. In the middle case, you're like, sod off, I haven't got a problem, you close the door and you try and figure it out. And the worst case, which happens all too often, I got a, I got a drawer full of damn cease and desist letters. <laughs> is you get a, lawyer, a, a letter from a lawyer saying, thou shalt never speak of this and we shall prosecute you, blah, 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 blah. And it frustrates the hell out of me because it's you, you're just doing it for the right reason. So I love the fact that the bug bounty programs now exist because it's a conduit where I get less lawyer letters, to be honest. I love the fact that like DHS and CISA are stepping up way more so into the breach to help out. Um, someone get Chris a biscuit. Hey, I got biscuits. <laughs> I have. So look, this, this is a chocolate digestive. I was actually having it with my cup of tea a minute ago and I finished my cup of tea and my dog was trying to eat it, but it's got chocolate <laughs> on it. So the dog doesn't get a chocolate biscuit. Anyway, squirrels. Um, no, I, to me, it's like develop a way. Yeah. The more people in our industry and around our industry uh, learn the vulnerabilities and the issues, I think the better it is. Um, it, it's it holds everybody accountable. Now, there's there's some exceptions to that rule. I mean, if you find like a core tool that will just pwn everything, just a squirrel drink Isla. Hell yes, the damn squirrel drinks Isla. Yeah. What are the agencies doing wrong and right? Well, they're not commu Yeah, all right. I, I, yeah, sorry. This is fun. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> focus, focus on me. Focus on me, buddy. Focus on me, buddy. Right here. <laughs> uh oh, is the US still we need to nobble the US. We need to like we need to go. Can well, I go in there and have some fun and take the US's defenses down? For well, a here's the, here's the reason. The US is def the US is winning. Winning. I just had a white cell inject coming from coming into my ear. The U.S. is still winning because they're threat hunting. They're actively threat hunting across the environment and finding all nice. of these IOCs from a previous uh, from a previous inject, and they're putting oh, in yeah. firewall rules and submitting. We're looking here at the um, uh, the defender logs that they're doing here. You can see that that they've ever since that APT activity at 1008, they've had one, two, three, four um, um, uh, uh, firewall rules that they've put in place. Um, since they've been in there. So that has been really, really huge in, in their ability to, to kind of gain on those points. 
Yeah, no, we I see, love we see some bed. we see some Mimi Cats usage. We see some Mimi Cats removal. Another piece of malware. Some more suspicious files. So they're still finding they're still finding IOCs from that Intel uh, injection. PF Sense password. Oh come on, we know the PF Sense password. Google the darn thing. In fact, I can probably do it for you. <laughs> Yeah, come on, we can do this. It's PF Sense. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love PF Sense. I run PF Sense for goodness sakes, but you know, I also put a few other things in place. Come on, we can do this. You can. Yeah. Yeah. No, honestly, we need to. We should just tunnel in. Can I have some fun? Can I tunnel in and start? No, I don't. <laughs> no, 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 no. You can't do any of that. You can't do any of that. <laughs> but back to your point, like, and this is my stance on this, right? Is I think I think the developers need to continue to develop because, it, yeah. it, sure, it may help the adversary. You know what? Who else it helps? It helps the blue team. And this is why we were having the conversation with Eric and with Jax earlier, um, you know, and, 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 and you as well when you, first, when you first popped on the stream, the importance of blue teamers and understanding red team activity and red teamers understanding blue team activity. I think that that's, you know, it, it, it's starting to blur the line now. When you and I were coming up in this industry, it was very, very black and white. You were a hacker or you were everybody else, right? You were al yeah. always hacking or you were doing something IT related or something network defense related or something isn't responsible or anything like that. I think we're slowly seeing the dissolution of those bounds between that red and that blue side. I think we've, we're calling yeah. it purple team. And if we want to call it purple team, then whatever. I, I, I'm not here to, you know, argue industry taxonomy by the imagination. But if we see that middle ground grow bigger and we see the edges start to get tinier and tinier on either side, that's why I think the responsible disclosure and the ability for people to continue to produce open source toolkits, I think that's why that's important. I love it. Well, because I mean, again, I mean, you know, you know, I mean, you the same thing. I mean, I remember, I mean, remember pre ethereal pre Wireshark days. And I mean, I remember building my own modules for that darn stuff because it didn't exist. So it actually slowed you down. Nowadays, if I want to go and be strategic or I want to be clandestine, there's, a, there's typically something on GitHub that will allow me to do it. And I love the GitHub repositories. There are some freaking amazing, amazing repositories that people have put together that have like a whole bunch of defensive tools, a whole bunch of OSINT, open source intelligence tools, a whole bunch of red teaming tools. So what I love about it is the fact that there's so much collaboration. And if you want to learn and you want to understand and you want to realize what's going on, the data's out there and you can build safely this day and age, you can safely build your own environment and you can test the living snot out of it and learn so much easier that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we're gonna we're gonna bring in um, we're gonna bring in Pete here from uh, from SimSpace. Let's see if his audio is working on this time. I think so. <laughs> yes, yes, your audio yes. is working. We've been I've we've figured been out the with... up up down down left right left right BA select start to get it hey, working. These days. Uh, let's let's get a poll in chat and see if anybody recognizes that reference that uh, that that Pete just dropped in there. Pete, um, I understand we're we're ready now to kind of talk about this uh, this threat intel inject that they got and the impact map um, that we were going to talk about before we did that last commercial break. Do you want to kind of hit on that a little bit and talk about what we're seeing here? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we talked about doing things a little bit differently and that threat inject that you saw come up um, at, uh, what was that, 10 a.m. Eastern. Um, that was one of those things. So we have, in addition to the nine teams um, well, I guess since Delta is only doing the defensive side, nine and a, eight and a half teams that are participating, <laughs> um, we have um, we have a, a new player has entered the game, right? We have APT uh, ten or forty or both. Uh, we have threat intelligence that they've been involved, engaged in these environments for the last forty eight hours, and tasked them with trying to see if. Um, uh, see if, if, if there is indeed an intrusion from them. So it's a great opportunity to um, operationalize threat intelligence, deploy detections, and we've seen how that can impact the score in the game. Um, the other thing, oh, by the way, we've got our first uh, our first yellow card right now. Uh oh. Um, I know Eric's going to be disappointed, but Latin America is getting docked for firewall rules right now. So I'm just oh. going to throw that out there. They created oh. a firewall rule. That exceeds that, and you know maybe this is a strategic decision on their part to take some uh, take some hits as they are getting uh, as they're getting attacked right now, and and set up some more uh, customized defenses. Um, but uh, but so, so we have so we have a yellow card on the on the on the grounds for for Latin American teams for some illegal firewall rules. 
But yeah, so um, what we're seeing right here is the impact map. And, and so what you're seeing is there's an automated attack that's deployed out right now. And um, in, in the environment you're looking at, and uh, so what you're seeing is certain machines are being targeted automatically. And um, you can see the, uh, the sequence of events that took place. And I'd ask you not to expand that because I think that would get some pretty specific intel. <laughs> we, for, won't, we won't uh, expand that too much. Yeah. yeah. But the uh, but but the idea is if one were to expand that and maybe we want to take a step over to the miter attack map, we can actually break out the actual tactics and techniques that are being employed in the various attacks. Now you see there are two there. There's the beaconer as well. That was something that we demonstrated in the familiarization last Friday. Uh, we deployed a beaconer out. Um, actually, we deployed it out several days before, so there'd be lots of beacons, as you're well aware, when you have a 30 to 90 minute delay between beacons, uh, you probably don't want to, you'd probably don't have one or two of those in logs. So we gave it a good 48 hours running so they'd have enough beacons to have a chance catching that on the defensive side. So, um, so what we have here is as our automated inject engine deploys out each of the, the techniques, we keep track of the tactics, the columns, and the techniques, the rows that are being employed using MITRE. And this helps us provide a, um, a more specific representation of the skills and abilities and the tasks that are being uh, carried out by the defensive team as they defend against these automated injects. So, so I, I, this is also something, Chris, like obviously we've seen MITRE come into the industry here pretty recently, and, and, and it's, it's played a massive, massive role in how we start to look at um, uh, you know, our defensive strategies, even our offensive strategies and things like that. Um, when we go back over to uh, if we if we were to go back over to the the, the network map though and uh, look at the attacks, um, that beaconer traffic that you um, let's see if I can remember there we go network impact, right? This one that we've got yeah absolutely you can turn on the visualization for the beaconer if you like, um, if you just mouse over where it says beaconer uh, uh, to the left, there you go and just click the eye. Oh, click the eye, gotcha. The, yeah, one more no. time. Oh, well, it's working swimmingly. Glad, oh, glad well. we could call that out. There we go. There we go. Um, a demo, so fa demo fail live on stream. Nothing, nothing, nothing fails on that that regard, does it? <laughs> I didn't make proper obeisance the to the live are, demo guys. The gods today. are presenting or watching us closely. That's right. <laughs> Ironically, it's probably my fault for tearing that attack down after demo on Friday. Uh, nevertheless, but it does actually. If you do expand that, you can see the step by step. Uh, progress as uh, as each aspect of it. So there's a phishing attachment, it executes a PS file, um, and then it ingresses a tool and it executes a command line. So the um, so point is, you can see the individual steps. Each of those can be broken out to give a more granular um, phase by phase uh, um, understanding of the artifacts and techniques that are being employed. So what we so so the, the 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 short answer for everybody who's listening to what what P just explained right is is that big, massive jump that we saw in US was because you all were basically running um, running malware on one of the hosts internally um, it had been beaconing out for probably about forty eight hours prior to the start of this start of the uh, start of the event and when you drop that threat intel inject that's when we kind of saw the uptake of, of, at least in the U.S. side, them trying to do the threat hunting against those IOCs to see if they could find indicators of that inside of their environment. And so what we're seeing here on the Beaconer is basically the steps that you went through or the, the steps that that malware went through to, to basically beacon uh, across the network. And so that's what's, been, uh, that's what's been such a huge, huge advantageous advantage that hopefully if anybody else is OSINTing the stream, they'll now see that and we should see some changes in scores. It looks like... Um, it looks like the the teams are uh, back over in Elastic, continuing to do some 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 threat hunting here. Chris, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, um, you know, you mentioned the you mentioned the five eyes, you mentioned the collaboration, the sharing of information, that threat intel piece of that that goes on. Now, obviously, we typically think of threat intel from a defensive perspective. How can threat intelligence help the uh, the the red teamers or the offensive guys if in, in terms of looking at at what it is they're going to do? Oh my gosh! I mean, it's it's the jigsaw puzzle. I think the best analogy for for threat hunting, either offense or defense, is the jigsaw puzzle. So, a perfect example: if I'm looking to attack you, I'm going to basically I'm going to build a profile on you, which means 
I'm going to see where I see you. Where on the internet are you talking? Where on the internet are you using your IP address? And you is you as a human or you as a company. And there's no real distinction. Where are you maybe posting code on like GitHub or JetBrain or any of the other places? Are you sitting on Amazon, AWS, Google, Oracle, Cloud, you know, any of the... In other words, I'm going to Showdown. Perfect example is Showdown. I'm going to use like Showdown, Multigo, Perturva, all of these tools to basically build a map of you. And as I'm doing that, I'm looking at attack vectors. I'm looking at maybe you use your work email on Craigslist to advertise something or to buy something. So now I can go, can I socially engineer you this way? I mean, what probably one of the most probably one of the most fun ones that we did, we actually ended up doing an RSA talk on, which is we looked at we found an engineer who loved to cook. He bought himself one of these gorgeous decor ovens that has a built-in Android. And so we got to know all about him and his oven and his Android, and we ended up basically profiling. We knew where he was. We knew what he used. We payloaded his oven to break into his work computer. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, that was and, and that was all open source intelligence gathering. And that was all basically he'd been talking about it on, on oven forums using his work email address. So, I mean, it was it, there's so many ways. And companies, companies... The one thing I don't like in our industry is if I sell you something, let's say I come in, I've got, hey, I've got a new firewall. I, then I go and crow about it on, on the internet and go, I just sold him a, a new firewall. As an attacker, I'm like, sweet, I know the firewall he's got, which means I can keep an eye on when it's going to get exploited, keep an eye on when it maybe should be patched. I know that. When you, are, when you are looking for new employees or you're looking for employment, there's that wonderful job description must have SQL and my Python <laughs> and my this and thank you. I know what the hell you're running in your environment. So all of this builds up a profile, which gives me attack vectors. And, and all of that, all of that is really still just intelligence. And so when we talk about these yeah. threat intelligence, we're not just talking about the benefit of intelligence on the on the defender side by any stretch of the imagination. Intelligence is incredibly value on the red team side uh, uh, as well. So. Oh, hugely so. Uh, so, and actually, this is um, Fasachi just asked an, a, an absolutely freaking awesome question. I do want to grab this before I scroll. Go for it. Go for it. Um, what did it he was ask? The, what is your <laughs> What is your opinion on all these fancy tools being sold in cyber, useful or useless? So, to me, it's a hybrid. There is so much on the open source community. Open source intelligence being the perfect example. You can go out onto the open net and the darker side of the net and the ISC channels and all this other stuff and gather a ton of information yourself. No two ways about it. You can scan everything, you can do all these other things. However, the usefulness of some of the tools, emphasis on the word some of them, is to consolidate that effort to make it quicker, faster, easier, and simpler. Perfect example would be, uh, let's use PFSense. Mm. You can grab PFSense, you can drop it on a perimeter, you can drop it on the inside of your network, and you can look at a lot of things. But you have to actively look at a lot of things. If you get some kind of orchestration tool, even though they're not perfect these days, the orchestration tool typically will take some time away. It gives time back to you because it's doing some of the work for you. It's helping bubble to the top relevant things you need to look at. So a lot of the commercial, a lot of the, some of the commercial stuff really is, is there to, to be a helping hand if it's built properly, if it's done properly. But there's also some crap out there. I mean, let's just be perfectly honest. And I think this is where we as in the industry, I mean, everybody that's here in this industry, everybody on Red Team, Blue Team, everybody, we owe it to every single customer that we want to help to help arm them with more questions. Yeah. So when the 10 vendors come storming through the door going, hey, I've got an endpoint security solution for you and it's got AI and magic freaking farting unicorns <laughs> and quantum entanglement rainbows that we arm our customers, our clients, and people to how to ask questions to get rid of eight of those vendors because yeah. it's all BS. So, um, so real quick before we move before we move on, it does look like they're they're still doing that threat hunt. Just for those who are watching the the screen, they were in Security Onion. They were trying to find all events where HTTP for web traffic, and then they were also trying to join that with uh, with a, a a module from Suricata um, uh, for network traffic <laughs> as well. So, um, Security Onion, if you've not checked it out, Security Onion is incredibly powerful. Um, it's it's easy to set up in a VM, and you can start using it right out of the box. Go ahead, Chris. Half, half the bloody military runs on Security oh, yeah. Onion. <laughs> He's not kidding. He is not kidding. I know. I mean, yeah. I'm not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I love it. I mean, it's it's a it's a it like any tool. 
to really get the best out of it, you got to get in there, just dig in, download it, run it, use it. But man, it'd be awesome. I am watching this whole, these conversations. Like Jess is, is freaking amazing. <laughs> I want to see his Jax, Chris, Neil, and Jeff. I mean, there's, <laughs> yeah how would i go about defending a company oh my gosh I mean, are we allowed to use tactical nuclear weapons at this point in time to help defend the company <laughs> i don't think we're there i think that, you want to talk about hackback we can have a conversation about hackback really quick yeah, yeah yeah let's talk let's talk about I hackback mean, let's you want to start with you want to start with grandma's nvidia computer oh my gosh grandma's computer in north korea is so gonna get nuked <laughs> 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 um, so, so right now it looks like uh, we, we are able to catch uh, Red 2. Um, I'm not sure which country this is right now. So this is the American team uh, right here on Red 2. Yep. Looks like they're trying to exploit a... Uh, looks like they're trying to use uh, an open SMTPD uh, exploit out of Metasploit to hit that uh, that mail server. Oh, come on. Stop using Metasploit. Get old school. Oh, uh, you're going you're, you're gonna to go there, are you? No, like, like let's... <laughs> The the hackback conversation, like like we, I, I'm sure you remember, like hackback has been something that that has been touched on and danced around, and people have avoided it for literal years, be, yeah. because nobody's interested in talking about the ramifications. It's too deadly, like whatever the case is. Um, you know what's kind of you know, and then we saw Nvidia allegedly hack back as part of um, you know their their recent uh, ransomware attack and whatnot. So so when are we when are we going to start launching thermonuclear uh, nukes uh, from from companies at companies because of hackback? Well, I think that's it's a tough one. Uh, so I watched I, I came onto the stream uh, just before the commercial break, and not that I want to rubbish some of the conversations that were in the commercial break, but it Go for really it. Con it really concerns me when you have a company says you know the attacks came from and then names a country mm. attribution this is back that, to the attribution yeah question attribution again. is huge yeah. and the hackback thing is huge because you know my, my the way i typically go about it you know if you're going to blame russia or you're going to blame china or korea or I, can we blame new zealand seriously I blame <laughs> nobody ever blames new, new zealand doesn't get blamed for anything they're like fly under the buggers fly under the radar i swear Fe it. They're feeling not, feeling so left out new on the zealand. attribution are you no shit. I mean, they, they have gotten it down. To me, they've gotten it down. They managed to use like Chinese language scripting and Japanese stuff, and they got Russian. For, I mean, they got language experts now, and everybody's using grandma's computer in North Korea to launch their attacks from. Yeah. So for me, the, the attribution thing is, if, if I can find Boris sitting at the computer with his bottle of vodka and his check stub from the FSB... And I know that Boris is a diehard FSB fan and, and isn't maybe sympathetic for the, the BS that's going on over in Ukraine at the moment and everything else. And Boris is in my computer. And if I can get to that level, then, yeah, you know, I'm dropping a tactical nuke on Boris. <laughs> but if I if for any reason Boris is sitting at his computer with his with his bottle of vodka and Boris is just. Boris is off surfing YouTube looking for an American bride, not a Russian bride at this point in time. You know, Boris is sitting in his computer and let's say, you know, Zing or somebody sitting over in China and is using Boris's computer to annoy the hell out of my system. I just nuked the wrong person. And unless I know, and even if they're using Boris's language or they're using all of this stuff, Unless you can get not just the computer, the person, and the moral, and the reasons, and the why fors and you actually can you can tie the human and their objectives and their you know what's driving them mm -hmm. that driving force behind the human. Unless you can get that. I, you you can't nuke somebody. It, it's really hard to do that. Well, and I think I think in this context, you're talking about it from a, a national defense perspective, which is 100 percent valid. And so, if we're having if we're having this conversation in the national defense perspective, and how hard it is to do attribution, even at the national defense perspective, could, who makes you think that that insert corporate X that a they're going to have the capability to do it? You know, because it requires them to have an offensive capability to do it. But then, what are they going to do when they get in, that information? <laughs> I know. I'm in. Right. Oh my god. Oh my god. China's <laughs> over here hacking me. Somebody do something about it. Somebody do something about it, please. Like, like help this. Help this ticket. 
yeah. China is attacking me. Could somebody I, please deal with this? What's, do you do you have the do you have the help desk for the NSA on speed dial so that we could just submit a ticket <laughs> to the NSA? Be like, I, I found I found them. They're over here, right? <laughs> no it's it's an asinine but, conversation, and that's that's why I laugh yeah. when people bring up attribution. I actually saw a tweet. I, I refrained from I refrained from commenting on it because it was going to be a very very toxic tweet. But but somebody literally had the audacity to come say if you're not doing attribution in your sock, you are literally the worst security operations team in the world. And I like almost went, oh man, I almost went off on that. I was like, Mac, I would have yeah. smacked that one. Yeah, no, that's bullshit. I mean, this, that's not the socks job. I hate to say it. Yeah, that socks job is to to look after their own organization as effectively as possible. Yeah. Now, could they use an element of attribution? To understand tactics, this is where we. This is where we have. Uh, uh, actually, let's let's finish the let's finish the the hackback thing for a yes. second. Because here's yeah. the other thing. Let's be perfectly honest. If I have my claws into you to a point where you finally figured out who I am, the chances are I don't have my claws in one way or two ways mm -hmm. or three ways. The chances are I got my claws into you six ways from Sunday. Let me let me expand upon that because for those who 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 are new to this stream or, or have not heard me talk about this before, and Chris is pretty familiar with this too, most nation states have short haul, long haul, sometimes medium haul communications, and that basically represents different ways into the network, different ways out of the network, different callbacks to different C2s on different timers with different signatures for yeah. that exact reason. Yeah. And I think that's where, again, so again, in the US, you've got all these, it's politicians. I mean, they need to be taken out, not just tarred and feathered and smacked upside. Can we do that on YouTube? I don't know if that's legal no, or no, not. No, 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 political, no political wow, chat, no political not? chat, no political chat. No <laughs> political. Okay, well, the individuals in, in the positions of power who represent states that stand up and go, we should hack back, they do need to be taken out. I actually don't. Or, or actually, you just put them in with a pig, strip them naked, cover them in honey, roll them in, um, roll them in fire ants, and then we can do something <laughs> with a, yeah, that, that's, that, you, that's we get the picture, Chris. We get the picture. <laughs> bad. <laughs> yeah, bad. So I think that's um, yeah. And then actually, so Matt's got a good point. Is it the legalities? I mean, that's the other point as well. I mean, it's there's a huge thing on the legality standpoint. You know, if how uh, a inside. Had enough issues. I mean, in the U.S., you got the, the hell it is. It's the Computer Act. But I mean, all of a sudden, if I start if I start attacking, you know, I go back to my go back to grandma's computer in North Korea. I start attacking grandma's computer in North Korea. At what point is that an act of war? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so now you've got well-meaning, spirited individuals in in country A attacking country B, and all of a sudden somebody does take that out of the digital domain and moves it straight into the physical domain. So um, so um, real quick on the scoreboard, as, as we move through this conversation, we do see a jump up from Lambda, ooh, yeah. which is... Zeta, uh, Zeta, Zeta. Uh, Zeta's, Z, can Z, Zeta's Canada. Um, but we do, see, we do see Lambda in the top three, which is the, uh, the, the first time that we've seen Lambda in the top three. That's going to be Europe X. Um, you know, in the top three now. So we do see them kind of kind of creeping up there too. We do see finally Zeta in the five digits. We see Canada in the five digits on the score trying to close that gap on the Americans. We moved, a, we moved away from this. Uh, uh, oh, it changed on me. Um, yeah, so we're back over here on, on the Defender. Can we logs. just blame Canada. I mean, let's face it. We might as well go down that road. We'll just blame Canada. It's just fun. Blame Canada. I don't know what we're going to blame them for. We can blame Canada for something. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> awesome. We're about to uh, we're about to head to our second uh, or our third second second another. Third, How do we just call it another commercial third? break? Are we doing commercial breaks? I was trying to do commercial breaks at the top of the hour, so that because I, obviously I've I gone through service. I've gone through like several uh, energy drinks, and now I'm on my my bottle of my bottle of water. So um, can I do voiceovers in the commercial breaks? Come you on, let me do, do voiceovers. You cannot, you cannot do voiceovers Come in the commercial break. No, I'm going to do it on YouTube channel. I'm doing okay, voiceovers you can, you on can, the YouTube. You can channel. go hang out on YouTube with with Chad. We, we do have an awesome lineup when we come back. Um, when we come back, let's talk about um, who we've got this afternoon. Um, the yeah, last hour. Not. As we roll into the last hour, so so the games officially end at one o'clock. So in, in one hour, the games will end, and we'll be doing um, you know the awards ceremony, some highlights, and some key takeaways. But we've got uh, Philip Wiley. I know you know Philip Wiley. 
um, from Cognito. He's going to be coming in and, um, and joining us and talking about things from a, a hacker and a red team perspective as well. And then we have Marcel Lee. Uh, Mar- yeah, Marcel Lee from um, uh, Women's Jiu-Jitsu, who's going to be joining us. Oh, as well as sh- freaking awesome. Yes. Totally cool. I'm not gonna, I'm going to shut up. I guess, <laughs> am, I, am I hanging out on this? Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, I think you're I, hanging yeah, out okay. with me. Yeah, you're hanging out with me through the end. You, you're stuck with me for the That's rest cool. of the afternoon. <laughs> Sweet, that's awesome. I'm gonna. I, in that case, when Marcel and everybody's talking, I'm just gonna. I'm gonna be squirreling on the the, the YouTube thing. <laughs> All right, uh, everybody, hang out for a little while. Um, I don't know if uh, if there's gonna be another giveaway during this one. I think we still have uh, some teas. Okay, so I j- just got just got people yelling at me in my ear. Um, we have INE passes that we're giving away um, inside of chat right now. So if you're listening to us over on LinkedIn, uh, you do need to be in YouTube chat. You need to be in Discord uh, to participate in those. But chance to get some awesome, awesome training from INE. Chris, uh, any thoughts before I send us to commercial break? Any words of perils of wisdom? Any awesome No, while we're on commercial break, I'm getting another cup of tea. Everybody needs to be, it's all cup of tea. It basically, the entire security industry revolves around tea and coffee. If we, if we decaf everything, we're, just, we're all screwed. That's you know it. what? You decaf know what? Everything. I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring network Chuck on because he's a coffee person and you and I are tea people. And we're going to argue over key, over tea and coffee for an hour with network Chuck. Cause, uh, cause, cause he's all about that coffee. And I try, I'm going to try to get him to drink some tea. <laughs> tea. It's tea. all, who the hell drinks burnt beans? I mean, seriously. <laughs> There's a, Chad is about to riot. And so on that note, I'm going to send us to commercial break. I'll see you back here in a little bit. Yeah, man, I'm getting a cup of tea.
we go. Where we go. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, welcome back as we approach the final hour of the uh, U.S. Cyber Games here on the Cyber Insecurity Stream. So glad to have everybody here. Um, I was just hanging out with my good friend here, Mr. Chris Roberts. How are you doing today, sir? I'm back. I got my cup of tea and I got my Marmite, toaster Marmite. And that's really all I could ever ask for in life. Good See? toaster Marmite. Oh, and a cup See? Of tea. And, and, and I, I think I think your comment... I, whoops. There we go. Had a, had a little bit of a microphone right. feed, Yeah, had a little bit of a microphone feedback on that one a little bit. Um, I think your comment definitively affected viewership because I think literally about 50 people dropped off the view when you said that who drinks burnt beans? So, uh, so, so thank you. Thank you very, very much for that. Um, <laughs> Um, all right. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see here. Let's see what we, uh, what we got going on here. Um, some reason. Apparently the stream gets paused. I didn't realize that. I forgive you. <laughs> Hang on. I'm going to take the tea bag out. Take the tea bag out. Oh, no. Uh, uh, we did have a little issue with, um, uh, uh says it's buffering apparently the stream dead or something when uh when 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 you go to commercial break the stream dies off it confused everybody what happened what happened that, that's super odd i don't know it's technical things i mean people expect us to understand computers for crying out loud i know i know right um and especially you know when 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 we've been running a stream this long that's interesting hmm. hemp tea the hell is hemp tea for god's sakes is hemp is does hemp have it this that's is super proper cool. I don't know. I mean, hemp's got everything. Bunch of bloody crazy. No, this is proper Yorkshire gold. Ah. This is good tea. This is, it comes in a tea bag, which makes life a whole lot easier, especially when you're on a commercial break between webcasty things. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, mm. while the technical team tries to uh, look at some of the, uh, the frame rate issues, um, we're going to go ahead and bring our next guest. Um, I wanna, I'm pleased to, to bring in uh, somebody that you and I both know, um haven't seen him in a while glad to see you again phil mm. you just got back from uh from israel i understand it yes correct good good to see you and good to see you as well chris you too <laughs> chris is still stuffing his face he's like good to see you too <laughs> as i stuff my face <laughs> yeah. hey, it's breakfast this is chris breakfast and I for were, me chris and i were involved in probably one of the most unusual Jason Street awkward hug uh, pictures from HughesetCon in 2019. <laughs> how, how so? You want to you want to elaborate on that one a little bit since you brought it up? Yeah, it was kind of interesting because you had Chloe Miss Doggy was like across the top with the rest of us kind of holding her up. Uh, let's see, there was Jason Haddix in the pic as well as Chris, myself, and I try to think Chloe and some other folks. So it was. Pretty interesting. <laughs> pretty crazy. For, for for those who are for those who are not overly familiar, though, Jason Street is pretty uh, pretty known for you know the, being the king of awkward hugs. Anyway, right? So um, having having yeah. him with some some awkward hug stories would is, is about par for the course, right? Yeah, definitely. Oh I've, I've got I've got a I've got a picture of I've got numerous pictures of him with with awkward hugs. Believe me. But yeah, I love him to death for that stuff. He's a uh, like, but I, I think yeah. that that continues to, to just speak to just like some of the um, uh, awesome personalities that we do have in this industry when it comes to uh, um, you know the less toxic side of cybersecurity, right? Folks who are who are out there trying to make a, a, a difference and trying to bring a lot of humor and humility and uh, and, and whatnot to cybersecurity, just as an industry as a whole. Yeah, and, yeah. and one of the things yeah. is That's awesome too is he's a big champion of. Go, go ahead, Phil. He, he's also a big champion. He's also a big champion of mental health, which is great and much needed during the yeah. pandemic times. Yeah, yeah. I think. Um, I mean, the the mental health conversation, I think, is is something that um, you know, Philip. I know you and I have chatted with pretty extensively about. And I know it's been a, a topic of conversation for um, for numerous streams, both uh, on both of our channels and your podcast as well. Um, you know, I, I don't think we talk about the mental health stress in cybersecurity. Um, you know, and it's, again, you know, increased exponentially by what's going on in the pandemic side. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. And one of the things too, I think that's changed and evolved is people are, are learning that it's okay to share your problems and stuff. Cause people from like Chris and I, Chris and my generation, you know, you just, you're a guy, you're tough. You can't really show weakness or share your emotions or let people know what's going on. So it's kind of a culture shift. Oh uh, yeah. I, 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 well, go ahead, Chris, go ahead. I mean, from the military, from the military standpoint, I mean, it was, it was suck it up, which is, it's fine to some degree, but when you come out of those situations, the ability to actually take it down a level, process it and deal with it, but we, we just never got a chance. So now it's like, you know, it's uh, to your point, it's, it is good to be able to sit there and go, Hey, yeah, I'm not all right. Actually. Hi. Get you want some of my mama toast? <laughs> dog making dog making an appearance into the stream. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, I got my toast. I'm I'm fair game at this point. Yeah, I think we um I, I think we do make a we do make an assumption that um you have to have a certain type of image. You do have to have a certain type of persona that does prohibit you from acting a certain way inside of cybersecurity. We we oftentimes refer to that as imposter syndrome or whatever the case is. And I think mm. that, that that has a tendency to be pretty detrimental to a lot of the mental health, um, you know, you know, you know, issues just really kind of expands upon those in, in a pretty bad way. Right. Uh, hugely. Yes. So yeah. Oh, what do we got? Oh, we oh got no, some... just God, the frame rate is terrible at the moment, isn't it? So, so I'm, I'm being told right now that, that what we're looking at is this is the European team um, uh, right now, and it looks like they are just now finding out that they've been hacked. So um, hopefully we're watching them go through some logs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so they're, uh, they're, they're actually going through some logs and realizing that they've been hacked right now. So uh, we'll, we'll watch them do some of this investigation and, um, and, and see, if they can, uh, see if they can come back from this one. Um, so uh, it, where's the European team from? So we have two European teams. I don't know which one this one is. I don't know if this is X or O, but uh -oh. um, we do currently have. Uh, uh, which European team is this? Oh, wait for Ma to tell me which European team this is, and I'll tell you which which countries we've got represented here. You didn't give ball. It's because you can imagine the civilized English people. I say, I say, we've been hacked. No, no. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, so this is this is going to be Austria, Belgium. Uh, some folks from UK, Greece, Iceland, Netherlands, and Norway. So these are the primary Baltic oh, regions. We got freaking Iceland. We got Iceland on here. We got, we got Iceland on here. The Kiwis couldn't show up, but Iceland oh, could. That's freaking awesome. <laughs> that's I, Iceland. I got such a soft spot for that neck of the woods. It is so freaking. I was up when I was in the military. We got to go around Iceland, and then we got banned from Iceland. <laughs> they, they they wouldn't let us get off the they, they they wouldn't let us get off the ship again. <laughs> Why did you get banned from Iceland? What did, how did you screw up so bad you got banned from Iceland? Well, I'm allowed on Iceland now because I'm no longer running around in cabbage gear. But um, we, we might have – so they have street signs. And, and, and well, we took all the street signs. And, and we, 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 we captured the street signs. We took them off with <laughs> screwdrivers at about 4 o'clock in the morning. We'd had a few drinks. They got some really good alcohol up there. <laughs> and then we got yelled at and we had to go take them all back and apologize <laughs> and then we weren't allowed to what do you mean stop we're not bashing the kiwis for crying out loud it's just you guys are too nice <laughs> i mean seriously I, I swear like if we track back all major crime there's some there's a bloody there's, there's like a mastermind in new zealand underneath a bloody volcano somewhere that's just running everything it's not korea it's not china it's not russia it's some freaking kiwi somewhere sitting there laughing at the rest of us we need to blame new zealand <laughs> we need to blame new zealand <laughs> um just real quick since since we since we are looking at this screen where we're looking at what appears to be hopefully uh, uh europe uh trying to hunt for instances where they got hacked phil i want to talk to you i want to i want to get your perspective on this from a hacker's perspective um you know whether or not you know the attacking team knows that they're being hunted or not um i think is a different story but um you know you know, if, if you're on a box, what are you trying to do to, uh, uh, you know, obfuscate your traffic or, um, you know, just just utterly try to try to hide under the radar so that you're not getting detected by, in this case, Europe X. Yeah, one of the things you're wanting to do in all your activities, you're wanting to try to make sure that you're, uh, you know, trying to be quiet and not detected. And one of the things, too, that we have to keep in mind, too, and that's important in this competition is your 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 personal security, your OPEX, making sure, or your uh, SecOps, making sure that you've got your system, 
defend it even like on the attack box to make sure you're not getting attacked back so that's that's very critical we actually did see that before we went to the commercial break where um we did see uh one particular uh one particular advers- uh red team realized that they could spread their attacks out laterally by using the same exploit across multiple different castles that existed out there um is that is that a common type of a, a attack that you use when you guys are out there conducting penetration test yeah, the one, th- one of the things I'd like to, to kind of bring up is, you know, that would be more along the lines of an adversary emulation. Mm. Because, you know, like on a pen test, you're not trying, you're not worried about being detected because you got such a short time frame to complete that pen test. So this would be something more that you'd see an adversary emulation. And that's one of the things I guess that, was, that would be interesting. And you've seen this from your background is trying to cross over from that realm into you know something like pen testing that things are done a little bit different you're trying to find all the vulnerabilities exploit all the vulnerabilities you can find opposed to just trying to find one way in for your attack yeah the the adversary emulation conversation is also still pretty new i think in our industry um you know and when, when i say new i think i think people have different definitions for it because it's not a mature definition of adversary emulation um would you agree or disagree I agree. And I think one of the times what we see too much generalization, some people will call pen testing red teaming. They generalize it. And and those that's been in the industry a while or understand the the industry will realize that red teaming is more adversary emulation. A lot of times there's confusion of what that what that is. And then the confusion between pen testing and adversary emulation. What when you define. Uh, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. Go ahead, Chris. No, I'm I'm right there with Phil on this one. It's nuts. I mean, it's, it drives me absolutely bananas. And we confuse it ourselves. You know, there's a big difference between a scan and assessment and penetrate and a full-on red team. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that we haven't, unfortunately, as an industry, we haven't done a decent job of actually defining that and agreeing on it. You know, exactly Phil's point. It's nuts. Or Neil's point, sorry. It, well, I, I think I think we... Hit- we're afraid to define it. I'm going to, I'm going to step out and I'm going to be a little edgy on this one, right? I think we're afraid to define it. I think, I think the, the, the pen testing community, the hacker community, they're afraid of, uh, of standards. And I'll use that word very, very loosely, right? They don't want checklist, right? Mm -hmm. Because checklist, you know, quote unquote, deprives them of the, the freedom of thought to execute exploits how they want to. They're, they're afraid to standardize what the definition of pen testing or red teaming or adversary emulation is because they're afraid of standards. Um, I, I think it's, I think we, we self-sabotage ourselves by not trying to come to some type of agreement as an industry. I'll throw that grenade on the room and see who wants to jump on it. I, I, I mean, I'll go, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll hit that one briefly because actually from a client's perspective, it's terrible because it's like, what am I paying for? Yeah. Am I paying for somebody just to scan something? Am I paying for somebody to, to scan it and sniff it and maybe poke at it? Am I paying for somebody to throw the kitchen sink at it? Or am I paying for, you know, a proper red team to actually get out there and, and dig in? And then, and then it's like, okay, red team, is it plant the flag or is it focus on? Or, you know, I, I think it frustrates the hell out of me from a, I, I pisses me off from a client's perspective. Now, I, we we got to do it because you're right. I mean, it, it allows us freedom, but that's also freedom to rip off a client, which is also the thing that we're nice to have out of me. <laughs> Ripping off clients? You mean you'd be paying three hundred dollars for a uh, for a for a uh, vulnerability scan? Is uh, is is Freaking a bad idea? Badge Nesta scan for crying out loud with a good <laughs> heading title yeah. on it. I'm going to charge you twelve grand for it. Welcome to government's. <laughs> yeah, don't even. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I think I think from from my perspective, right? That's that's the that's the reason that we need to, from my perspective, that's why we need to adopt, um, you know, some some better discipline, if you will, when it comes to trying to standardize our, our industry. And I, I I know that it it's very it's a very top uh, conversational topic. Philip, I I want you to comment on that one as well. Yeah, and and mentioning, I've seen cases with that. Talk to people who've had pen tests done before. That basically someone ran a NESA scan and put it in their report uh, boilerplate template, you know, and, and turned that in, which is unscrupulous. And one of the things, you know, I was having breakfast with a friend this morning, and we were talking about, you know, like voter security and some of the different uh, local governments and stuff that because the people there in part of his budget aren't educated well enough, they're coming in. These are critical areas that need to be tested 
but they're bringing in some of these teams or these companies to test things that really aren't qualified, aren't finding things. So they have this false sense of security. And I really think that's happening probably throughout our country, like on a global scale. Uh, I want to throw another grenade in. Go for it. Throw another grenade in. Throw another grenade. Do it. Voter security. Voter security. An oxymoron. (laughs) How so? What's the what's the grenade? What's the grenade you're going to jump on there? That, That there is no voter security. Oh my giddy up! There's no voter security. I mean, you want to talk about a monopoly with three companies that don't do anything more than sue everybody that tries to point out the fact that there's errors and bugs in their absolutely crap code. I mean, the codes, good gods alive, Milo could write better code than half that freaking stuff. Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> and it's defaults. I mean, you want, you want to change voter records? Great. I'll tell you what, go use, I think, what is it? Everest, Everest exclamation mark. Well, something like that. What on earth is got, we got, we got things. Oh, I just, I just refreshing the scoreboard. Just refreshing the scoreboard. Got it. We need to refresh the, the poor, poor Phil is, he's, he's like lagging. Poor Phil is lagging. This video is lagging like 10 minutes behind the rest of us. He, he is. I, 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 I'm not sure what happened there. That's okay. We'll, we'll push through. We'll push, <laughs> we'll push through a little bit. It's, it, I can uh, we uh, if, if Phil, Phil reminds me of that, that stream I did that one time from a hotel room, uh, you know, with uh, with hotel Wi Fi that one time, it was pretty disastrous. Um, <laughs> I remember that <laughs> you remember that one, yeah, you remember that one. Uh, yeah. we, tried to, we tried to do that stream yeah. from that hotel, it was pretty terrible. Um, I just want to do a check in yeah. on the scoreboard really quick. We do still have the US, uh, uh, at number one, um, but we do see Canada. Um, coming up pretty quickly uh, with with twelve thousand five hundred and eighty, and then Europe X uh, coming in third uh, as well. I'm, I'm hearing that Canada um, continues to uh, implement um, uh, some defensive uh, uh, countermeasures. They're they're finding some IOCs and they're putting in some blocks and things like that, um, which is contributing to uh their increase in score as well so uh canada's canada's creeping up on the u.s when it comes to to implementing some of those defenses good old canada it's nice to see canada do well i mean that way we're not going to blame them for absolutely everything now if they overtake if they overtake the u.s i mean then that's you know at that point in time we just have to invade and be done with it (laughs) (laughs) Uh, it's 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 funny it's funny you say that right because it's like you know i i sad but true no we would never invade canada i'm kidding i'm kidding we want to work together as a team um phil what do you got what do you got going on sir what's going on in your life yeah, so I just recently made a, a job change to Cognito. They're an external attack surface management uh, platform. So it's pretty interesting. And one of the things that really got me interested in it was the fact that it uses a lot of the things that people use as pen testers, you know, reconnaissance, OSINT, and some vulnerability scanning and that sort of thing, and discovering assets that you normally may not find during your, your pen tests and stuff. So that kind of started that. It's been pretty interesting. Uh, so far, so I'm doing evangelism as well as uh, enablement, teaching people internally. While I was in Israel, our Tel Aviv office, I got to do a pen testing 101 uh, little session for our analysts there. So that's kind of what I've been up to and continue with the, the podcast and speaking at RSA coming up here pretty soon. Nice. nice. What, what are you talking about at RSA? So, uh, cloud-based pen test platforms. Nice. So, you know, basically setting up infrastructure where you can uh, perform, you know, externally facing pen tests. Nice. So I did a, I did a little write up on Medium a year or two back, and someone asked, "Hey, you know, requested something like that." So I kind of I did, gave the talk at Texas Cyber Summit last year, and I'll be giving it at, at RSA. Nice. When we talk about external attack surface ha- management, right? How is that different than pen testing? Mm-hmm. Like, what what is what are kind of the nuanced differences there that exist in that conversation? Yeah, it's kind of the, the overall picture. And one of the things too, that from some of the pen tests and one of the things that have kind of hurt the quality of pen tests is sometimes pen testers are given a scope, a narrow scope of IP addresses or domains to test externally. And a lot of times there's such little time, they don't invest time in doing good reconnaissance or OSINT. You know, because one of the things I saw the value in this platform uh, was, you know, back years ago, I was doing a black box external pen test of a company, actually a black box pen test overall of a company. And I did all my reconnaissance, found all the network blocks and domain names and was 
you know, to perform the pen test externally. But then I was using a tool like Shodan and I was able to find that they had an FTP server in Indonesia that wasn't in these network blocks. So one of the things with these, with attack surface management, it, there's a really big emphasis on trying to discover all the assets because through company acquisitions, they lose track of what they have. They think servers might've been decommissioned. So with these platforms, one of the big things is uh, discovering assets. So it's not so much a pen test, although it does some, most of these platforms do some vulnerability scanning and detecting vulnerabilities, running various other tools and automations in the background to find these vulnerabilities. But the main thing is, is trying to discover and define that attack surface and then prioritizing what needs to be tested. And one of the things some people would say, you know, you're a pen tester, you're worried that this is gonna, you know, take away from pen testing. It's not, it's not ruling that out, it's an extra tool. You're able to find, you know, assets that you know about because just like it can't, it escapes me the name of the product, but HD Moore came um, out with the product Metasploit. in recent years. No, it wasn't Metasploit. It was, it was past Metasploit. It's a new, it's an asset discovery. It's internal oh. for discovering assets. It's a new thing he started two or three years ago or whatever, but you know, we have products defined in define our internal attack surface. And you know, the asset inventory has been a big deal. And I've done uh, work with companies where we're doing external web app pen tests and not know all the URLs. I mean, it, you go through these hoops trying to find all that stuff. And with these platforms like uh, Cognito, it's like from a black box perspective, we know the name of the company, they go out and do all the reconnaissance and discover things. In a lot of cases, they're finding things that the company didn't realize they had. But then going back to a lot of times, pen testers don't have the time, or maybe they don't have the OSINT skills to find these things. Because, you know, there's a lot of people in the industry that are awesome with OSINT, and maybe that's all they do. And then there's people that are better on the pen testing side. So that's kind of what it does overall. It's not really replacing all those things. You can still do your vulnerability scanning. It's just an extra tool to make sure you're finding everything that needs to be tested. Nice. Uh, just for those who are watching the screen right now, what are we looking at? We're looking at Europe X. It seems like Europe X is starting to dig into those IOCs a little bit more and starting to put in some uh, some firewall blocks. And so we're seeing them um, hopefully going to be able to jump up here on the scoreboard, uh, hopefully here pretty soon. Speaking of scoreboard, let's head on over to the scoreboard and do a check-in uh, with our scoreboard. Um also slowly uh i want to thank the the sim space team for adding the names of the teams to the scoreboard i really do appreciate it, it makes my my deciphering oh. capabilities easier <laughs> there we go there we go um so yeah so we still got uh looks like uh, team usa still rocking the number one spot there, there's that bump that we talked about earlier uh everybody where uh canada was able to put in a ton of the uh a ton of the uh um, the, the IOCs into their firewalls and get that little bump in points as they started to close that gap with the Americans. So you got, they got a ways to go. But... They, changed... go ahead, Chris. they changed the color on us as well because Team America was red. They've now gone blue. So, you know, it's are they trying to, like, lessen the impact at this point? They're trying to, like, make it easy. <laughs> Come on, little buddies. Don't do this to us. Don't change all this stuff on us. We're going to have some fun. That's right. That's right. Um, Phil, I appreciate you coming in, stopping with us, uh, uh, sharing your experiences and everything with us uh, during the, during this brief time. Um, hopefully, uh, you get some sleep coming back from Israel. Um, before we bring in Marcel, um, I don't see her in the green room, and I know we're still seeing some. Um, we're still seeing a little bit of lag. Hang on, let's try the light thing. Mm, no, it's actually not too bad. It's it's yeah, we're yeah. in pretty good shape. Well, yeah, it's, it's not. It's not too bad here for some reason. <laughs> maybe poor maybe Phil. Just... I feel bad for him. I do. Although too. Uh, somebody asked, uh, we'll figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh well. Um, oh, there's Marcel. I see Marcel, Marcel in in uh, in, uh, in chat now. So we're we, gonna... hopefully Marcel's not lagging as much. If she is, we'll just up her bandwidth somehow or other. Yeah. Uh, let's see if see if this works with her. Can you hear us? I can. Awesome. Woo. Can you hear me? The first time we brought somebody in with no audio issues. Good job, tech team. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, I'm like the last one of the day, so it makes sense, right? <laughs> uh, actually, actually, we got one more after you, so you're not technically the last oh, one okay. in the day. So um, uh, close, close. Welcome to the U.S. Cyber Games. Glad to see you. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. For, for those who may not be overly familiar with who you are, which I know is probably pretty hard to believe, but can you just kind of uh, uh, talk about who you are and, and, and what it is you do? 
Yeah, sure. So I am Marcel and I am a senior security researcher at a company called SecureWorks, which is an MSSP. I am also on the board of directors of the Women's Society of Cyber Jitsu, and I lead all our cyber competition programming activity, which is a fair bit, actually. So I am a huge uh, cyber competition enthusiast, both playing and building them. Um, I've been the lead for the past couple of years for the Diana Initiative CTF Village, although I can't this year because I got other stuff going on. But yeah, so I like all these things. and. I'm excited for this event. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, we're, we're glad to have you here. We're going to jump into, um, we're, we, we'll, the screens will obviously jump around quite a bit, but we're hopping over into, um, uh, I'm, I think we're still checking in on Europe, uh, uh, Europe as they're uh, hunting down some <laughs> IOCs and, and trying to, to stop. I think they were in the process of getting actively hacked and are, uh, are, are trying to uh, try to defend them. So Yours. so from a, a, since you work for SecureWorks, and I've done a lot of work with SecureWorks over the years, um, you're on the threat research side. Um, you know, you yeah. know, we're late stage of the competition. There's been some. There's been an Intel inject with some APT10 and some APT40. Um, we've seen several boxes get compromised. We've seen the U.S. take a huge lead by implementing um, uh, uh, defensive countermeasures. Um, you're you're a huge cyber games enthusiast. What are your What's your thought process running in the last thirty minutes of the game today? Oh gosh. So, so I think um, you know. And having done this myself, like a live uh, competition event, um, trying to to just keep your your defenses strong, because um, there's no stopping, obviously, all the the threat actor activity that's trying to come in. But just being aware of it and, and mitigating it as quickly as possible is key. And obviously, they need to do that the entire time, right? <laughs> but but it's even more key now. So. Um, and I don't know like what else they get scored on if they're getting scored on like um, you know keeping services running or things like that. But if yeah. they are, then that's an important yeah. part to uh, to keep going as well. Uh, but yeah, it's <laughs> the other thing that I would say too from personal experience is breathe, <laughs> <laughs> take a sip of water. <laughs> the human side of things is pretty essential. I think I think that that's critical too because like we talk about incident response, right and um, uh, one of the, I, I tell people when, when I stream and for my community, I think everybody, we, we talk about, uh, uh, mandatory military service in some of these countries where you have to go spend two years doing mil mandatory military service. I think that every infosec person, regardless of your discipline, red, blue, green, yellow, purple, white, whatever your discipline is, should spend at least a year or two sitting incident response so they could learn exactly what you just said right there, which was to breathe. Yeah. It's so true. Um, and, you know, I, I have not worked as an incident responder, but I work with the incident response team at SecureWorks, um, basically supporting from a threat intel standpoint. Um, so I see it every day and, you know, I've been on the calls with customers that are just, you know, panicking. And <laughs> it's... Uh, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty hard to be an incident responder. I think that would be good experience. I also think everybody should work in a sock for a yeah. while too, <laughs> yeah. just to get that experience because it's similar, right? So, so before I pass it over to you, Chris, I just want to let everybody know we're watching Latin America right now, um, watching their red team. They're still trying to get into that voting box right now. So they're using Burp Suite uh, right now to try to get into that uh, that voting machine. Chris, oh, you were going to say on, something? Come on, do better than this. Come on, <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Why are they using Burp Suite? Stop. Get, 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 come on, line for crying out loud, you Muppets. <laughs> I know I know. Eric is over there uh, trying yeah, to yeah. trying to cheer on his Latin Latin American team. Uh, you know, well, trying I, to, trying I, to I, he bloody well needs to. Come on, people. You can do <laughs> this oh what do we got going on select stuff oh, oh yeah come on we can do this uh looks some like they're still doing detected yeah it looks like they're still trying to do yeah, yeah they got some they got some love they're getting there they got some love they need to go i do love the php my admin stuff though come on they can do this this isn't that seriously right it... You know what we need to do? We need to have guests. The guests need to be out every now and again just do injects, measles or injects on a regular <laughs> basis and have some fun. <laughs> Why? So we could so we could push. Uh, I, I got so called up. What the hell did I got called? I got I was at a, an incident. We were doing uh, critical incident stuff last week and the week before because of obviously all the stuff that's going on. We were doing some plannings and I got called a free radical. My, you got my called job a free radical for that entire. 
I got called a free radical. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I was totally awesome. I, I was a little, cause I was, I was basically, I was, I was both helping on some things. And then unfortunately I was, I was pointing out some stuff that we could do that would, that would result in unfortunately even more, uh, even more casualties. <laughs> So, so, so yeah, so, it's some, it's it's fun to play though. So so do you do you subscribe to the the mandatory uh, conscription on the incident response team for every cybersecurity uh, uh, person? Oh hell yeah, absolutely! I, I think everybody needs to be, uh, you know, exactly to Marcel's point. It's the breathing thing is huge because I mean, this is I think actually it's, it's this is where it kind of comes into. I mean, again, coming out of the actual military that whole, you know, crawl, walk, run, dry fire, live fire mentality, mm -hmm. or even going into situations, observe, orient, decide, act mentality. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's ground into you. Yeah. You know, and yes, we are the ones that run towards the fire and we are the <laughs> ones that run towards, you know, noise and burning buildings, but we do it in a calculated way. So I think that just, that helps across all facets of life. So yeah, and actually to Marcel's point as well is your ass needs to go sit in the help desk. For, actually, not even just a, I want you on a help desk because you need to know for every single time we blame a user for something, <laughs> we actually need to, put, we need to go put the shoes on. Seriously. I mean, it, it sucks because... It's it's you're but serious yeah, you're, you're serious but i want i want to dive into that a little bit though chris not to interrupt you just just but yeah. but for people who don't understand the the user base hates us in security because we were buttholes yeah. to them sitting on help desk yeah. so i'm i'm a I mean, huge we proponent no. of not victim shaming not user shaming it's i think user shaming is a terrible thing <laughs> and you know we all know that you catch more flies with honey or whatever that weird expression is. Like if you just make your users part of like the solution instead of part of the problem, it's just so much better all around, I think. And and like effective security programs that I've seen, which are few and far between. But, I, I, I they, want to put one caveat. That, There's right? one caveat. I have one caveat in that one. When the CEO yeah, yeah. of the company still uses one, two, three, four, because they think they're the CEO and they're the exclusion, that's the one I can take outside. I yeah. can put in a paddling pool and I can go gangster with the taser. I get one in the, <laughs> one in the forehead, one in the testicles. Maybe we should bring back the pillory. <laughs> the public uh, shaming poster. It's, <laughs> I, I think the guess. I think the the worst the worst case of that that I ever had was I I had a, a CEO of a company that that I worked with um before in the past he had uh, and this was this was at a time I, I this was at a time where BlackBerry shouldn't have been a thing right they'd already moved well past their prime and um, he had thirteen yeah. Blackberries one in each private jet so oh. that meant that. That meant that when he wasn't in that private jet, it was just hanging out in the private jet doing its thing, right? And he refused to move to an iPhone because he thought BlackBerry Messenger was more secure than iPhone Messenger. Muppets. He could have gone with a Windows pen. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> But, but it brings up a valid point, right? But, but see, again, we go back to user shaming, right? It's fun to laugh at that, but, but you know, I, I, had a, I go back to, to one, of my, one of my key critical points, right? Our job as cybersecurity professionals is to enable the business to take risk. You know what? It's fun to laugh at them, but we got a job to do. Yeah. If he, if he wants 13 yeah, Blackberries. It's, it's a balance. Yeah. It's a balance and it's, it's, it's having that risk conversation. You want your 13 blackberries, have at it. However, here's how we mitigate the risk. Here's how we help you understand what that, what those risks are in a language that you understand, but also here's how we help you mitigate those risks. And it's, and if you're not willing to mitigate them, then I need something in writing to say you're accepting those risks. For sure. Just a, a quick check in on yeah, the score since we are in the last uh, last twenty minutes before before Marcel before you chime in on that one. We do see Canada jumping up in scores. Looks like they did grab some of those uh, some of those key defensive points and are closing the gap pretty rapidly here on uh, here on the U.S. Um, looks like we may see a race to the finish here in the next twenty minutes as as some of these teams try to close in on some of these gaps. But it looks like we got uh, we got we got Canada closing the gap in on the U.S. Go ahead, Marcel. Oh. 
Um, I think I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's okay. I think we were- Invade I think we're, Canada. Invade the- Oh, no, I know what I was going to say. Invade Canada. <laughs> <laughs> no, I remember now. So um, so one of the things, and I think, I think that I'm kind of um, keen on this because I am a career changer. I didn't always do cybersecurity. So I used to be one of those sort of, you know, frowned upon user types. And, uh, and the thing that I think that is missing in the conversation too is, is like the why of things. Like why do we need to have, you know, a password sort of configured this way or whatever, or why can I not, you know, leave this material on my desk or whatever. Um, and, you know, I've discovered that like, if you just show somebody like how easy it is to crack a password, hash or whatever, then they're like, oh, okay. Or if you see how threat actors can, you know, reuse credentials that have been used like across a zillion different sites, um, show them like, have I been pwned, things like that. Like it just, it gives them a more um, holistic view of like kind of the, the problem and, and how they can be, like I said before, part of the solution. So, so, so you mentioned a couple examples there, right? But I mean, even, I think even some of those, you know, even explaining MFA to some users is, is pretty challenging, right? Mm. Where, where do you go to find no, it? No, but you show no, it, right? No, no, oh, 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 no, I triggered Chris. No, I triggered it. Chris. Oh, <laughs> hell no. All right. So I'm actually going to go for all it. All right. So I did a whole, and I did a whole collaboration. So Gabrielle is over at Wiser Training. And I got a lot of love for him. I did an entire collaboration and we built a dictionary. We actually built a dictionary. Uh, and I'll give you the I'll give you the two FA, two factor authentication, two things to work out. You are who you are and you are who you say you are. Typically one is a password and the other is either your email, your phone, or something about you, your face or fingerprints. That code to get you on the get the code you get on your phone from the internet. That's it. That's two factor. Simple as that. Who you are and what let me, you are. Let me, let me challenge you though, right? Because like we, we've all heard that analogy, right? A CEO's got what, 10 to 15 seconds that he gets to consume information before he's got to run off and do something else. Yeah. I, I lost it when you were like yep. two factor authentication is X, right? I still would argue that's too technical of a definition for some users that are out there. Would you explain that definition to your grandmother? I, I So my grandmother, I'd say... Something you have and something you are. Yeah. But I think I think it's that communication you have piece. And something that's... I, I think we still fail yeah. at the communication. We don't talk to we don't talk to people in languages that they understand. Mm, I see Marcel totally. nod well, her head. Totally. She wants to jump key. in there. Yeah. <laughs> I always want to jump in. No, Go so this it. is where examples are key. It's if you show people, it's so much better than just like telling them, right? Like I could talk two-factor, multi-factor all day long, blah, blah, blah. And all my friends who aren't in you know, cybersecurity would be like, what? <laughs> but if I show them how easy it is, because it actually is pretty easy to do these days, um, then you know, people tend to get engaged. And, and then also, you know, there's so many like horror stories about the things that happen if you don't have your multi-factor turned on. And so I'm always happy to share horror stories and depress everybody. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's <laughs> I want to I want to pull this back over to the scoreboard really quick before we carry on to this because I do got a point I want to make on that one. We see Canada really really jump it up in points here. Seems like they have found their groove here in the last fifteen minutes um, in terms of catching up those points, and so we see them really really giving us a run for their money uh, uh, here as well. So we'll continue to switch back and forth between this and we're over on uh, on on Win Hunt uh, uh, two as no. we watch uh, Canada uh, continue to try to uh, get in some last minute stuff. What what I would argue with the um, uh, with the, the the demonstrative stuff though, um, I, I think people we've talked I've talked about this on, on my stream before. People think what we do is magic, right? And and really it's it's actually mm -hmm. really not magic. And, and I know that, that like hurts a lot of a lot of cybersecurity folks' feelings when we talk about it really not being magic. It's actually you know, pretty easy stuff. Um, but they see when we start talking about, let me show you the damage it could cause. Let me show you what it could happen. They still just go, "Why me? Why me? I'm just a I'm just a person. Yeah. Why my bank account? Right? Um, I had a conversation like that with somebody recently. How do you how do you reconcile that conversation with folks? Why me? Why would they ever look at me? Why would they ever hack me? 
so for me, like, and I get this a lot from like, you know, maybe small businesses or even like not small businesses or people, individuals, people are like, you know, why would anybody hack me? I don't have anything of value, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, the hackers don't care about your stuff. They just want to use your computing power, your persona, your whatever to do bad things. Um, so, you know, if you want somebody to hack into your email and start using it to send out like spam or even worse, child porn, something horrible, like that gets their attention, right? It's like the hackers don't care. Oh, actually, I shouldn't even say hackers because I hate it when people Fine. use it in a negative way. So, <laughs> don't yeah, yeah. You I, or yourself. Yeah, you know what they can gain. Yeah. No, I think I think I think everybody I think termino- go ahead, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead, Chris. I think terminology is a big one as well. So I I gotta be honest, I take exception to the to the hacker thing being used in a negative connotation. Because I mean that was our background, that was our life. So for me, if if you step over that ethical or moral line, you're a criminal. End of conversation. So the adversaries want to use your computer. The criminals want to use you. And they're using you as a stepping stone or just another piece of the jigsaw. Um, The hackers, we're all here trying to actually save everybody else from themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that that's yeah, no, absolutely. All, that's all very good point. Absolutely, we and th- we 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 talked a little bit about this on and off on the stream as we we fail at the dichotomy, we fail at the taxonomy in our industry, and and what it means. Um, you know, I think we do that. You know, in a, in a really terrible terrible. Yeah, and as as a um, you know, I I'm a professor at a couple of different universities, and and that's one of the soapboxes I always get on is about <laughs> like don't use hackers in a derogatory way, which of course I just accidentally did, but um, it happens. But yeah, so I use threat actors. That's usually my terminology. Um, cyber criminals works too. Um, but yeah, I consider myself a hacker. Like if you like to break shit and see how to <laughs> fix it or whatever, to me, that's a hacker. Like one of my favorite t-shirts is from Skydog Con and it was basically like defining what a hacker is. I still have that T-shirt, even though Sky.com is no longer. Yeah. Sadly. So I want to, I want to, I want to hack, I want to harp on that. I want to do a follow-up question for both of you on this one. But I want to. We're coming up to the last ten minutes of competition. I'm hearing from the the white cell that the teams have effectively given up on red teaming, and have got have realized that the defensive strategy is getting them the most points. Shocker there. Um, and so we've got a, a race here in the last 10 minutes to see who can get the most defensive points to try to close this gap. So so in chat, we know that the teams are O-Scenting on this stream right now. Let's get chat showing your support in chat for your respective teams here in the last 10 minutes um, as they try to uh, try to close this gap on the U.S. Uh, here in the last 10 minutes. And with that being said... Um, I get the question a lot in in my DMs. I'm sure you do, Chris and Marcel as well. You know, what makes the best hacker in the world? How do you consider yourself an expert? Um, you know, you know, how do I how do I become a hacker and things like that? Chris, I'm gonna start with you, and then I'm gonna go to you, Marcel. After that, Chris, what is the definition of a hacker? Uh, to me, it's that curiosity. It's it's that desire and willingness to understand what makes something tick and potentially how to make it tick differently. It, it's that asking more questions. It's, it's taking that box that we've been given and going, that's cool, throwing it away and going, now what can I do? That is the definition of a hacker. And I, that can be applied across everything in life, not just compute. Now, now Marcel, your definition. So it's a little bit of a riff on what Chris said, but to me, the the box thing, right? So it's thinking outside of the box. So you you have a a problem, a situation, a something that you want to um, understand better. You you need to be able to think outside of the usual like parameters that we do think in, and and I think that's what hackers do. It's sort of like an intellectual curiosity that not everybody has. Um, and one thing that I always say to people, like you know. If somebody asks me like, well, why or how or whatever, I'm like, that's how you learn things, right? You you have these questions in your mind and you go find the answers or find somebody who knows the answers. But it's better if you find them yourself, if you can. What, what I want everybody who's listening to hear, now we're in the replay of this, if you make it this far, is that I didn't hear either of you say, you need to know Python. You need to know how to write zero days. <laughs> 
you need to be a master web exploiter. You need to have this cert. You need to have that cert. You need to have your sec plus, your net plus, your A plus. I didn't hear any of that out of either of you two. Why not? That's because it's a mindset. It's not about qualifications. Like I think you you have it or you don't really. Um, you can you can become a trained and educated and certified cybersecurity professional, but that's not necessarily the same thing as being a hacker. I don't know. What do you think, Chris? I think you're right. And it's it, to me, it's one of those things. It's, um, you know, we've brought people in through various companies and I can teach you how to break into anything. I can teach you how to pass any bloody cert, but what I can't teach you is the drive and the thirst. Do you, yeah, now yeah, I'm going to, we hear it called passion. Well, well, so, so let's, yeah. let's, yeah. I, I love it when people say this, I love it when people say this, I want to challenge this. And, and again, we're, we're watching, um, I don't, I don't uh, have a mod tell me which team we're watching. We're still watching some threat hunting going on here in, um, in Splunk. That's what you're kind of looking at now is we're watching some, um, that looks like they're going. So this is America trying to maintain their lead, um, against the rest of the team as they're continuing to look for IOCs. Both of you mentioned the passion. But one of the things that people miss in that conversation of passion, right, is that you know what they immediately hear? They immediately hear, oh, I've got to stay up 20 hours a day studying all these different things. I've got to stay abreast of news. I've got to stay sharp on skills. What is the definition of passion versus burnout? I am the wrong one to ask because it has taken me until my late 40s to figure that shit out. And for me, uh, so today is an exception for me because it's not, I'm not really working. But for me, my Saturdays are off. I will not work on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. um, and I also don't work between like 6 o'clock at night and about 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night. Now, after 10 at night, I go do my own research until, you know, 2, 3, 4 in the morning. But passion is, it, 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 to me, for me, it's, that, it's still that thirst for knowledge. It's wanting to sit down and research, but it is, it's that balance as well, which I suck at, which is, Hey, I also need to get at least, you know, four or five hours of sleep. How about you, Marcel? What are your thoughts on <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. So I, I agree 100%. And, you know, I think sometimes people, you know, wonder when you say passion, like, a, how do you like, how do you hire somebody on the basis of passion? Right. So I look <laughs> at things like, um, like doing cyber competitions. If you're doing cyber competitions, then you're passionate about this stuff, right? Or you've become addicted like many of us do. <laughs> but, <laughs> but there's, if you're just like doing those extra things to increase your knowledge, then you're passionate. And like, for me, it's such a blurred line between like, you know, say my day job and my teaching and my volunteer work and the stuff I do for fun. Like, it's all kind of the same thing. And, and I too have to make like a really concerted effort to get out from behind the screen because yeah. I'm not very good at the balance thing either. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think the not very good at the balance thing. I think we're all. I think there's a there's a point where you realize that you're not very good at and you actively try to change it. And then there's a there's a there's a point that happens just prior to that, which is you're not acknowledging it. You think you have to do it. You feel like you have to do it. You feel like you're you're either going to be behind if you don't do it. You feel like you're not going to be able to keep up with the your peers in the industry if you don't do it. And I think it's that realization. Chris, you, you hit the nail on the head. I don't know that I'm a good person to answer this because I'm late. I'm figuring out in my late 40s. I think that's exactly the right person to ask for that because I'm with you. You know, I'm in my 40s just now realizing that it's okay to take a step back, still maintain my passion and realize that, I, Hey, I got to walk away from these computer screens and I got to go do my, got to go do my thing. Well, I, so I think the other part that comes into this critically, you can't know all the things all the time. This industry has accelerated far beyond what any one of us can keep up on. I mean, years ago we were, we were able to keep up on pretty much of everything. Let's face it. But then infosec security and technology in general has infiltrated everything. So what I love about it is, again, there is now so much. If you have an interest in agricultural hacking, <laughs> you can go to all sorts of crazy shit on that side. If, like me, you anything that moves is fair game, that's an entirely different one. If you like research and exploits and, and IoT stuff or any of that stuff, I mean, you can love that one area and just know 
that you can ask anybody else in the community, hey, so how did you make that John Deere go circles in the, in the, oh, shit, that's cool. But you still have your own sphere and you share. I think that's also mm -hmm. a huge part of it. So, so real quick, uh, uh, before before you jump in there, Marcel, the, we're watch, what we're watching right now is we're watching Europe X um, hold on to a 100-point lead uh, for third place uh, as Oceana is is chasing their heels as they try to close out that last 100 points here in the the, the last three minutes. Um, go, go ahead, Marcel. I don't know if you wanted to chime in on that conversation as well. <laughs> I actually wasn't going to say anything, but... Okay, I was But sure. I will I, say something. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> No, so um, I just was going to say it's uh, it's kind of ironic because right after this, I am actually going to a Python workshop because my Python skills. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to you're going to continue to learn when you leave here for your Python skills. Yeah, exactly. And it's kind of funny because I'm usually the one who's like teaching the workshop, so I have to always clarify to everybody. I'm like, no, 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 I'm taking this workshop. <laughs> I, I think that I mean that's a that's a very valid point, right? I mean, I you know you know Chris hit on the head too, right? That that desire to learn, like like we're never done learning. We're all still learning something right now. I, I recently embarked on a on a on an endeavor to move all of my honeypots from you know digital ocean servers um, over to to cloud infrastructure, so I could teach myself how to build you know entire networks inside of AWS. And and it's it, we're all the time looking for for opportunities to kind of uh, to to kind of do that. So I completely agree. Don't be surprised when you get your first bill, Neil. Um, I I I <laughs> took yeah. lessons. I took lessons from somebody who reminded me to set up alerts before I started doing that, so that I knew when I <laughs> when I would get when I would pass that threshold. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I I have a confession. I have a confession to make. Okay. So Brian Godfrey in the chat in YouTube in the chat said um, his house is only safe, or is it his house is only safe until Chris Roberts finds it? So I'm currently scanning the Greater Tarang T A U R A N the Greater Taranga area. Uh, specifically, I'm focusing on I can't pronounce like the New World Gate Wendy's hamburger. Yeah, so I apologize to Northern New Zealand at the moment. If the lights start blinking on the internet, there's a distinct possibility it is my fault. And it is grandma in New Zealand that's also going to get blamed as well. So you want to nuke somebody in New Zealand, nuke grandma. All right. And with that being said, I'll, I'll, I'm going to leave Brian's home alone. I really want to find his home now. That's, that's okay, Chris. I got one for you that came in from chat. Um, uh, I, I think this Ooh. came back uh, uh, right right before we brought Marcel on, but said, "Chris, could you could y'all do a stream recording on this, breaking down the successes, mistakes, and what have could have been done better or faster?" Um, I think that's an invitation to come back to the cyber and security stream and maybe come be my guest out on cyber and security stream. So I'll put you on the spot and say, "You willing to come back to the cyber and security stream? Maybe come back to my old guy Wednesday and sit down with a bunch of old guys and have a chat with me." Freaking would absolutely be honored to. Thank you. Would absolutely be honored to. There we and go. And thank you. Let's see. Let's see if we got any other questions. Right. I'm still can hacking. Old gals? What's that? Can old gals come too? <laughs> absolutely, 100. percent You want to come in on an old person Wednesday, and uh, and and and. I would and be chat? happy to. You'd be happy to. We will. We will get those out out there as as well. Um, I'm checking. I'm scrolling back through. pop hop. Cool. Where the hell am I? What, what Ori Croppy Pools. What the you, hell is Ori Croppy Pools? You shouldn't be live hacking while we're on the stream. Well, I'm not necessarily hacking. I'm merely investigating and exploring throughout the internet. Okay. <laughs> and so, I can't so, help it if Ori Croppy Pools has got bloody open ports on their internet. Uh, so so it, it looks like we are at the top of the hour. Um, I'm checking with the, uh, the refs to see if they are officially done, if this is the official end score that we're looking at here um no, the colonies were so close to catching up america kind of escaped the colonies and i figure canada and oceana is still kind of part of our extended empire-ish kind of thing you, you all just bug it off around what 17 1800s or something and, and and i'll tell you i'll tell you what did it for the u.s the u.s took the early lead 
um, when they capitalized mm -hmm. on that threat intel uh, that came through, there was an, an AP-10 and an APT-40 inject that happened around 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and the, the U.S. grabbed those IOCs and almost immediately started putting in a whole bunch of defensive measures, um, and, and that really that really kind of set them apart from a, a stage perspective. It looks like we're still waiting for the graph to load, but uh, when that graph comes back up, you'll see that they, they really kind of shot up in, in that regard. So... Um, Still waiting to hear if we're officially done. I know we're two minutes over time. Um, you know, from a from a competition perspective, don't anybody go anywhere because we do still have um, some post game uh, uh, post game discussion uh, that's that's going to go on here as well as we hear from uh, from the game master about how the rest of the the day went. But um, you know, game's over. You know, uh, you're all high fiving each other. You know, what are what are you know if, if you're coaches of these teams, what are you talking to them about right now at the end of the game? What do you what are you telling what are you the if you're the Latam coach, what are you talking about, you know, with, with where your placement is compared to everybody else? It's gotta be a positive thing. What first and foremost, y'all kicked ass for getting here and for doing it and for hanging out and for being part of it and for learning. Number one, to me that's the most important thing. You took part, you did it. And that's core and critical to this one. And it kicks ass the fact that they did it. Uh, that I think is above all. Yeah, absolutely. Show it. You showed up. You showed up. There's the uh, there's yeah, that initial and, and there's that initial I mean, jump. Got, number to... one, this isn't. Yeah, this isn't the only game. When you think about it, I mean, this is fantastic. And exactly what I'm saying. It's there's so many of these. The fact you learn, you. Ex I mean, good grief! I remember the first time I was fortunate. I I I remember doing the early days of um, capture the flag at DefCon and stuff and. We didn't have to do all these pre games and pre calls. It was just turn up, not quite so drunk. Hopefully, you could actually see the <laughs> keyboard effectively, and 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 hope for the best. And and it was fantastic. And and I mean, I remember getting our asses handed to us a couple of times before we badged. Yeah, 100%. Um, and it, it sucked and it hurt, but good grief, you learned so much. Well, and that was why when they the, these last two years is they've done the. the capture the flag for defcon virtually i've encouraged everybody to participate in it because now you don't have to travel to vegas you can participate in the the red red team village blue team village um i think they did the trace hunt yeah. did their their OSINT uh, vill uh capture the flag virtually as well during defcon this last year and so like i encouraged everybody to do it because i thought that that was to your point like everybody has to do it at some point in time in their uh in their life marcel yeah. from a coaching perspective what are you telling the teams <laughs> well, I'm very much a cheerleader, so I would be telling them what a fabulous job we did. And uh, I'd be looking for like the next opportunity for them to uh, jump into. I would also be telling them to get their resumes ready because people are hopefully going to want to hire them after yeah, this. Absolutely. And it doesn't matter if they were first place or last place, just like Chris was saying, just getting here is a huge accomplishment and the dedication to like, you know, be in this environment because it can be a little brutal. Um, so my hat would be off to everybody, but Hey, I have to jump off because yep. I have, you know, that workshop, absolutely. absolutely. But, um, can I just put in a quick plug for absolutely. Women's Society Cyber Jitsu? We do have a lot of competition stuff that we're doing all the time. Um, I have a Slack that I run that is all things cyber competitions. So I will put my contact info in the chat here in YouTube. Um, so if anybody's interested in any of that stuff, please feel free to reach out to me. And thanks so much for having me. It was super fun. Not a problem. Hey, good luck at your class today. <laughs> thanks. Good luck. <laughs> See y'all. Absolutely. Um, Chris, while we actually, uh, we could probably hang out over in the scoreboard and uh, just kind of continue to, to take a look at the scoreboard and see uh, uh, if we see any changes to scores as they tally that stuff up here in the last little bit. Um, we're going to, we're, uh, there's, there was a, uh, uh, there was a giveaway that was running in chat, um, you know, so uh, uh, hopefully uh, some people are getting some good stuff out of those giveaways. Looks like we did have Gabriel S Silva come through with a Go Team USA um uh on the super chat as well looks like steven rosendahl came came through with the super chat on the uh the hypes as well sounds like uh we 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 made it through all the giveaways uh pretty uh pretty extensively so congratulations to all the winners who nice. uh who won giveaways and chris we had with some crazy giveaways we had uh 15 cases of of at root which is the energy drink i've been drinking on 
um, all morning. <laughs> I, after this last commercial break, everybody wide up and hopped up. <laughs> oh, after this last commercial break, the 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 wife goes, "How many of those energy drinks have you had?" And I just kind of like sheepishly like nodded my head, which is why I've had to switch to switch to, to to the water. But um, for for today only, if you didn't win those cases of Rude, um, there is a discount code for today only where you can get fifty percent off uh, cases of Rude um uh for today only so do make sure you do uh take advantage of that normally uh, our discount code only gets 20 percent, but they gave us a special one for today for the for the cyber games i want to thank i want to thank tcm security for giving away um uh, a, a super bundle of their courses i want to thank thank uh, security blue team for their blue team labs online i want to thank i and e for their um uh, for their exam vouchers um i, I want to thank uh, uh gosh who else uh you know, I, I think there's some other uh prize folks that we need to thank as well but uh, those the rest of them are escaping me um but uh, uh with that being said i'm gonna put us on one final break while we wait for um wait for final scores chris um no commercials this time we'll just put us on a on a quick brb um when we come back from this brb though um what we're going to do is we're going to be talking with uh with pete pete's going to be going over um kind of the scoring some highlights of the uh of the event some days we'll go through the, some of the, some more of the questions and see if there's any questions from anybody else um and uh we'll kind of take a look and see where we're at from that uh chris any part you're going to stick with me as we talk to Pete, uh, yeah, over the I'll, questions. I have one question though. I have Go one for question for you. Go for it. If I hack the app root drinky website, do I get more than fifty percent off? Can I get there? There is a couple of Easter eggs on the at root uh, website. There's actually a game, <laughs> or they're used. Adam, to... they're yeah, freaking awesome. Yeah. Well, hey, dude, dude, <laughs> I lo like look. It's a it truly it's a nerdy drink. This isn't just like a, a normal energy drink. This is like I haven't seen it before. I yeah. haven't seen it before. It's fun. It's freaking awesome. Yeah. I love it. This yeah. is totally I I didn't know about this. Yeah, it's it, it's it's pretty new. The the guys who make cores, I think is who it is. I can't remember who their their parent company is. They're trying to make uh something that adheres to hackers and programmers. It's it's literally one of the coolest drinks. I that, love this. This yeah. is absolutely freaking fantastic. All right, I'm ordering some. What I was gonna say though, if I inject in because you got the code fifty yeah. for everybody, if I can inject in something else, do I get extra bonus points and just <laughs> or do I get yelled at? I'm I, I'm always, you know. They, they 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 specifically sponsored with us because they knew that we were a hacking stream and so if you do hack their website then uh i will simply call them up and be like hey you knew what you were getting into when uh when, when you when you partnered up with us so uh <laughs> oh that's awesome yeah i'm hitting this stuff now i'm gonna grab some I, where the hell do you put this crazy all right yeah we probably need to go to whatever the hell this thing is don't we? hey like real quick break. before we well, head to this break hey chris chris before we head to this break i just heard something amazing in my ear I just heard something amazing in my ear. The U.S. is donating their winnings of this event to the ICC to try to get other teams to come in to the competition. I know. All right. Kick ass. Seriously, freaking kick ass. You are. Like, yeah, that's. That's awesome. Thank you. Like, that's, seriously, freaking awesome. Thank you. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's freaking cool. That's, that's like freaking, freaking awesome. That's freaking cool. Yeah. So, um, uh that's great that's great to hear so um awesome all right um we'll be back uh we're gonna take a quick break we'll be back with uh with pete um what well, we've also
And we're back. That was a quick break. Um, all right. So uh, while while we're still waiting on, um, it looks like we're still waiting on um, a couple of uh, da, 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 chicken. Okay, there it is. I bought some of the drinky stuff. You did buy some of the drinky stuff. Oh, good. I hope I you enjoyed some it. Let of me the drinky you, stuff. Let me know if you like it. Um, I did just get. Uh, Yep, I see Dane over in the green room now. So we're going to, um, we're actually going to, before we bring Pete on to kind of discuss some of the highlights, I want to bring in another, I want to bring on our, our next special guest here, Chris. This is, uh, this is Dr. Dane Brown. Um, fantastic mm. um, uh, individual. I had a chance to chat with him the other day. He is the, uh, the U.S. Cyber Games red versus blue uh, coach for, uh, for the USA team. Um, and so we're going to bring him in here as soon as i can find which mouse there it is that's what i wanted dane welcome to the show sir how are you okay hello can you there see we go. me hear me yes yes we've got you awesome fantastic <laughs> how's uh how, you're in the All midst right. of a you're in the midst of a <laughs> sans class how's it going Uh, it, it's going pretty well. Uh, we're at the last day of it. You know, it's been, a, uh, you know, these, these are really long days, um, but, you know, really interesting content we get to uh, cover every day um, and, you know, get to uh, learn, sharpen your skills a little bit um, and, and bring something back to, uh, you know, those you work with. Nice. So, um, so, so we just finished the competition. We're waiting for the scores to get finalized and tallied. We had an intense an intense day of, of cyber games, uh, nine teams across multiple yeah. countries. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, you, I, I'm sure you didn't get to catch all of it because you were, you were in a Sands class, but it was intense. Um, you are, you are the, you're the coach for the, for the U S team, um, you know, for this, what exactly are, are you coaching the teams on right now? What exactly are you trying to tell them from a strategic perspective? Um, you know, you know, what, what are some of the, the, some of the things that are going on kind of a post competition mindset, um, you know, right now with the teams? Yeah. Um, so we're, we're definitely going to uh, learn a lot from, uh, what's going on today, you know, um, and, and kind of be taking notes, you know, this is being the, the first year that we've gotten to run this, uh, assemble the team, the coaches, everybody together. Um, we are, uh, we're mostly learning a lot along the way, right. Uh, um, kind of digesting that, um, you know, uh, you know, readjusting the plan, uh, and, and trying to figure out, Hey, what, what is the, what's the best direction for us to go in and what's going to, uh, you know, kind of result in, uh, you know, our, our best chance for success, uh, as a team. Right. So, um, that's kind of what we're, we're looking at, right. Uh, everyone's really sharp uh, on the technical side. Um, and, you know, as coaches, we're just trying to really support the team, um, making sure that, you know, uh, operationally, uh, they they have uh, everything they need, all the tools, uh, you know, to to be uh, as successful as possible um, in, in the event. So, so I, I want to I want to ask you another question. I want to pivot off of this one. That that's obviously post game, and as as you look forward to Greece and things like that, North Africa didn't show up. Um, they had some issues getting you know yes. folks to fill out their roster and things like that. How hard is it from your perspective, from a coaching perspective? What is that like to feel like you you weren't able to do a show, um, you, you know, show a force at an event? How hard is it to bring the teams together to get all of that coordinated to get to the starting line of an event like this? Can you kind of talk through like some of those challenges and hurdles? Um, certainly, yeah. I mean, it, it's a lot of what we've been going through on on the back end, right? Uh, and I and it, and uh, it really goes to uh, the need for you know not only our coaching staff but also the the great uh, support staff we have over at uh, at Cat's Eye, um, because you know we we just really wouldn't be able to to do this without that that team uh, you know backing the players and making sure that um, you know things are set up all right uh, you know in the right way to to get uh, all the players where they need to be at the right time uh, and and for us uh, making sure that they are uh, that they're prepared for it you know so yeah, definitely you know not being able to show and compete you know that um, you know especially in something. So, so it's early stages of this uh, that, that can certainly make it hard to to, to come back and and uh, and remain as competitive as you can be. Mm. What what do you what do you do? I mean, you, you know, how do you keep your team motivated? Um, you know, in in a situation like that, I mean, we've we you know, obviously motivation is key, regardless of whether you make the competition or not, regardless of how you place in the competition or not. And then I can only imagine it's even worse when yeah. you when you when you don't get a show. How do you maintain that 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 level of enthusiasm and excitement for for the next one with your team? 
Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, our, our athletes bring that. Um, they they have a lot of you know intrinsic motivation that that helps keep them motivated. I think we all know that there's a lot of ups and downs in uh, you know in the sport, and you know there's there's um, uh, a lot of roadblocks that are going to come up. Things getting you frustrated, right? I'm I'm working on a CTF competing today, and you know you 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 find things that are are, are aggravating, are frustrating. Uh, but you know, with uh, with patience and you know, being able to tell yourself that uh, you can do it, you can, um, you know, get to that next level. Um, you know, you, you take it kind of you know slowly. You know, one challenge at a time. Uh, you know, one day at a time, and uh, and you, you kind of you know, build yourself up um, to to that level of excellence. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I think it's you know b- being able to handle uh, the setbacks and and kind of be able to take it in stride and uh, and and keep your confidence. Uh, know that you're you're going to be able to continue to improve and grow. What do you um what do, what do you, what are you kind of your next steps towards Greece? What are you what are you looking forward to? What are you going to take away from this? And what are you going to implement between now and and mid year as you guys take that road to Greece? Yeah, certainly. I mean that 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 uh, is you know what we have to figure out here, you know, um, we're, we're going to have to look at the, the lessons learned from today. Uh, you know, and obviously I haven't gotten to, to, to be observing it too closely, unfortunately. Uh, but, uh, we are going to, um, you know, get together as a team and figure out, you know, what, what's working, um, what's, uh, what's not working, you know, what, what can we, um, you know, what, what areas can we sharpen tactically, you know, uh, as, as necessary, um, really kind of understand the, the rules and the constructs for, mm-hmm. for, uh, what is, what we're going to have in Greece. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, get, uh, get all the travel worries and all the administration, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, taken care of. That's, that's kind of the hurdle we're going over right now, you know, okay. uh, okay. you know, and, 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 you know, and we're trying to shoulder a lot of that, right. That's, that's our, our key for us is, you know, between, you know, the cast eye staff and, uh, and, and us on the coaches trying to really, um, uh, you know, take that burden away from the athletes so they can just focus on getting themselves prepared, uh, for, for the challenge that's ahead of them. Nice. Nice. Chris, Chris, you got any, uh, you got any questions for, uh, for, for Dane before I bring in Pete? Uh, I, no, I'm good. I, I gotta be honest. I'm working my way through, uh, Northern, uh, Northern Tagora's, uh, coffee bars. Um, <laughs> looking for and i kid you not i've actually worked my way through four of them it's never good when they leave their web cameras open and various other things brian um, I, brian he's coming Brian's. for you I'm you got a little breadcrumb of brian so when he turns up in the morning for his coffee they serve him tea <laughs> that's all i really care about at this point in time Dan, right. serious kudos like kick ass on the team on the work and everything else like you rock simple as that and thank you Absolutely, Dane. Thank you very much for joining us, and congratulations tentatively on your uh, on your win for today. And we look forward to seeing uh, seeing how you guys do in Greece. Well, our our, our Navy students here had a, had a big whoops. I totally just oh we just lost pushed, him. I just pushed him off. Whoopsie. Poor <laughs> guy. Okay. Uh, that that was that was my bad. I apologize for you, Dane, on that one. I thought I thought we were done with you, Pete. Tell me you got audio. No audio from Pete. <laughs> <laughs> sign language. Oh, oh is he going to do the whole award ceremony in sign language? All right, all right. Tell that you what. Would wow. be actually cool. wow. All right, all right. We'll, we'll wait for we'll wait for Pete to we'll wait for Pete to come back in. Is Pete back? I well, think so. Yes. Well, Pete come, oh, there, there we go. Yes. There we go. Dane, while his audio was working, and uh, and brought in a guy who can't even make a microphone work. Yeah, yeah. Dane's in a hotel <laughs> making audio work, and you're at your house, and you can't even get audio to work. I, yeah, I could tell. He was clearly on uh, basically tin tin cans and string Wi-Fi, and I respect his his ability. <laughs> uh, let's get a let's get a round of applause in chat for um uh, uh for uh, uh Pete and the Sim Space team. You guys, uh, you guys put in a lot of hard work today, keeping that range up and running. How was it? Ah, it was a great time. Um, we saw a lot of really interesting things. Um, and, you know, it's funny as you were talking to Dane about a debrief. I think maybe we learned as much as the participants. Um, you know, we tried a lot of new things in this ex- in this particular game um, by in, you know, bringing in some uh, DCO scoring. Um, we we were trying to de-emphasize the uh, the compromise of individual flags and make it more about the defending of the flags. That's why you saw some uh, some public publicly available exploits being present. That's why you saw some machines that had 
uh, public vulnerabilities or existing walkthroughs for them even, because we wanted to make it more about how do you defend when your infrastructure is potentially compromised or when risks have been accepted that you cannot mitigate directly on the host, how do you take that step forward and push that into your detections, into your uh, firewall rules, um, and then kind of in a live environment have to uh, kind of scramble uh, to, <laughs> to maintain a security posture that's reasonable. So um, it was a really, really enjoyable time for all of us. Are you uh, are you ready to kind of hit the winners uh, for us and kind of go through the uh, the, the winning roster uh, of the day? Yeah, and I think there's a couple of things that as we announce the individual um, as we announce the individual awards, um, I want to call out some of the runners up or the the honorable mentions along the way because I we saw you know as you were talking with Marcel, you asked you know what are the takeaways for teams who didn't perform as well today. And I think the reality is uh, exactly like like um, like you guys said, it's they're already winners by being here. And we saw some really great things, uh, even on the teams who are at the bottom of the scoreboard, they actually did some really innovative stuff. So uh, I wanna make sure we call that out as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so show's, your, show's yours, let's talk about winners. Who won today? All right, well, we have uh, we have four categories, right? And the first category is for the total score. And I don't think that one's a mystery. Uh, we saw that uh, USA had the highest total score today, and they are our winner for highest overall score. So congratulations to Team USA um, for a really well-played game. And I think that's probably one of the things that's worth mentioning. Again, going back to what Dane was saying is understanding the rules, looking at the uh, the different things that you are and are not allowed to do, um, and and successfully defending your network and compromising other uh, other nodes and other people's networks. So it was well done. Um, the second one I want to talk about is the highest overall red team score, because mm. uh, since this is an integrated red versus blue competition, the highest overall red team score was actually Team Canada. So congratulations oh, wow. to Canada. They were able to tip over boxes left and right. And I think you could see that in the score. You saw USA taking the big jumps for the static scores of DCO. Mm -hmm. And then you saw Team Canada with the slow but steady increase in rate of, of score as they conquered more and more flags. Uh, and I and if we'd given them more time, they they would have overtaken Team USA. Was there an opportunity? Uh, no was there an opportunity with their red team focus that they could have overtaken USA at, at some point in time? Yeah, that's an excellent point. So there are eleven flags inside each um, inside each castle, and uh, we saw their success with voting registration early on. And I think if they had been a little bit faster to conquer voting registration. Uh, voting registration inside that first castle, which strangely enough was the USA, um, and pivot from attacking USA to attacking some of the other voting registration servers, I think they would have gotten the cumulative score over time to overtake Team USA because it was such a close score in the end. You hear that, Chris, for all you're your joking about us invading Canada, you hear Canada is attacking the USA. Look at that. <laughs> It was yeah, Canada screwed. invaded. I mean, at that point in time, I mean, it's, it's actually really cool to see. Yeah, I mean, at that point, we're screwed. So, yeah. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so that, that 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 again, just interesting to note that given the time, given the effort, and we that again back to the realism of it. That's very much how it works in in real offensive operations, right? Given the time, given the money, given the effort, of course, the red team will will eventually be successful. So that's that's good good insight right there. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, and then the third, the third award is for um, for most points scored defensively, and I think that becomes obvious with our top, uh, with our second place team being the top offensive team. That means that Team USA is again the top uh, defensive team. They had an extremely disciplined approach in the way that they hunted for those threats. Um, one of the things that's really worthwhile pointing out um, and giving credit is they from the intel drop to the point where they were scoring points was less than 15 minutes wow so from the time that they were given nice. this may be present they started seeing detections in 15 minutes uh by 21 minutes they had the majority of the detections down hmm. and uh, the way we'd set up the scoring is that there was a slight decrease in the number of points given 
um, from a maximum of a 100% down to 75% as time elapsed. Mm. So, um, so they got a slight edge on Team Canada by getting in on that action early. Why'd we do it? That's, that's how Blue Team is, right? Yeah. You want to clear those infections as fast as possible. The more you can reduce stay time, the more secure your networks, and the less the scope of a potential incident might be. So, so, so that's where so, our focus so, was there. So in that regard, for, for Canada to have, to have caught back up, they would have had to get not only those detections uh, at some point in time during the, the, the event, but also continue to progress their offensive operation at the same time. That's correct. And Canada did an excellent job of pivoting to the detections. And um, I'd have to I'd have to look again at the exact score sheet to make sure I'm not I'm not lying on this. But there are only one or two detections or mitigations that Team USA had that Canada did not have. Wow. Um, but the total score differential between the two is Team USA got almost almost 15,000 points from uh, from their detections and mitigations, whereas Team Canada got uh, right around 9,000 points for their detections and mitigations. And that's that that's that delta in terms of timing, because the difference between 21 minutes and almost three hours after uh, detection, or excuse me, after uh, disclosure for those detections, uh, that's that's where the point differential came from. I, I think that's, a, that's a, getting back to your realism. I think that that's critically important right there. So that's awesome. So what's the final category winner that you and got flipping around. Oh, go ahead. It's my favorite. It's the no, no. It's it's my favorite category, which um, I'm told I can't call uh, Pete's crazy idea category, but <laughs> the ingenuity award uh, sounds a lot better. I think the ingenuity award. We're actually going to split this between okay. um, between uh, Beta and Sigma, which would be South Africa, and now I was confident of it was Europe. For Sigma, and I'm not, I can't remember if it's your X or, or O. Um, and the reason I want to point that out is they did a really interesting job. We focused from a defensive perspective on detections and mitigations of APT. They did a fascinating job of purple teaming their own environment, hmm. putting together and I correctly identifying the vulnerabilities that exist in the various machines and putting together fixes for them on the fly. And uh, that absolutely deserves to be called out. Um, there are other teams that did a fantastic job. Frankly, we could have awarded the Ingenuity Award to almost anyone here, but I wanted to call this particular approach out because they did something unusual, something I didn't expect. But what was um, and what that's was definitely while, worth calling out? While that te that TTP may be may get your Ingenuity Award, I want to put you on the spot here and say why didn't that why wasn't that Ingenuity Award enough to to see them rise up in the poor in in the points as fast you know in, as fast as some of their competition? Sure, absolutely. It wasn't built into our scoring mechanism. It wasn't mm -hmm. it wasn't designed into the game. And um, like I said, this is one of those times where I think we learned as much as they did. And I assure you, next time, <laughs> we're definitely going to be looking at how they mitigate. And I think give ourselves some, um, some dynamic ability to say, you know what, that yeah. was an excellent approach. And we're going to give you a spot award. Um, mm. I think that's probably going to require some more write-ups because we don't want any kind of appearance of, um, oh, I don't know, nepotism or favoritism. Sure. Uh, but I, again, I was just really impressed with the approach. The fact that they were uh, they were prepared to um, patch code live on uh, on the systems was just was very impressive. To me. How um how shocking was it that the North African team was able to hold on to a top three spot for as long as they did for not being not having an appearance here? How much of a shocker was that for you? So um, I, it's you know, it's funny because they didn't. I think so much of the, uh, the the attack and defend is if you poke someone in the nose, they have a tendency to poke back. And so I think in some ways, uh, the North African team, uh, by maintaining neutrality, let's just say <laughs> in this castle be castle, and and then not surrendering many blue team points. Um, did an excellent job. Um, I, will, I actually want to call out the Latin America team um, because they they had the lowest point total here. And it is for one reason and one reason alone is that there was an ROE violation on mm. some of their firewall rules and they made, um, made hack 30 firewall rules as opposed to hack 
1932. And, uh, but with that said, so, you know, you asked what's the takeaway for them. Um, other than that, they did an excellent job in the competition. And it was just that one violation that continued to undermine the success that they were having in the game. And so I think one of the really great things about that is that's a tiny fix. That's, yeah. that's not, uh, you know, there's no big hill to overcome here for that team. I think they're really well positioned for future. And um, I can see the organization in their team. And, you know, as people are reaching out to me for permission to patch various things or make changes, make sure they're not going to break the rules. Um, I think I saw a really well organized team with a lot of great ideas there. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I, I, I can't can't believe that we're at the end of this. Um, it's, it's been, it's been pretty amazing. When you look across, uh, everything that, that, that has happened today, what would you say to the teams as they look forward into their next practices, their next scrimmages, you know, on that, that road to Greece, what would be kind of your advice to them? Well, I'd say, um, first of all, I'd say, I think you guys are going to have a fantastic time. Um, I think all of your teams have shown that they're well-prepared, uh, especially with what we did in this event by giving them a very different type of competition than they might have faced before. Uh, they all rose to the occasion. Um, you can see that there's a really, um, really excellent performance from those teams. So as I look ahead, um, I think we saw the opportunity to improve um, some threat hunting, so some elastic and uh, oh, yes. maybe Splunk uh, detections, um, there are a couple of things that could have been sped up by um, um, actually one of the things that was commonly missed looking over the detections was lateral movement. So I would mm. give a strong recommendation that um, and, and we actually intentionally left off um, providing really detailed IOCs for lateral movement because you had all of the detailed IOCs for everything leading up to that. And so I think um, following that chain of operational logic um, and uh, the forensics, right, the chain of forensics, um, you may find as you find an IOC for in, in my head, it, it, the, the kill chain or the, the, the threat actors behavior is a thread in my head. And, and as you follow IOCs, you may hit it and you don't know exactly where in their chain of, of operations you hit. But you follow left and right, and you look at you know parent processes and child processes and parent process command line and process command line, and you start looking for what's going to happen. You look for network connections, and you're correlating between your maybe your Zeek logs and your uh, your Sysmon host artifacts. And um, I think that would be an area that I would emphasize because it'd be a great opportunity. Um, there there were uh, about uh, about seven thousand more points out there for each of the teams. Um, that weren't that weren't obtained by any team. What I think it also I think it speaks pretty volumes. You, you talk about there was only one one yellow flag on the play, which was which was the the rules violation that you had on the firewall. Um, it seems like all the teams played fair. It seems like all the teams had a very very competitive and very good uh, sportsman like attitude. And it seems like all the teams were were equally prepared when looking at the scoreboard. Uh, outside of that, um, any any counter to that? You know, any, you agreeance with that? Everybody played performed and played pretty well. Yes, uh, there was actually one other yellow flag that got caught. Um, somebody had the very clever idea of modifying uh, file permissions on one of the um, on one of the flags. And while I will give them credit for <laughs> effectiveness, uh, we docked them 250 points. Wow! And, um, oh no, no, that's not fair. Uh, no, 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 no. So okay. It, uh, We've done this before. We actually <laughs> hacked the bloody, because we did this, we hacked the point system once before, and we actually ended up winning the competition because of it. So you got to give some kudos <laughs> and some credit for that one. I, like I said, it goes right back into the Ingenuity Award, and yeah. uh, I think there were a lot of, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, the mentality is there. Yeah, I think that's the thing you have to say, even, on the, even for the things that we did dock points, uh, Team Kappa, um, Latin America, losing points. Their firewall rule was a good firewall rule. The reason it was banned is it was too effective for <laughs> doing too good a job. And if they would have written multiple rules to do that, would have been fine. Would have been fine. Uh, we just had to slow them down so that other teams had a chance. So, oh, um, oh, Eric, yeah. Eric is Eric is, Eric is over there fuming right now. Eric is fuming right now on this one. No, he should be beaming. I, I, he should be extremely proud. Extremely proud. <laughs> Um, closing, closing thoughts, Chris, closing thoughts over to you. 
Uh, I have to apologize to the uh, Tikatora uh, library <laughs> and the uh, the coffee shops around it at the Brian. I, I tracked him down. It was we, kind of we, fun. We've uh, lost no, we've lost Chris to uh, to an OSINT challenge. <laughs> I now have to apologize to like all the camera systems, all the networks yeah. and everything around the library. I, I, and it's awesome. Yeah, no, this yeah. was fantastic. I sorry I squirreled at the end. I got Oh, you're fine. I got issued a challenge. I'm listening to this and it's just freaking cool to see. And I'm also just wandering my way around northern New Zealand. Um <laughs> no, this was fantastic. It was thank you so much for having me as part of this. I, I'm absolutely honored to be able to just hang out and, and just kick back for a couple of hours. So and P and all the crew of Sim Space. You guys freaking rock. I mean, seriously awesome. Just thank you for everybody. It's, uh, yeah, I love seeing this stuff. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Pete, um, closing thoughts from you um, uh, about the competition, about the teams, anything that you want to say uh, uh, here as we start to wrap up? Um, no, I, I, I can't tell you how much we enjoyed it. So I guess, yes. Uh, I can't tell you how much <laughs> we enjoyed putting this together. Um, it's been a great pleasure talking with you it's been really fun seeing people um like like uh dane and marcel who i've, I've known for a while now um involved um just really really enjoyed the opportunity to be involved awesome i'm gonna send you both off uh, along your ways to your days and and it's been a long day for everybody i'm gonna talk to everybody as we sign off y'all take care and i'll see y'all next time um awesome fantastic event i can't even begin to say how excited and exciting this entire thing has been. I want to give a huge shout out, a huge thank you to to Play Cyber and the Cat's Eye team um, for all of their support and and and, and everything throughout as as we've been uh, uh, as we've been dealing with this. I want to thank a huge uh, give a huge shout out to SimSpace, fantastic platform, probably one of the one of the the better. Um, uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, simulated adversary simulation type platform environments that I've seen out there. Make sure you do go check them out. Make sure you do take advantage of the bot commands that are inside of Chad um, to to check out the various things that do go into supporting a massive event uh, like this one. Uh, make sure you do check out the ICC if you are interested in that, um, as, as well as several of our other sponsors that have donated prizes for you all. If you want a prize, do me a solid. At them on um, on social media. Let them know that you won their prizes. That you did see them on the uh, the, the global cyber games with uh, with cyber and security. And obviously, if you tag me in it, then I will absolutely retweet it. I want to thank everybody. I didn't I didn't hear anything from my mods about any uh, any fouls or violations, any red flags happening in our chat. Uh, throughout the day, so I want to thank everybody for being on their most upstanding behavior uh, throughout the day. Thanks for sticking at it. Uh, st thanks for sticking with us on one of our uh, our, our longer um, streams that we've had and participating in this one. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, our sponsors on the cyber and security side, in, in no particular order, but especially uh, Attack IQ and At Root Beverages for their support of this event. And listen, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Make sure you check out our Discord by hitting exclamation Discord and chat if you're not already there. Uh, make sure you do check out our schedules. We do have streams happening on every day of the week, and I look forward to seeing you either in sub chat or in, uh, in one of our streams, and y'all take care. I apparently didn't plug in the outro button. <laughs>